<clears throat> Thanks, everyone, for coming today. My name is uh, Jamie Love. I'm the director of Knowledge College International. This is a workshop on the history, experiences, and prospects of compulsory licenses of medical patents in the United States. A number of people here in the room have worked on the issue of compulsory license of patents in countries outside the United States. And uh, because of the debate that's going on about drug prices and a possible role for the United States government to negotiate drug prices, we become interested in, in having a, a, uh, a, a serious conversation here about the role of patents in price negotiations. In particular, when uh, countries are involved in negotiation over what's a reasonable price for a product, the usual negotiating leverage that countries exert in industrialized countries like the United States is they make a uh, negotiate over whether or not a drug will be reimbursed. They negotiate whether uh, uh, the, the use of the drug will be limited by a formulary, whether it can be used off-label. Uh, they may discuss things like prior approval for the drug. And uh, they may have co-payments, in some cases, uh, quite, quite high payments, sometimes in cases excess of $30,000 a year for some expensive cancer drugs. Um, uh, in countries outside the United States, when there's a, dis a dispute over the price of the drug, for example, in the UK, uh, where they're debating whether or not to reimburse drugs like Ibrance or, uh, or, or uh, Godzilla for breast cancer, the negotiating strategy for the government is to, is to, uh, is to suggest that they would not reimburse a drug. And uh, uh, for example, a, a drug that my wife takes uh, for breast cancer, Godzilla, is not reimbursed in the UK at this point. Uh, but it's a, it's a game-changing drug, and she's alive because of the drug. And the women in the UK that don't get that drug uh, are dying or dead already. So we don't want to go down that road ourselves. Uh, so we are taking the position that when there's a dispute about the reasonableness of a price, we'd like policymakers to think of the patent monopoly as a privilege, not a right, and that the threat would be not to, not to withhold treatment from the patient, but to eliminate the monopoly. And that's what the compulsory licensing option gives you. It gives the government more power in the course of price negotiation. And as you can imagine, it's very controversial. Uh, but this, what this meeting will discuss is it'll start out with a presentation by Zach Struver, who's going to review the efforts uh, of U.S. legislation where compulsory licensing bills have been proposed and in some cases implemented starting really about 150 years ago, bringing it up to the present. And then we'll have a series of panels with the U.S. experience, uh, starting with the government use provisions in the United States law, following with the use of compulsory license in the context of injunction proceedings as a limitation on the remedy for infringement of patents, and then a discussion of use under the Bayh-Dole Act, or non-use of the option under the Bayh-Dole Act. And then uh, that'll be followed in the afternoon with a uh, discussion about what the global norms are for compulsory licensing in industrialized uh, countries, as, as well as a presentation of what compulsory license statutes look like in 13 industrialized countries. The meeting will close with a, uh, a discussion about whether or not what are the prospects for compulsory licensing in the United States, and in that context, uh, sh are there need for any changes in U.S. legislation, and if so, what they might look like. We'd like everyone to participate in the final session. We'll start with uh, some of the people that have made some of the earlier presentations, sharing some of their thoughts on this. I'd like to begin right now by inviting Zach Struver up to begin his presentation. Uh, Zach Struver has a, uh, is, is been, a, uh, uh, been working with us uh, uh, his first job out of, out, of, out of college. He's on his way to law school next year, but uh, hasn't started. He's queuing up his presentation. And um, Zach spent a fair amount of time at the Library of Congress to get a lot of this stuff out. So, Zach, you want to come up and, uh, to the podium and then begin your presentation? Thank you very much. So, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, as Jamie said, I spent a lot of time at the Library of Congress digging up uh, old bills.
bills and statutes uh, on compulsory licensing. Uh, this is going to be a historical overview of compulsory licensing statutes in the United States. Uh, going to look at uh, bills that have been proposed since the early 1900s up through the present and uh, some statutes that have been implemented. So just to start out, uh, there's a few different uh, types of compulsory licenses in the United States. Uh, there's compulsory licenses for government use, uh, for federally funded research and development. Uh, there are compulsory licenses in specific industries, such as uh, in uh, uh, clean air and uh, atomic yeah. energy. Uh, there are compulsory licenses that have been implemented or proposed in war and national security contexts. Uh, for antitrust and under the eBay case. Uh, and some of these will be discussed later, uh, as Jamie mentioned uh, today. So I won't get too in-depth into some of these. Um, the reasons that people have proposed compulsory licensing statutes in the past are broad. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, there were compulsory licensing statutes that were or in bills that were proposed uh, in terms of the non-use of patents and competition. People were worried that uh, patents weren't being uh, manufactured, patented inventions weren't being manufactured in the United States or processes weren't being used. Uh, there were competition issues uh, related to cross-licensing and patent pooling. Uh, and this was in the context of uh, the 1883 Paris Convention, which was a broader patent agreement that included provisions on compulsory licensing. Uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act had been passed also in the late 1800s, and there was rapid industrialization and concerns about uh, expanding U.S. industry. Uh, then during the World Wars, uh, there were uh, some proposals for compulsory licenses in the context of national security and defense. Uh, Following the wars, uh, the, the government had invested a lot in research and development and worked with industry and universities, and uh, there were proposed compulsory licenses to address that. And then finally, starting in around the 60s, uh, up until the present, there have been various uh, bills proposed to do a general compulsory licensing statute on medicines, usually in the context of drug pricing. And here is the Paris Convention uh, provision, which I won't talk about because I think Fred's going to talk about that a little later, uh, on compulsory licensing, just to have in the presentation here. So we'll start with government use. Uh, here's the statute. Uh, I'm not going to go too in-depth into... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have my computer here, and I'm following along with the slides, and I forgot to push this. Um, here's the text of the government use statute. Uh, I'm not going to go too in-depth into what the text says. Uh, because that's going to be discussed in the next panel, but I will talk about the history a little bit. Uh, it starts in the late 1800s. In 1875, there was a renovation of the U.S. Capitol, and uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted was the architect of the Capitol at the time, and his contractor used a patented method for pouring concrete, uh, and so the patent holder, who was named Schillinger, sued the United States government for uh, the infringement of that patent, and the Supreme Court held that uh, the statutes uh, allowing for suit against the United States government as a waiver of the government's sovereign immunity did not allow for tort suits, and so Schillinger could not sue the U.S. government. Uh, this was affirmed in 1901 in Russell v. U.S., where the court explicitly said it is the prerogative of a sovereign not to be sued at all without its consent or upon such cause of action as it chooses. It is not chosen to be sued in an action sounding in tort and they said that uh, patent infringement suit would be a tort suit, so they did not allow suits against the government. In 1910, uh, Congress passed legislation to remedy this situation. Uh, it was uh, proposed by Philander C. Knox, who was former Secretary of State and Attorney General, who served twice in two non-consecutive terms in the Senate uh, between his stints in, in three different presidential administrations. Uh, and the the legislation allowed for an infringement suit against the U.S. government for recovery of reasonable compensation. Then in 1918, uh, there was another case, William Cramp and Sons Ship and Engine Building Co., the International Curtis Marine Turbine Company, uh, in which the court ruled that government contractors could not be sued under the government use statute. Uh, so FDR wrote to Congress, and he said that manufacturers are being exposed to expensive litigation involving the possibilities of prohibitive injunction payment of royalties, et cetera. And so he requested that they amend the government use statute to cover infringement by contractors, and in 1918, Congress did so. 
There are some other government use provisions that have been uh, proposed uh, and that are, exist in U.S. law, including for uh, USAID uh, in 1961, the Tennessee Valley Authority in 1933, and some of the other uh, R&D uh, statutes allow for government use. So in 1912, uh, Congress started to explore patent legislation that was proposed by the Wilson administration. Uh, the patent commissioner, Edward B. Moore, proposed a remedy for the suppression or withholding of patents. Uh, the hearings were between April and May of 1912, and they were led by Representative William Allen Oldfield, uh, who, who ran the House Committee on Patents. Uh, and the bill addressed various issues, including the independence of the Patent Office, patent exhaustion and the patent bar, but also compulsory licensing. So I'm just going to summarize the compulsory licensing provision in the bill. It allows any person to request a license from the patent holder if the patent holder has not been adequately used after four years from the start of the patent term. Uh, any person demanding it shall be entitled to a license from the patent, uh, owner of the patent unless the owner shall show sufficient cause for such inaction, and it allowed appeal to the district court if the patent holder denied a license request. Uh, uh, and it required the court to grant a license if the court was satisfied that the reasonable requirements of the public uh, were not being satisfied by reason of the neglect or the refusal of the patentee or their authorized persons to make, use, or vend the invention or to grant licenses. And it required uh, the setting of just terms. Uh, so most of the hearings in 1912, although it was a broader patent reform bill, focused on the compulsory licensing provision. There was a debate over the proper remedy to the non-use of patents. Some people thought it should be a compulsory license. Some people thought you should just revoke the patent if it wasn't being used. Uh, and some witnesses even proposed alternative compulsory licensing provisions that were more directed towards public interest uses of patents. So for example, uh, the New York City Railroad between uh, New York and New Haven uh, was required to use electric rail uh, because of uh, smoke pollution in the city, and uh, there was a patent issue with that, uh, and they had to end up spending a lot of money paying uh, to use the patents. Here's what the uh, uh, Commissioner of Patents said in his testimony. Uh, I'm not going to read all of this aloud, but uh, he made the point that nearly all countries except the United States have had patent provisions at the time that required the working of a patent invention, and they provided either for the revocation of that patent or a compulsory license. Uh, and he proposed compulsory licensing rather than revocation, uh, partly because of the compensation issues involved in it. Uh, after the hearings, Representative Oldfield presented an amended bill uh, providing that the licensee would have to prove that the patent holder had withheld or suppressed the invention for the purpose or with the result of preventing other person from practicing the invention. And between 1912 and 1915, other members also proposed compulsory licensing provisions that were not discussed in the Oldfield hearing, but that were, uh, um, so they were a little bit different. For example, uh, there's an interesting 1912 bill by Francis Burston Harrison, which would have allowed for the taking, uh, it would have created a subordinate property right in the patent, and it would have allowed for a taking of uh, that subordinate property right uh, for anyone who owned uh, a similar patent and was prevented from using that patent by the original patent, or uh, for improvement patents, or for public use. Uh, and there was also another version that would have instead required uh, cross-licensing between patent holders. So 10 years later, uh, the Oldfield Committee did not uh, get any bills passed in Congress, by the way, I should say that. And same in 1922, they again discussed compulsory licensing. There were, was no bill passed, but it was an interesting conversation that happened uh, in Congress. Uh, the U.S. Department of War proposed a uh, compulsory licensing statute that would have provided that any patent uh, uh, would have a provision within the patent, so similar to the uh, uh, Bayh-Dole Act requirement that you state in the patent if there's federal funding. Uh, there would have been a provision in every patent that said if it's not worked or put into operation uh, so as to result in actual production in the United States uh, within a reasonable time, which was defined as no less than two years nor more than five years, then the U.S. Uh, would reserve the right to license the patent to any person to manufacture, use, and sell the subject matter. And it would require the payment of a reasonable royalty, which was defined as not less than 0.5% nor more than 10% of the manufacture cost of each article. Um, the Department of War proposed this statute because, or this bill, because it feared that uh, foreign controlled patents would hinder U.S. industry uh, leading into the next war. So this was just after World War I. Uh, 
Uh, and before World War I, the, uh, uh, a representative of the uh, Judge Advocate General came and testified, and he said that the Germans controlled patents on coal tar, which was used in dye manufacturing and medicines manufacturing, uh, optical glass, uh, wireless telegraphy, and magnetos, and that after the war, uh, German patent holders uh, during the war were not allowed to file for patents in the United States, but after the war they were allowed to again, and uh, they passed a, a bill called the Logan Act, which allowed them to file for patents that they otherwise would have been able to file for during the war. Uh, so some German inventors came in and patented the entire system of U.S. railroad artillery. So the, the Army was very worried that uh, in the next war, uh, which they were anticipating even in 1922, uh, that uh, the foreign control of patents could be detrimental to U.S. industry. Uh, during the war, Congress also passed a compulsory licensing statute uh, in the Trading with the Enemies Act, which, uh, under which uh, the U.S. seized all uh, enemy property, which was basically German property, but also patents, and they issued compulsory licenses on them to U.S. industry. After the war, they returned the patent rights and uh, with the royalties to the patent holders. Uh, and then uh, following the war in this hearing, Congress also contemplated the new situation. So the Army justified the bill in terms of national defense and the buildup of essential U.S. industries, which they took a very broad view of, everything from car manufacturing to the dye that you would use for soldiers' uniforms. Uh, a lot of large industry groups opposed uh, the uh, uh, compulsory licensing bill. Uh, they feared that it would be used against U.S. industries and not just uh, foreign industries, which was sort of the stated intention of, of, the, of the bill. Um, so... Um, okay, yeah. Moving on to 1938, uh, again, Congress uh, dealt with compulsory licensing, uh, this time in a subcommittee on compulsory licensing in the House. Uh, Representative W.D. McFarlane and Representative William P. Connery introduced legislation. Uh, this had followed a few years of hearings and an investigation, a uh, really big investigation into the use of cross-licensing and patent pools uh, to limit competition in, in big industry in the United States. And the investigation found uh, that a lot of patents were being cross-licenses in ways that prevented competition from smaller manufacturers. Uh, the McFarland legislation was similar to the earlier legislation, but the Connery legislation was more narrowly tailored towards that end of solving that problem. Another thing they were talking about since this was in the midst of the Depression was employment. They thought that compulsory licensing would let small manufacturers uh, get more jobs into the economy. Uh, so uh, that was another reason they were looking at it. Uh, McFarland's bill would have allowed any qualified applicant to request the Commissioner of Patents grant a compulsory license on a patent after at least three years with proof that it had been, not been used for at least one year, that the public interest would be served and the applicant would have to propose specific terms and conditions. The Connery bill would have allowed any person to file a suit in a district court for a non-transferable license under reasonable terms and conditions when two or more persons, broadly defined as companies and, and uh, other entities, uh, had each brought their, their patents into a uh, single kind of control or trust or something uh, that would prevent, uh, that whereby industry and trade are dominated and interstate commerce is sus substantially restrained to the detriment of the public. Uh, this time, uh, and they actually remarked on this when they were doing the hearings, uh, they were kind of shocked that none of the big industry groups showed up to oppose the bill. Uh, instead, a lot of small manufacturers and prominent patent attorneys, uh, like the New York State Patent Association and Chicago Patent Association and uh, the American Bar Association and former patent commissioners all showed up to oppose this bill. They argued that it would destroy small manufacturers, uh, that the large, uh, that big industry would just take their patents for non-use. Uh, they were saying, you know, we, we need more than three years to develop our patents even after we've been granted the patents. So uh, this was also killed uh, before it made it to a vote. Uh, Post-World War II, uh, there were two kind of big compulsory licensing statutes. One was industry-specific, the Atomic Energy Act. Uh, under the Atomic Energy Act, 
the U.S. government actually seized all atomic energy patents in the United States. And there's a good quote here from Harold D. Smith, the director of the Bureau of the Budget. He said, if atomic energy is important enough to justify complete governmental control, no aspect of its use should be determined by private monopoly. Uh, so after they seized all the patents, they also included a compulsory licensing provision for other patents that would be useful in the production of atomic energy. So this was only for non-military use, uh, not for uh, building atomic weapons. And it, it created a process that allowed people to uh, appeal to the Atomic Energy Commission for uh, compulsory license on a patent, and this was modified in the 50s to sort of change the process a little bit. Uh, then also, uh, following the war, there was the Marshall Plan in the late 1940s, and the Marshall Plan uh, had a special government use, or, or rather, it was codified in 1951, I should say, uh, and that bill uh, statute had a special government use provision for rebuilding European economy and security, uh, and uh, then in 1961, the the Congress created USAID to sort of consolidate the functions of uh, the various agencies that had been doing work under the Marshall Plan, uh, and that had a similar government use provision, uh, and it also had a carve-out preventing government use of patented pharmaceuticals outside the United States. Uh, and also, both of those uh, statutes were interesting because they have a uh, special kind of provision that lets the uh, agency head of whoever is using the patent go and negotiate with the patent holder before they file suit in court in the United States. Uh, in 1970, Congress passed the Clean Air Act, am uh, amendments to the Clean Air Act. And uh, those amendments included a special compulsory licensing scheme for compliance with the requirements of the Clean Air Act. And it, it was just kind of inserted into the bill. There was no discussion of it during the hearings. And after, af actually after the bill passed, there were discussions about uh, repealing it. Uh, and uh, they sort of decided that uh, it would just be better to keep it in and see how it works out rather than repeal it and take years of study. They thought it would disrupt the the uh, act. And the way the Clean Air Act amendment works is similar to the uh, atomic energy compulsory license. You apply to the, uh, the government for a compulsory license on clean air technologies, and then there's a little hearing, and then uh, you get the compulsory license if you prove you need it. Uh, in 2000, Dennis Kucinich proposed uh, amendments uh, following a patent dispute between top oil corporations in the U.S. and Unical, which had developed a clean gas technology, and they were also going through uh, a, a, a case at the FTC on Unical to determine whether they were doing, taking anti-competitive actions. Uh, and uh, Kucinich proposed an amendment that would uh, sort of solve the problem by allowing compulsory licenses on Unical's patents. Uh, so I'm going to move on to government-funded research and development now. Uh, there's this kind of standard provision that's in a lot of uh, laws and uh, uh, starting in the 60s. Uh, it's that no research shall be, if you have a contract with the government, shall be carried out. And the things in brackets are kind of changed between different statutes. Uh, so if you look at one, it might have three out of the four of the first bracket or different words. But the, the gist of it is the same, is that you can't have a research contract with the government unless all of the patents and, and processes uh, are available to the general public. Uh, so here are some of the bills uh, uh, that this, uh, or the statutes that this provision can be found in. Uh, you can see it was in a bunch over the years. Uh, then uh, in 1950, uh, Congress passed uh, the National Science Foundation Act, which uh, created the National Science Foundation as uh, this was following World War II. As I mentioned before, there was a lot of government-funded R&D and collaboration during World War II. Uh, and uh, they decided to create the National Science Foundation to coordinate those R&D efforts. And there was a debate in Congress and in, uh, administration, in the administration about how they should deal with patent issues. Uh, eventually, they decided upon uh, this clause right here, which is that contracts shall contain provisions governing the disposition of inventions that are calculated to protect the public interest balanced with uh, the equities of the uh, contract holder. Uh, then in 1980, 30 years later, uh, Congress passed the Bayh-Dole Act, which uh, changed the uh, uh, way that the government uh, deals with government-funded research and development. Uh, and that contains marching rights. I'm not going to go too in-depth into 
the ways you can use marching rights since that'll be the focus of a later panel, but I will talk a little bit about the history. Uh, it follows Kennedy's 1963 government patent policy, which required where the principal or exclusive rights to an invention are required by the contractor, the government shall have the right to require the granting of a license to an applicant, royalty free, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, for public use by governmental regulations or as may be necessary to fulfill public health needs or for other public purposes stipulated in the contract. And then Nixon's 1971 patent policy required that inventions be reasonably accessible to the public. Uh, so we're moving on now to uh, compulsory licensing on medicines, which is the kind of the thrust of this meeting. So we'll go a little bit through the history of statutes that have been proposed in that area. Uh, in, 19, in 1959, Senator Estes Kefauver, who is most famous for his amendments to the Food and Drug Act, uh, proposed, uh, uh, started some hearings on a wide range of issues, uh, and he wanted to reform the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, he saw a lot of abuse, and, and he didn't think that they were being regulated well enough by the FDA. Uh, so he proposed legislation in 1961, and that legislation inclu included a compulsory licensing provision, and it also included additional antitrust provisions uh, that were unrelated to the compulsory license but are still interesting. Uh, so the, the, the compulsory licensing scheme that Kefauver came up with would have limited the period of exclusivity for a patented drug to three years. So you get three years of exclusive use of your patent. Then for, so at the time, patents lasted for 17 years. Then for 14 years, uh, the patent holder would be required to grant each qualified applicant an unrestricted license to make, use, and sell the drug. And if they refused, they would have to report to the commissioner on patents. The commissioner on patents would uh, then uh, make a determination based on, could also make a determination if, if somebody complained that they were not given a license. And if they refused, uh, the patent would just be canceled. And here's what Senator Kefauver said uh, at uh, the hearings. He said, uh, one fundamental fact disclosed by our drug hearings, he's referring to the earlier hearings here, uh, at least in my opinions, is that by any test and under any standards, prices and profits in the ethical drug industry are excessive and unreasonable. The problem is all the more serious because it concerns the health and happiness of every citizen in our country. He saw two alternatives, uh, either price control or uh, providing for freer competition, as he called it. Uh, and he chose to uh, uh, increase competition through a compulsory licensing statute. Uh, as you can imagine, there was strong pushback against his compulsory licensing statute, particularly from the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. But the Kennedy industry was also, uh, the Kennedy administration was also on their side. Uh, and they actually, uh, at one point, killed the bill because of the compulsory licensing statute. So we almost didn't have the Kefauver amendments in the 60s. Uh, but then they kind of maneuvered it back into Congress uh, following this dispute over the compulsory licensing over Kefauver's objections. And uh, the, the amendments passed without the uh, compulsory licensing or antitrust provisions. He reintroduced these provisions with a few modifications uh, in the following year. Uh, it never passed Congress. Uh, and here's the, the amendments that he made to his bill following the hearings, uh, which was that uh, any qualified applicant could request a license on a patented drug. Uh, for which the patents have been issued at least three years prior to the date of the application and when the price of the drug is 500 percent, so five times the cost of production, which included the cost of manufacturing uh, the drug, the research cost or the research uh, um, the research revenues that go back in the revenues that go back into research at the company uh, and uh, a few other factors, and it would have allowed the applicant to request the FTC to grant a compulsory license. So it's, it's different from what he initially proposed. Uh, in 1979, Senator Gaylord Nelson, who's most famous for creating Earth Day and being a big environmental activist, uh, sort of followed in Kefauver's footsteps and proposed another compulsory licensing bill uh, in his attempt to do broader reform of the pharmaceutical industry and also deal with some of the antitrust issues. Uh, this followed the expansion of compulsory licensing provision in Canada in 1969, uh, and his bill was called the Public Health Price Protection Act. It contained a really complex and strange compulsory licensing scheme, which I'll go into right now. It would have required the Surgeon General to issue a certification or the Federal Trade Commission to initiate a public rulemaking procedure if there was evidence that a drug had a high price and that other criteria were met. The certification criteria were uh, first continued availability of the drug would be in the public interest or the drug is the choice uh, of 
uh, drug of choice for particular clinical uses, second, that the drug has a substantial market, and third, that there are either fewer than four produces, which, which would be the case for most patented drugs, or that the average price of the drug was higher than five times the cost of manufacturers. So that was the same standard that was in the Kefauver legislation. Uh, and the Federal Trade Commission uh, could trigger their uh, rule-making uh, procedure if uh, the average price of the drug was five times higher than the cost of manufacture or higher than the average price of any foreign country. So there was some reference pricing in there. Uh, the annual sales exceeded $1 million for three or more years, and the existence of a patent contributed to the high price of the drug. Uh, if mandatory licensing of a drug on reasonable terms and condition would, con would contribute to lower drug prices, and if a mandatory license would be in the public interest, alternatively, they could have relied on the certification of this information instead instead. Um, uh, so support for this came from Public Citizen and Ralph Nader, uh, who was actually the first person to testify in the hearings, uh, uh, and uh, along with Dr. Sidney Wolf. Uh, uh, but opposition again came from the pharmaceutical industry, uh, uh, the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association in particular, and other industry groups. These hearings covered a range of issues, so the compulsory licensing issues weren't brought up too much at the hearings, but uh, they did voice their opposition, and they made similar arguments at both this hearing and the hearing in the 60s that they make today, which is that it will destroy innovation, that it will, uh, uh, you know, uh, harm uh, U.S. industry, that it will destroy jobs, et cetera. So getting to more recent uh, compulsory licensing proposals uh, for, for pharmaceuticals, in 1994, Representative Gerald Nadler proposed a compulsory licensing bill in response to the controversy over RU486, the abortion pill. Uh, Rossel Ulaf, I probably mispronounced that, the French company that held the patent on RU486 refused to let uh, U.S. Uh, company uh, or U.S. nonprofit actually do clinical trials because uh, they were afraid of anti-abortion activists boycotting uh, their other products in the United States. Uh, and so Nadler, uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, pro-abortion activists, uh, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times and said we should just revoke the patents. And Nadler wrote a letter to the editor in response and said, next week I'm proposing a compulsory licensing bill, and that's a much better way of doing this. And his compulsory licensing bill would have allowed the Secretary of Health and Human Services to determine after notice and an opportunity for hearing that the owner of the patent uh, has not taken all reasonable steps toward the commercial marketing or use of the product uh, and that the availability of the product is of vital importance to the public health and welfare. And it would have required the Secretary to notice, notify the commissioner of patents of any determination, and then the commissioner would do the compulsory licensing. In the 90s and 2000s, then Representative Sherrod Brown, now Senator Sherrod Brown, uh, proposed a few compulsory licensing statutes. Uh, and uh, I'm just noticing, actually, that the PowerPoint's a little screwed up, but that was from transferring from Google Docs to this, so I apologize for that. Uh, in 1999, he proposed the Affordable Prescription Drugs Act in response to uh, higher spending in Medicare and other programs that provide drugs to low-income people and, and senior citizens. Uh, uh, he said the legislation is not designed to produce artificially low drug pr prices, so he addressed the concerns of the industry that it would you know, destroy the pipeline, uh, and he said that it was designed to correct unjustifiably high prices. In 2001, he proposed a similar piece of legislation, and uh, also in 2001, right after 9-11 uh, uh, and the anthrax scares, he proposed the Public Health Emergency Medicines Act. So the uh, Affordable Prescription Drug Act, proposed in 1999, would have allowed the Secretary of Health and Human Services to issue compulsory licenses on medicines if the patent holder contractor, licensee, or assignee had not taken or is not expected to take effective steps to achieve practical application. Uh, uh, if a compulsory license is necessary to alleviate health or safety needs, uh, and if, or if the patented material is priced higher than may be reasonably expected based on criteria developed by the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, the uh, licensee would also have had, to, had prior negotiations, uh, except in cases to remedy anti-competitive practices, and it would have allowed for termination of the license if and when the circumstances that led to the license ceased to exist and were unlikely to recur. Uh, uh, the Public Health Emergency Medicines Act allowed the Secretary to authorize the use of a patent invention related to health care uh, if the Secretary determined that the invention was needed to address a public health emergency. Uh, and what's interesting about this statute are some of the remuneration standards, uh, which uh, address uh, the costs of R&D, uh, the uh, evidence of efficacy, et cetera, some 
good standards here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them right now. And then finally, in 2015, Senator Bernie Sanders proposed uh, an amendment that would have allowed uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs yeah. to negotiate uh, or to rather to issue compulsory licenses uh, on medicines uh, after they blew out their budget on sofosbuvir, the uh, hepatitis C drug. Uh, and the interesting thing about this piece of legislation is that uh, it would have allowed them to account for the budget constraints in setting the royalty rate. Uh, so I'm going to end here uh, and open it up to questions. on it doesn't seem to be um, you can hear me oh, okay all right um, be sure to uh, introduce yourself so everybody knows who you are thank you Ashley Stevens focus IP group I thought that was outstanding review Zach um, my review of Cafalva mm -hmm. was very much that yes he was looking seriously at, at uh, compulsory licensing and price controls and thalidomide happened and all they cared about and what got done in those amendments was safety um, well, Kefauver seemed to really care about the compulsory licensing. I mean, he proposed the legislation after the, the amendments passed. Um, it was strong opposition from the administration in my reading of what happened and, uh, and from the uh, industry that sort of killed the compulsory licensing provision. But it, it seems like he did care about, yeah, you're right, the, uh, the uh, changes in safety and efficacy standards, but he also really cared about the compulsory licensing and pricing. I mean, he titled his hearings the uh, uh, antitrust uh, drug hearings, so he, he cared a lot about anti-competitive practices and, uh, and uh, issues of price. There was a great book called The Million Dollar Bug mm -hmm. about antibiotic production that led to Kefalfa down that pathway. Thanks. Well, first. Uh, thank you for doing this. I have some sense of how much work must have gone into this, um, and I hope that you um, might be able to put a bunch of this online, and, yes, and I think that old definitely. bill text will be really interesting, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to see uh, how everything uh, old is new again, or everything new is also old, um, uh, uh, and there's a lot of really interesting examples there. I have a very um, geeky question about mm -hmm. one uh, provision in particular. So when you mentioned the Atomic Energy Act and the taking of patents, um, explicitly, do you, was there compensation in that context? I believe that there was. I don't remember what the compensation standards were, but yeah, I, I believe that there was compensation. Um, and I, that would be, I guess, interesting to know in part thinking ahead to mm -hmm. what will undoubtedly be takings conversations mm -hmm. um, in anticipating the way some of this could, could go forward. Definitely. Just a brief comment. Thank you, Zach. That was fantastic. My understanding of what was initially driving Kefava was comparisons of prices with prices in Europe and the differential management of patents. That was what initially prompted the uh, his. Uh, I think uh, he had a lot of motivations. Yeah, <laughs> but I think it was it was. I think it's interesting the point about the comparison with European prices. Mm -hmm. That's um, probably worth. Well, in the original uh, legislation, uh, he did not have uh, a sort of reference price uh, standard, and then no, it wasn't uh, yeah. that, that it was part of the the legislation. It was part of the the, the conversation. The conversation yeah. mm -hmm. that prompted the discussion was the was people pointing out the comparisons with prices in Europe, where patenting standards were mm -hmm. significantly less. That, that's right. It was. An Italian, and back then Italian, Italy had no patent statutes worth talking about. And uh, there was an offer to supply oreomycin that had been made, I think, with a pirated strain that led to it. Hence that book, The Million Dollar Bug. Uh, Chris Gallagher, IP Strategic. Thank you for doing this. This is very helpful. In your historical scan, um, is there a point where the issue of use morphed into pricing? Or it, it, it sounded, as you went through it, as though it happened just after Gaylord Nelson and, and perhaps somewhere around Kefauver, but then it reverted back to use and availability, it sounded like, 
to me. Would you just comment on, on In terms of the medicines? Yes. Compulsory licensing? Yeah. Um, it seems like price has always been part of the concern there um, in the in the compulsory licensing on, on uh, statutes on, on drugs or bills uh, on drugs that have been proposed in uh, the United States. Um, uh, you know, the, and and maybe the the Brown bill about the public health emergency might be the the kind of exception, but uh, that the, I think Brown was still concerned probably about the price of of drugs in public health emergencies. Um, so uh, I don't know that it morphed. I think that there's always a range of issues that they're concerned about when they propose legislation on uh, drugs, compulsory licenses. Hello, everyone. Alan Black. I'm the, I was the lawyer for the Fabrizyme shortage patients uh, when they uh, attempted to march in uh, to remedy the Fabrizyme shortage. I had a question regarding sort of the, th I guess, the third alternative, which is obviously available in copyright. Are there uh, any sections that have what you might call fair use provisions? I know that for physicians, they are not, or at least they have a defense to patent infringement where they practice a patented medical procedure, so mm -hmm. they just can't be sued. Right. Is, does that occur in any of these other situations? Um, not that I can remember. Um, I think that's probably one of the few that, that has something like that. Um, but in my review of the compulsory licensing statutes, I think they're all um, with the understanding that there will be litigation over the infringement of the patent. Yeah. This is Fred Abbott. Uh, assuming that we're talking about the same thing, the, the Hatch-Waxman Act has a very broad research exemption. Uh, that, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I was actually also thinking about something different, which is the uh, personal use importation exemption under the FDA. And although I don't, wasn't widely publicized, there's one example in the context of HIV where an organization provided medicines to a community of people with HIV early on in the epidemic. It was a drug that was patented in the US, expensive in the US, they could get it more cheaply in the UK, and they simply imported it, and the FDA didn't stop them. Um, so uh, it's not, you know, we, could, we could have a longer conversation about what's in those. The FDA doesn't take the view that that form of personal importation is what the kind of enforcement discretion that it offers for patients is for. Um, uh, but it's an interesting question about how far one might go via the FDA enforcement discretion. Uh, when you're talking about a small number of people and a non-institutional non sort of form of addressing this, this problem. This is Jamie Love. I, on, on this issue of the relationship between compulsory license and, and exceptions or limitations, I mean, there are a fair amount of limitations and exceptions to patent rights. The, the, the doctors that perform, are, are other medical personnel that perform medical procedures. That was actually, by legislation, was considered not an infringement, and, uh, or there was no remedy for the infringement. I should say it was an infringement, but with, uh, an infringement without a remedy. So there's, there's patentable subject matter is another area that the way that you do that, sometimes they limitate, uh, there's limitations on the remedies. Sometimes it's just defined not as an infringement. But the compulsory license, which is really what Zach was focused on, he was trying to focus on areas where there's no controversy over the validity of patent, there's no controversy over whether or not the patent is being used without the permission of the, of the right owner. It was just whether, in what cases where, where is there legislation proposed to permit the non-voluntary use of a patent where there was no dispute uh, on the issue of infringement or, uh, or validity. So I think, I think we've got another panel that's going to follow up on what Zach did. This is Zach's first presentation of paper on things. I think he did a really good job. Uh, the next panel is, uh, um, I'm going to hand over the baton to, to Anna to introduce
Um, I think we'll switch off. So I'll actually give it to you. There we go. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. By way of introduction, I think I'm probably a new face in the crowd for most of you since I don't recognize most of you, so that's probably the case for you as well. Um, my name is Anna Kaltenbeck. I'm the program director for the Drug Pricing Lab uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where I work closely with Peter Bach. Um, and I come to you by way of about 10 years of industry experience in pharmacoeconomics and pricing and market access strategy for the pharmaceutical industry. So where most of your perspectives here today are perhaps uh, informed more from the legal side, mine is from the pricing strategy side. And uh, I I'm actually very eager to um, hand over the baton here to uh, my colleagues on the panel today, to uh, Robert Weissman, the director, uh, I'm sorry, president of Public Citizen, and to Amy Kipchinski at uh, Yale Law School. Um, to hear their uh, takes on compulsory licensing under 1498. And so I will go ahead and, Amy, to you. Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank Jamie and the team at KEI for organizing this. Um, it's a terrific group of people. and. Already I've learned a lot, um, which is impressive because uh, this is an area that I thought I was one of the few people in the country who was kind of obsessed with. So, um, so, so I got interested in the issue of um, this law provision that we'll be talking about, 28 U.S.C. 1498, um, the government patent use provision, because of the implications of the very high prices for hepatitis C drugs. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with the, uh, both uh, significant um, prices of those drugs and then probably also familiar with the vast gap between the prices of those drugs and the production cost of those drugs. So between, you know, list price of $84,000 and a couple hundred dollars of, of a cost of production. Um, obviously, as a very high prevalence drug, got a lot of people's attention, very high prevalence disease, um, got a lot of people's attention. Um, also, from my perspective as somebody who, who spends a lot of time thinking about public health, um, uh, without addressing in a very significant way the prices of those drugs, the, the, the clear uh, uh, a kind of public health approach, which would involve very widespread prescription of that, was not going to be possible, and I think still is going to be very difficult. Um, so that's how I came to this, sort of interested in existing legal avenues that might uh, provide for uh, far more extensive provisioning of these medicines. Um, <clears throat> uh, and this is also an interesting case um, uh, because we sort of know from all that's public about the drugs that um, one could provide them very cheaply and still be assured that the company involved was very handsomely compensated for their R&D. Um, at the end, though, I'll come back um, to a set of cases that I think where there's perhaps uh, equally strong or stronger um, uh, case for the use of this power. Um, uh, so, um, again, I was attracted to this because of, in fact, the bigness of the hep C issue. But if you're thinking um, uh, in practical terms, there's a lot of scenarios in which there might be very little in the way of patent protection, but an important component of patent protection. Think about the EpiPen, right, which is widely described as a generic, right, because the actual drug involved is a generic, but the device is patented. That device provides very little value <laughs> um, uh, in, in innovation terms, but it is the key barrier uh, to a generic EpiPen, uh, which in fact, as a parent who had a child with a, needed an EpiPen, like, I wanted that device. I didn't want an alternative device. There's lots of reasons to think that in fact, a competitive EpiPen w would do much better than uh, a, a design around, right? So that's just one example. I'll, I'll try to touch a little bit on, on some others. But where, particularly where you have these sort of minor patents involved, some of the complexities that you might um, otherwise see, if you talk about a big, uh, big case like the hepatitis C one, um, uh, might be minimized. So I'll, I'll talk about why I think this is an interesting option. I'll talk a bit about the history and sort of um, then some key issues with the use of it. Um, and uh, why I think it's an interesting option, both uh, as a, for the possibility of government directly accessing lower cost drugs and then compensating through the structure of the companies. Um, uh, but also um, uh, negotiating around this power, if we started to all take it more seriously. Um, and then um, I want to touch a little bit on, um, I think the other important thing that we ought to be thinking about, and clearly, you know, the group that put this together is thinking about, is what do we need in the way of um, sort of statutory changes to make this even easier to use, uh, more expansive. A lot of what Zach's talking about, for example, are 
compulsory licensing statutes that would have very clearly reached the private sector. And that's something I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, one limitation of the government use provision is that you've got to at least have a good argument that the, the uh, gov federal government has both approved it and uh, benefits from this use. Right? So there's lots of things to say, I think, about how um, statute uh, sort of statutory amendments could make this power more significant and um, more useful. So the last thing I'll say is I think about this somewhat uh, related to Jamie's initial point uh, about um, the limits of price controls more broadly. Um, I've been doing some work at the state level. Uh, when a lot of states are now interested in questions of price control. And, um, you know, pharma comes back and says things like, well, we'll stop selling to your state, right? And this is one of the things that's happened internationally when countries have get gotten more assertive about price controls. Um, so I think you have to think about if you're, even if you think price controls are a better way of dealing with this, uh, you have to think about uh, having a very robust power of this sort in the background, or you are putting the patients at risk um, because you are at some risk that companies will threaten to, or in fact, uh, walk away. Okay, so um, that said, let me talk a little bit about the history. Zach already covered a great deal of history. The most important thing to, I think, understand about the statute, um, 1498, is that fundamentally the government has never been liable for patent infringement um, in the way that would permit injunctions. So in an initial period, the government simply wasn't, there was simply no court in the land in which you could sue the government for patent infringement. Then 1498, its initial form, there's a few modifications over the year, arises as a waiver of that sovereign immunity, saying, okay, well, actually, we'll accept liability on these terms. No injunctions, only a reasonable royalty. Right? That's, um, that's the history of it, um, as long as it's a use by and for the federal government. Um, so, and the other thing, and I have a long paper on this, um, which we'll go through a lot of these details for those of you that are interested. From its first iteration, this is understood as a way for the government not just to deal with uh, things it didn't understand where there was infringement by a contractor, but to ensure that the government doesn't have to pay too much um, so that you can't price gouge the government. Um, it's used, this provision, um, 1498, is used regularly now um, in the United States. So a couple of examples. Recent case where the Treasury used it to shield private banks from liability for using patented software to detect fraudulent checks. Um, Army Corps, Corps of Engineers relied on it recently to use patented methods to remove hazardous waste. Uh, and it's been used frequently in defense, so cases about lead-free bullets, cases about uh, night vision goggles, right? And in all of these cases, the same structure follows. Infringement happens in some context by private parties, uh, but on behalf of or for the government, and in some context by the government itself. And the only remedy that the patent holder has is to go to um, federal court and to ask for royalties. The examples that we know of in medicine um, the Cipro case is the best known recent example where um, the threat was made um, in the aftermath of the anthrax um, attacks um, that this provision would be used to stockpile Cipro and had very immediate implications. The price was lower, lowered dramatically and government was given a supply assurance. Um, I think a lot of us who worked on this or knew about this thought for, for quite a while that that was the only instance in which it had been used for drugs. It turns out that that was not the only instance in which it has been used for drugs, and that's, that's a misconception. Um, it, it, this provision actually has been used um, many times to buy generic drugs by the federal government. Um, so this, the history goes back to 1958 when the Comptroller General, uh, who is the head legal figure for government procurement issued a decision that said you cannot consider patent infringement when deciding on procurement. We're not patent officers. We don't know anything about patents. Uh, you give us a bid that's lower, we'll take it. It's not our business to ask about patents. Um, that decision then led to a number of agencies, um, predominantly the Department of Defense and the VA, because they're big procurers of medicines directly, um, to start buying generic drugs from Italy. Italy because Italy didn't have patents uh, in any substantial way at the time. So there's a very high profile Pfizer case where um, the agency is buying um, antibiotics simply because they're 72% cheaper. So this bid came in cheaper. Why would we not buy this? Um, it, there's one year in the 60s where the Department of Defense did 50 drugs this way, procured this way. Um, uh, this caused great consternation in the industry which uh, tried very hard to amend the law. And most of what we know about this uh, practice comes from these hearings, 
where pharma came in and said, we have to amend this law so that this power is only useful for purposes uh, in the context of national emergency or national security risk. That'll sound familiar to some of you who've been around these debates. Um, and those hearings are really interesting because they both give a flavor of the history of these. There's not cases about them because the best that I can tell, a pharma always simply agreed to a royalty and never litigated the question of what the royalty was. Uh, so there's no case law. Um, but there's a lot of experience. It's documented in, um, in these hearings in particular. And, um, and when the um, industry tried to change this law and narrow it, uh, the Comptroller General and other figures from government came in and said, well, how are we going to deal with excessive prices in that context? This is what we do. This is a power that we have. It's important for us to have. It's been around since the wars where we worried in particular about price gouging, but this is what it's there for. The law wasn't changed. The law is the same as it was since the 1940s. Um, okay, so I, that's, that's a bit of history that I think is helpful to, to know. Um, but what I want to talk about with the rest of my time um, is answers to, I think, what the or sort of discussion about four key issues with regard to the practical use of this today. Um, so one is about compensation um, and how compensation should be set. Um, the second issue is about what, who can be reached by this power. Um, so the limitations implied by the federal component of this power. Um, the third is, what about the FDA and drug registration? Um, and then the last is to talk about the interaction of this with um, Bayh-Dole um, and some suggestions about practical ways to, to explore the use of this um, in kind of baby steps, if you would. Okay, so um, these four key issues then with practical use. So, the statute does re require um, reasonable uh, and entire compensation. Um, reasonable and entire compensation in this context, there's a lot of litigation about this. We have a lot of cases about it in, um, because it's used so widely outside of the pharma area. Um, and so we have a fairly um, robust case law about this. Um, those of you who are familiar with patent litigation know that there are a lot of factors relevant broadly to the way that damages are set in patent litigation. And those factors are things that the courts refer to when they ask, well, what is reasonable compensation? Um, so um, uh, one of the issues with the use of this, and as, as Bernie Sanders found out um, when he suggested that the VA use this, is that agencies want to know exactly what their liability will be. And given the number of factors involved in reasonable royalty determinations, it's hard to say exactly what they'll be. Now, I would say one thing about that that's important to, to, to stress is that the government's not going to be paying more than it's already paying, right? Um, and the other is that I think there's a couple of ways to go about thinking about how do you cabin this uncertainty and get to a, like, what's the actual royalty going to be? What, it, what ought it be? Um, there's one way, which is really what I've focused on, which is providing a legal analysis of the case law and the doctrine to say what's the right approach, what's the leading approach, how would, this, how would we adapt this to the drug context? Because these cases are typically in other industries, right? Um, so how do we, uh, how ought we approach it using the doctrine? So I'm a lawyer, that's why I do it that way. Um, it also, though, would be possible to do what Sanders proposed doing, which is to codify an approach to this in statute. Um, I have some thoughts about what could be involved in that. Um, and um, I also think agencies could provide guidance um, themselves that wouldn't have the force of law, but what it would do was to provide a framework for negotiations. This is how we're going to view an excessive price. This is how we're going to view what reasonable compensation is under the statute. I think that's another possible avenue for providing um, more of a framework. Okay, so what are the royalty rules? What kind of compensation is actually due under this? A couple of key kind of touchstones in the case law. So one, you don't get lost profits, right? So from, if you're familiar with patents, you have either a reasonable royalty method or a lost profits method. The lost profits more generous in the sense that you can ask for um, uh, profits. In this context, um, case law is quite clear that that is likely never available in this context, that you ask not what the patentee has lost, but what the government in this context has gained. It makes sense. It makes sense if you think about the history of this as a way to think about the government, in fact, preventing excessive pricing. Well, you wouldn't want to turn around and then demand that the government pay the market price. Um, uh, similarly, the way uh, courts and commentators talk about this is you never had the right anyway in the first place, never, to in fact exclude the government from this use. And so you never had the profits to begin with. Right? Um, okay, so no lost profits. So then the question is, what's the royalty? Um, 
If you have an existing royalty, that's very, very influential to courts in these cases, if you've licensed it to something else. Now, that's not going to be the case for a Savaldi kind of drug. Those don't get licensed out, right, typically, um, uh, at least certainly not in markets like the U.S. Um, for some of these other, if you're talking about ancillary patents, a device patent, maybe in some of those cases you'd have an existing royalty. That's very likely to be the, something that the court is either going to just adopt or uh, would take very seriously as a baseline. Okay. Um, but often I'll say we won't have a royalty to draw on. Um, so what do, they, what do the courts do in this case? So the leading approach in the case law to this is that you take as a baseline the, in, the, the, what I'll call in this context, the generic company's profit, the infringer's profits. And you say, well, what are their profits? Take some evidence about that. We say, well, some of that's got to go to the patent holding company. And then um, let's gross it up. Let's increase it. Adjust it if the patentee is a quote from one of the recent cases in 2012. If the patentee took the risks and bore the expense of R&D, I think that's actually a pretty good approach, right? You say, okay, well, let's start with a baseline in this context because generic drugs tend to be far less. You take a percentage of their profit. It's not going to be that's not going to be a very substantial baseline from which to start. But then you back out of that and you ask what is ultimately the kind of public policy question that I think is the right one, which is, what was the R&D investment here? Um, I think the best way to do this is actually also to think about risk-adjusted R&D, right? In these cases, it's the burden is on the patent holder to show this. So they would come to court and they would say, here are R&D costs. Here's how we think you should incorporate that into the payment that we are due. Um, I think that, that the way to deal with the fact that companies are only investing, let's say, $300 million in, you know, uh, R&D or a billion, if you think the number is really big, um, uh, but there's a risk that they'll fail, um, is not to pay for all their failures in some sense, but, you know, to adjust for the risk, right? If there was a one in five risk that this would fail, then you ought to be entitled to that um, additional multiplier um, to ensure that you get sufficient compensation so that the next time around uh, you'll make a reasonable decision to invest wherever the, um, the, 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 the benefits would be um, greater than the cost. Um, we also proposed in our paper that you could add a sort of reasonable profit to this. That's not actually in the case law, um, but I think it would be a reasonable approach if you were an agency um, to, to take in the sense that you could talk about industry-level profits and, and add some component to that. I think that's helpful if you think as a political matter you need to address the concern that there won't be enough profit in the industry. Um, Okay, so if you work this all out as we do in this long paper version, for a drug like hepatitis C, um, given what we know publicly, which is certainly not everything, but we have some ballpark figures for R&D costs and risk and so forth, um, you could easily come to judgments of several hundred million or several billion dollars, right? Uh, we come to probably something around $5 billion. Again, this is all back of the envelope kind of stuff, right? So big payments that, in fact, would compensate handsomely for R&D um, and uh, adjust for that risk as well. Um, so, so I think practically speaking, of course, the other thing that, that would be likely is that as, as soon as this was uh, seriously announced as a possibility, there'd be negotiations about what, um, what, what uh, uh, the price would be. And, you know, if the history has anything to say about it, um, companies have reasons to not want to, in fact, go to trial um, to establish an, an approach to royalty setting, um, I think, in, in some with some fear that that will simply institutionalize the practice. Okay, second question, um, who's covered by this? Um, so under um, 1498, you need the use to be for the federal government and with the authorization and consent of the federal government. So the government must benefit and um, the government must approve in some sense. And this makes sense when you think about this as a sovereign immunity. Um, waiver, right? So it's the government's sovereign immunity, and so it's got to be for the government. Um, and uh, if the government has no idea about this and has no, it's not implied, then it's just a contractor socking the government with some liability payments that the government had no idea about, right? So that's sort of what's going on in these two requirements. Um, the case law is interestingly quite broad um, on both of these prongs. So with respect, for example, to consent, um, consent can be ex expressed or implied. It can come before the case or it can come during the case. And so sometimes the government will just show up in the middle of a case and say, yep, we consent. We will cloak you with our sovereign immunity as a contractor. Um, 
So um, in terms of um, to be concrete about the healthcare context, which obviously does not involve uh, the vast majority of the purchasing doesn't happen through the federal government for drugs in this country, right? The question is, how does this apply? It's easy if there are federal procurement officers involved. That, then it's just like the Department of Defense and the VA did it back in the day. You procure the drugs, uh, and your intermediaries are also covered by this. Contractors covered are covered by your immunity. And then, um, you know, the only remedy that the patent holder would have is a suit um, for compensation. So that's quite straightforward, and the, clearly there would be an argument um, and, and probably clauses in the contracts that would say, yes, we agree, you know, we're buying these generic you know, if that we're, We are invoking 1498. Um, and that's what happens in other, um, in other procurement contexts, too. You write something into the contract, effectively. And that's enough to get both, both of those prongs satisfied. Okay, so if you're talking about, um, uh, instead, programs like Medicare and Medicaid, um, federal programs, obviously, these programs involve typically intermediaries of various sorts. Um, government can, the federal government can be not necessarily that involved in procurement um, in this context. Um, that said, um, the case law is broad in the sense that there are cases, um, one of them being um, the airline or the fraudulent check checks case where there are private actors involved who are doing the infringing without any express agreement with the government, where the um, court looks at the structure of federal law and says, well, you have kind of an obligation to check for fraudulent, fraudulent checks. So we're actually going to imply, imply consent in this case, and we see a benefit for the federal government. And so there are cases of that sort. Um, and so the, I think um, the consent can even be implied by federal legal obligations. Um, we also describe in some detail, which I won't go into here, um, various ways in which we think, specifically with Medicaid and Medicare, say a motivated secretary of HHS could say, yep, here's this way, and in, in a contract in some context in Medicaid where they have contracts um, with companies, or simply in public statements, we agree that this use could be by for the federal government and take on that liability, and successfully, because federal programs are so heavily funded by the federal government, Medicaid and Medicare, the ultimate payer, the, obviously the benefit to the federal government is clear, and so the question really would be how do you show consent? And um, what's interesting is this would, there's not really much case law about these kinds of scenarios because um, the, uh, you know, the, the context tends to be more direct government procurement. So, um, but I don't think looking at that case law, it would be hard to, um, again, you, with, the, with the involvement of the HHS um, in particular, to say, or CMS in some context, to say um, that this is, uh, cloaked under the sovereign immunity of the federal government for those federal programs. So what about private and state-run programs? That's a kind of more wide-open question, um, and I think you'd really have to look closely at some of the cases like the, um, the checks case and see whether or not you could figure out a way that um, the government could, in fact, use cloak its sovereign immunity um, cloak the sort of private sector or state-run programs with its sovereign immunity, that's, I think, more speculative. At some point, presumably, although what's interesting is it's not written into the law, um, there's some limit to and some sort of delegation um, uh, notion to the ability of a federal agent anywhere, because there's no specificity about who has to give this permission, uh, saying, yep, we agree, the federal government's liable. Um, so that, that sort of reaches what we think of as the far limits. Uh, I'd be interested in, you know, kind of trying to explore more what those limits you know, how, how firm those limits are, but, um, but clearly the best uses are very obviously federal government purchaser but, and federal programs. Um, we also have a, uh, a section in our paper about state prisons, which because there's a federal constitutional obligation to provide drugs in prison, we think can also be incorporated into this, which in public health terms is a big, big deal. Um, okay, um, what about the FDA? Um, so the generic, so what we're talking about here is the government buying generics or threatening to buy them and then getting a good deal, right? So what if the generics aren't registered, as typically they wouldn't be, right? Um, so we think there are two ways to address this, if the government's going to use um, or its, um, its contractors or, you know, others involved in these federal programs are going to use this. Um, one, um, I, I think that the best way to think about this is that the drugs should be registered. Um, I think that, you know, mainstream players are probably not going to want to do this without registration. And um, there are different ways to, to register. Um, if there's no data exclusivity, 
um, and then you can simply come in through an ANDA application, right, which I guess probably most of you are familiar with, right? That's the normal application for a generic drug. What about the patents and the possibility that you get sued um, under the Hatch-Waxman Act because there's patents, right, which would normally prohibit you? Um, that actually I don't think is any problem because you simply certify that you're doing this by and, you know, on behalf of the federal government, which means it's non-infringing and there's good case law about this. And you simply say, yes, that would stop me if I was infringing, but I'm not infringing and here's my argument for why I'm not infringing. So I think if there's no exclusivity, you register the drug, it takes a little while, um, but uh, uh, could have some interesting interaction with some of the proposals about the FDA bumping into the head of the queue, uh, cases where there's no competitor. Right? Um, so it could be done relatively quickly. If you have data exclusivity, as will be the case for a really new drug, but not necessarily um, for some of these things like the EpiPen, right? Um, if you have data exclusivity, then you have this issue about what to do. You can't use ANDA because of the data exclusivity. Um, I think you could probably just file an NDA um, and treat it as a new drug, and then the FDA would have discretion to determine how much evidence was necessary to actually approve this as a new drug. And in that context, um, because the FDA has so much discretion, again, if the FDA were motivated, um, uh, potentially could be creative about how much evidence was in fact required. Particularly here, you also have the concern of not wanting to run duplicative clinical trials that are unnecessary, um, uh, but perhaps just some very modest, um, uh, minimal uh, clinical showing that could permit registration of that sort. There's also the possibility of simple enforcement discretion talking about this earlier, that the FDA does have some enforcement discretion. Um, I think that's less, um, less, less likely as an avenue for something that's really institutionalized. Um, and there's reasons to be happy to discuss if you guys want to talk about that. Okay. I've been talking for, for almost long enough, so let me just say something about Bidol. Um, so we will have a long session on Bidol, but one of the issues with Bidol is that it uh, clearly reaches um, drugs that have patents that were all funded in part by the government. Um, but there's this question about what do you do about government-funded drugs where it's been transferred to the industry and then there's additional patents. These kind of hang around, typically quite weak, minimal patents on dosage forms, on formulations, on, you know, crystalline forms, whatever it is. Those are contexts in which you have um, the potential to use Bidol and 1498 together to get a generic registered and then to simply buy the generic and say, well, insofar as that was a valuable innovation, uh, come to the Court of Federal Claims and, and, and make your argument about what your compensation ought to be. And I know that, um, you know, I said a fair amount earlier about the kind of risk of uh, uncertainty around compensation. This would be a, a nice case for you if you were a, you know, sort of government procurement officer because uh, you know, you don't only have the upside, you know, we're not going to pay more than we would have paid, but also there's no punitive damages, by the way, in the context, in this context. Um, uh, that's also very clear. Um, but you also have, you know, trivial patents, um, many of which could be invalidated in litigation, right? The government can always counterclaim in litigation and say, well, that's not a valid patent. Um, and so you really do have, I think, a lot of interesting synergy between 1498 and Bidol. Um, so, um, and I think similarly, thinking about drugs that are simply on, off patent, like the EpiPen sort of scenario, where there's a big um, political, I mean, so imagine, when, when, when is this practically most usable? Um, uh, I think one, one, one plausible scenario is you have a real big concern about the cost, price increases or the cost of a drug with um, either lots of public domain components or by dole rights attaching to it. Um, and a trivial innovation that is, in fact, the barrier to, um, to reasonable pricing. Uh, you know, with the EpiPen, we know that there really isn't any research costs, right, justifying those price increases and so forth. So um, that's a scenario where I think there's some real um, interesting potential to uh, try to invoke this. Again, easiest for a government procurement officer. By the way, I think that I'm not, a, I'm not a procurement lawyer, but I think that provision on procurement law about patents is still good law, right? So that as a procurement officer, you're not supposed to be a patent agent. You're not supposed to be looking at patents. Um, the issue, I think, is actually really more on the registration side. Uh, so I'll just say practically, you know, if a procurement officer wanted to procure a drug in this way, I think what would happen is you'd say, uh, I'm going to solicit some bids. <laughs> in those bids, anybody who accepts it, I'll write my consent. Um, and then let's uh, get that drug registered, go through either ANDA or this other route. 
and then either you negotiate compensation in the background or they sue you in federal court and you make your case. Um, so I think I'll stop there because I've said an awful lot. I know there were some questions that you we, we, we talked maybe about addressing that I haven't addressed, but I know Rob has also got some stuff to say, and we should um, we should move on. Because I got to start, you know, scratching in a second. I got to have the mic working. Um, so I kept this. I kept this away because I thought we would have powerpoints, but conveniently I don't. So we're okay here. Um, I'm going to be more of a respondent, both to uh, to Amy's remarks and also to, to Zach's really great presentation. Uh, with just a couple of things, and I think we have a bit of a conversation, and then we'll open it up. Uh, I think one of the really useful things about looking back at the history and even going back, you know, 100 years back at the history is to sort of go back to some first principles and remind ourselves of how much has changed in the recent past to sort of free our minds to think more creatively about better solutions. So one thing going all the way back, as, as Zach did and as Amy was doing, is just to remind ourselves that really 1498 is actually a grant um, of rights to private holders rather than a restriction in the sense that the traditional laws is that the government doesn't, doesn't get sued, period. Um, and the government's willingness to be sued is, is, a, is a conveyance to, to private property holders. Um, and we, that's a pretty useful starting point to think about, we're not actually taking things from the government, and we're not taking things from private um, holders, we're just restricting how much we've, we've given them over time. The second thing that's related to that is to remember that the property we're talking about here is, is, not, um, is not handed down from high. It is granted by the government. And of course, you know, everybody, anyone who's going to law school knows that all property, all property rights are government and socially determined anyway. But that's most clear with patent rights, which are intangible. You have to go to the government and register. You've got to make a showing of, of an invention and all that kind of stuff. So when you're talking about the right of the, of the private holder, you're talking about a right that is really explicitly in more plain ways than other contexts provided by the government in the first place. And then when we're talking in the context of government procurement, the government is being hijacked by private property holders whose private property is based on a grant from the government in the first place. And it makes a lot of sense to be pretty robust in thinking about the government use is the government use of a private property right that the government conferred in the first place. Again, in a way that's more explicit than is uh, the case in other private property contexts. One of the things that Zach didn't get into as much, and maybe the later panel will, is the history of Bayadol is, it's important both for this, this, the march and right that we focus on that came out of it, but sort of the broader political debate that was going on was a complete transformation about our understandings about the disposition of, of government property and government funded R&D. It wasn't just a small thing. It wasn't like that no one had ever thought about it. There was an affirmative idea that government inventions would be put in the public domain because the public funded them and of course they would be available to everybody. And the switch with Bay Dole, and there were actually a series of, a series of laws that were passed, not just Bay Dole was the culmination of about a decade-long fight based on really bad evidence, but a huge concern about competition from Japan, sort of the China of its day, and uh, a flip in our thinking. And it didn't, it didn't happen, you know, just on its own. It happened because there had been a really concerted campaign. As it, as it turns out, industry had a big part in that, but the universities had an even worse part in it because they had their own narrow pecuniary interest. And sort of a weird part of the story where universities um, who aren't you know, important economic players were big drivers in, in the whole story. But I think thinking about all those things reminds us that we really should be very ambitious in our sense of what the government rights ought to be. Um, in, the, in the context then of, of 1498, I mean, we sort of go through that whole history, but the, the most frequent usage of 1498 is in, the, is in the defense area. 
And again, it's sort of helpful to open up our minds. Um, sorry, Fred, I haven't seen you in a long time, but I, I can't see you and not think about law school per se. So one of the useful things for people who go to law school is you go through these hypo you, you, you go in, you don't really know what you're talking about. Because you're not constrained by any actual evidence, you have the ability to imagine scenarios. So you do this hypothetical. What about this? What about that? What about this? The Defense Department is kind of like that. It's like this whole alternative world to the way everything else works because there's so little budget constraint and because they have such a sense of absolute imperative about achieving their objectives. So you look at 1498 and you have this real world hypothetical. The Defense Department view is we're not letting private property holders get in the way of us doing what we need to do. If we need to build a weapon, we're going to build the weapon. We'll work out later what we're going to pay you, but you don't get to hold us up. And we're not going to pay too much either. And that's sort of how it works. And that's not such a bad way to think about it for other priorities that we might have besides building missiles or night goggles or whatever. Um, and I think if, when, you, when you take that, when you have that perspective, it's really important to go through all the, the detailed things that, that, that Amy just touched on, but she's written a lot about. But it tells you that all those things are totally resolvable, totally resolvable with any political will whatsoever. So I don't actually agree in the case of, of, of the VA that, and, the, and the look at Savaldi that the main issue was uncertainty about um, what the compensation would be to Gilead. I think the main worry was they were, the main issue was they were scared. And no one had done it before, and they were scared of doing it. And if they had wanted to do it, they would have done it. And they would have resolved the, the, the compensation issues pretty easily. In fact, they never would have reached the compensation issues because there would have been a negotiation, which they easily could have understood if they cared to understand it. But they didn't have the mindset approaching these issues that the Defense Department did, would, which is, we're just going to do this. Um, and I think even on the, the most complicated issues in 1498, which are the registration issues that Amy was touching on, Again, where you, if you want to be creative, it's easy to solve the problems. So President Bush wanted to create a global AIDS program. There was a whole question about how we were going to have, how the government, the U.S. government was going to pay for drugs that weren't FDA approved. And they created a parallel universe of FDA approval called tentative approval. It's approval without being approved. And they solved the problem. It's t the problems are totally solvable if there's any political will. So I think the existing statute is pretty, is, is puts us in pretty good shape. Um, I think Amy and others have delved into the case law background stuff of this, and most of the problems can be reasonably well resolved. Um, but for sure, you know, there are things that could be done to, to improve things. I think, in, and maybe I'm not sure if this is the conversation for now or later on, but thinking in terms of some of the improvements, one, I think one point to consider, again, sort of in light of this history, is thinking not just about tweaking 1498 itself, or creating like a special right for the VA or, or Medicare or whoever to, to use things, but to actually embed the government use right in the grant of the patent itself. Because wh whenever there's going to be a usage of the patent, there's, it's still going to be constrained by the Fifth Amendment because it is this kind of taking, effectively. There's always going to be this background idea that um, there's some just compensation, and you're, and you're stuck with whatever the jurisprudence is on just compensation. But if the grant of the property right in the first place was constrained by the, the notion that the government had a right to use it, that the, 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 the monopoly power did not extend uh, in the same way as to, say, government procurement or any other procurement you wanted or any other usage you wanted to establish, then you can escape some of the difficulties um, that come when we have to sort of, after the fact, deal with uh, compensation issues. So those are my uh, quick remarks. And why don't we go to your query, Dana? Uh, just, response, just, response. just two things. Um, one, I think that your point about political will is well taken uh, and, uh, and I think is right. Um, it, these are all resolvable problems. Um, and um, uh, on the takings point, though, I mean, they, they, I don't think this implicates takings at all. And the reason is because there never was a property right to begin with. And that's actually how, what the courts have said about it is, um, you know, and this is, this is part of takings law. If the government never gave you a property right to begin with, they can't take it away. And because this has always existed, this limitation on liability has always existed, not clear that it implicates takings at all. Um, although there are some people who said, well, if it does, at least there's compensation, right? So I think that um, that issue is one that we ought to be mindful of, and it's like not at all a reason not to do what you're describing. Um, but, but this is part of why the history is also important, is that in takings context, if the government never gave you a property right, and this limitation's always been there, then, then, then it's not obvious that you have any rights to be taken away. 
Uh, and that's how the courts have actually thought about this. How about now? Perfect. Okay. So thank you both for that. Um, I, I want to ask two follow-up questions and then maybe turn this uh, a bit to the audience as well. But my first one is um, I want to take it back a moment and think about other models for addressing some of the, uh, the concerns that Amy you know, raised in terms of HCV. So uh, other models have been put forward. For instance, a prize model. Um, most recently, uh, Peter Bach and Mark Trusheim uh, put forward an idea that uh, the government could actually buy Gilead, sell off its parts, and just keep the HCV franchise and use that uh, approach. Now, each of these things have um, different advantages and drawbacks. They're all different approaches. And what I'd like to hear from both Amy and Robert is, what, under what circumstances would you consider uh, pursuing one model or the other over the other, and uh, a little bit more about um, how you might approach uh, those differences? So, oh, that was really loud. Um, so there's lots of things a prize model could do for you that this can't. One of those things would be um, there's areas where we think there's not enough research and we'd actually like to put research focus or we'd like to better deal with some of the intrinsic kind of conflicts of interest within pharma. A lot of my work these days has been about clinical trial transparency and sort of the um, kind of what are some modest reforms we might make to try to get a hold on the conflict of interest when you both sell the drug and produce the information about the drug. Um, so I think there's things like that that a prize model um, potentially could be helpful for, but also certainly for kind of orienting in a more public health focused direction the way that research happens. But you could think about 1498 as like an ex post prize model where like, okay, we set a prize after the fact and we want to ensure now we know how much R&D costs were and so forth. And so you can think about it in that way. And some of my colleagues who I talked about to this, and, hey, this is like a prize, it's just like later on. Uh, I was like, yeah, okay. Um, so Peter Bach has suggested buying Gilead. Um, well, how much was it gonna cost? Um, 150 billion or something like that? Yeah, which is amazingly less than we think we could spend if we wanted to buy at current prices all the HCV drugs we'd need for the American population, wow. Um, so I think one thing is that if you look at the way that I think you should look at 1498 um, is this kind of, well, let's compensate you for your R&D. And in that context, that would be way overcompensating because we know that the R&D, even risk adjusted, came nowhere close to that. And so there's a lot of waste involved in that kind of a proposal. Um, it doesn't mean there's not also, if that were your only option, not also a lot of potential savings involved. Um, there could be. Um, but that's a lot to pay for a drug that we think from publicly available evidence cost um, between several, Sovaldi and Harvoni probably 600 million, 700 million to create, right? Um, there are reasons to actually think in, in incentive terms, it's a bad thing to pay companies like $150 billion, you know, they have more drugs than that, but like to pay companies vastly more than, than the R&D actually costs and that it induces wasteful effort and R&D that is around me too drugs and so forth. So so that's, I think, one way to think about the, the Bach um, thing. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, I have to wait for it to warm up. One of the, maybe I should get yours because yours is really powerful. Um, you know, one of the things the prize model speaks to is that the system, the current system is t utterly irrational. And so it's an alternative system that intends to be rational. There are other possible ways to ha introduce sort of sy systematic and systemic rationality into, into drug development. Um, unless you used 1498 or something like it all the time, it's not, it's actually not that. It's not a replacement system. It's a constraint on abuse um, system. And you could, you know, a lot of us think it would be great if it was used all the time, but that's from going effectively to zero to all the time. That's a, that's a, that's a big move. Um, on, on the, the biotic Gilead thing, you know, I think that's partly provocative and partly, you know, partly serious. I like that Peter's become a socialist, as I told him. Um, but uh, it, it speaks to sort of the, it's a couple of things. One is, 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 you know, the utter irrationality again in, in this market and the sort of the, the weird things, because the idea is you, you'd buy, you take the, uh, the hepatitis drugs, or at least the right to the hepatitis drugs out, you'd sell off the rest, actually pretty useful. So maybe the actual cost to the government maybe wouldn't be 150, maybe it'd be 50 billion or who knows. Um, and that turns out to be 
as Amy said, like a lot less than what you'd spend if you were just buying the drugs to provide drugs to the people who need them. It may even be less, and this is a different point, but it relates to the other thing I want to say. It may be less than what the government will actually will spend over time. It's a little hard to say that way. One of the things that um, that proposal speaks to is kind of the gap between what the government is likely to spend and, and how many people are likely to be treated versus what you want to do as a public health measure, which is treat everybody. Um, and uh, so and I think it was useful to highlight that. Um, you know, in, that weird, in this particular case, it may be that the numbers line up with such that it actually is a relatively sensible way to go. It's definitely not as sort of intellectually sort of fluid and sound um, and kind of just policy appropriate as, as a licensing system would be. That's, uh, that's helpful. Um, I think the actual, just to, to relate back to what the actual number was, it was at, at the top line, I think, $157 billion. It's much less after you sell it off for the parts, um, including the corporate jet. So to your point about plus, inefficiencies. Yeah, plus, yeah, plus you know, <laughs> just driving down the price. Yeah. The farm and now it's getting cheaper. Um, but uh, there's something else that I want to relate this back to. Sorry. She's yeah. saying Trump could get us a good deal, right? <laughs> Um, you mentioned earlier about the system being irrational, and that's actually a, a really salient point here, right? Because uh, companies will price to what the market will bear. And what the market will bear isn't always an efficient price point. It's frequently related to um, the amount of rebates and the costs that go to intermediaries in the system, which really raises the price and has actually incentives that distort it in the upward direction, right? So you could be, I could see a hypothetical scenario in which a, um, a company is making an investment decision between two products, one a curative therapy and another one a therapy that offers some incremental improvement over the existing standard of care, but not curative and maybe a little bit less risky as being seen as highly desirable for takeover uh, or like a compulsory licensing sort of arrangement. And so in that scenario, uh, is it feasible to or I don't want to say feasible, but to what degree do you have to consider when you're pursuing compulsory licensing, like through 1498, uh, the existing system under which uh, drug pricing sort of occurs, and what would you have to address in order to, uh, to reduce some of these disincentives? Does that make any sense? Yeah, it, it, does make sense. it does make sense. Um, so. I think this, like 1498 again, I, I, I think that if it were st started to be used more often, it would have an effect on the way all drugs were priced. Um, but it, uh, uh, unless you anticipate it use, being used for every drug, um, then it's likely to be used for drugs that matter more in clinical terms, right? Because you're not going to bother with a drug that actually has no real benefit, of which unfortunately there are many. Um, so, so in that context, there's, you know, this question that arises about are you going to then sort of dis distort in incentives to invest in truly valuable drugs? I guess um, there's a couple of things to say about that. One, um, so the way that we've thought about what the government ought to offer as compensation is you ought to ensure that for every single project it's profitable going forward, right? And um, that's why you risk adjust and even add a profit if, if, if you like that approach. Um, so you have to believe either that there's intense scarcity of capital or a large surplus of scientific opportunity um, to mean that you'd get a distortion, even though this was a profitable opportunity, um, you know, somebody's going to forego it. Um, and I'm not sure that that's the case. In fact, if you look at the literature about what the elasticity of innovation is in the industry, it's pretty low. Um, so it suggests like maybe there is either a lot of capital and or not a lot of scientific opportunity so that you're taking the opportunities that you have and you're not going to forego one because you simply have to choose between, you know, the long-term diabetes drug and the cure for cancer. Um, you'll take the cure for cancer even though, um, even if you're assuming in this scenario that um, the government's going to get really interested in that one and, and is less going to be interested in the other. And the other thing that I'd say about this is that the potential upsides of getting serious about addressing the kind of dead weight loss associated with monopoly pricing are so big, right? When you think about the difference between, let's say, $250 billion to cure everybody with hep C and like $5 billion, like take a little bit of that money and put it into R&D. If you're really worried about this problem, like take some of that money and put it into public R&D, which we know has more significant returns to health. I mean, if we look at the, you know, kind of evidence about where the most significant drugs come from, I think that's a very reasonable thing to do, and I would support that. I think we ought to think about, you know, how do we move towards a system that prioritizes really innovative research? And so one of the things you could think about what to do with the savings available after this is, well, if you're worried about that, let's double down on truly innovative research and, 
and, and help support it. I, frankly, though, I'm not that concerned about the distortion because I think you'd have to, you'd have to know things that we don't know and have reason to think maybe aren't true about the industry. That's interesting. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you, you've looked into it in more detail than me. I mean, that's sort of the the traditional critique of the industry is that that's already the case. That the incentive is to do is to do non-curative, um, to do treatment, not cures. Um, I don't. I don't actually know the empirical data on that. What I mean, what is sure though is that there are tons of opportunities, sort of public health research opportunities, that are not pursued because there's no profit involved. Um, and cancer is sort of the obvious example, uh, or even. I mean, there's, a, there's some money now that goes into tobacco control that's not trivial, but I mean, that's, there's no question on that. You don't have to sort of speculate about environmental causes, and there's a pretty big distortion there. So I think those distortions are pretty well written into the existing system beyond what would have come from use of 1498. Um, I think at this point, uh, Jamie, shall we open it up to the floor? Well, thanks both for really excellent presentations. Amy, it's glad to hear you've thought through some of these things in such great detail. Um, I want to initially just react to what probably, let, let us call it, a red herring idea of buying Gilead and why that's a truly terrible idea. Um, because what you would be doing is rewarding bad behavior. Um, it, the one piece of necessary reading for anybody in this field over the past number of years is the Senate staff report on the pricing of Sovaldi. Uh, and if, if you read the mechanics of that whole process and the financial engineering and how public health budgets were looked at and, and the way the price was arrived at, and if you, if you come away thinking that that's the right way to price drugs in the United States, then really Probably there's no hope for any of us in, in, in reforming the system. Um, and so I would view what to do with Gilead is more go after them from an antitrust standpoint for excessive pricing and have the Department of Justice and the FTC claw back the money that they have taken advantage of the public in this situation as opposed to buying them out and rewarding them for this conduct. Now that's a different question than Amy's question of, is there a reasonable price for buying out a royalty stream, you know, kind of at the beginning of the situation and paying someone the reasonable price? But bear in mind that they didn't do the research, that Pharmacet did the research, so it even goes back a stage before that. So, sorry, just I couldn't help myself <laughs> on paying out the Gilead shareholders. But, um, so we have this very interesting idea now coming, right, which I, I just to tie in a little bit to 1498, um, we do have a, a, a president who says that the way I'm going to bring prices down is I'm going to negotiate the heck out of the prices with the pharmaceutical industry. And, of course, Amy points out, I think, appropriately, that, that may be possible with the VA where you have direct purchasing. Um, it ties, though, back into the kind of original problem with the Medicare Part D extension when we have the statutory provision that the federal government won't negotiate prices. So that was probably the biggest marker uh, that Congress laid down in terms of, you know, don't try to take advantage of the pharmaceutical industry because that literally made no sense at all. The argument was from the pharmaceutical industry, well, if you let the government negotiate with us, the prices will be too low. Um, which is kind of an interesting argument. But um, so you could extend this idea of federal price negotiation, which is kind of what Amy's suggesting, more broadly from the direct purchasing to the intermediated purchasing with the Medicare and the Medicaid, for example. And then, then you would get into the question, if you're really going to negotiate with someone and said, I need a lower price, and they say, well, I'm not going to lower the price, uh, and I'm just not going to sell it to you at that low price, that's when the negotiator from the government side needs to be able to step in and say, well, we do have a solution to that. And our solution to that is we're just going to use the drug and we're going to determine what the royalty is and then we're going to pay it to you, even if you have to go through the in intermediate function of the court. So. Um, 
it, it's not in, inconceivable that given the current rhetoric coming out of the present administration that really one way to lower the prices is to A, have the government actually step in and do the direct and indirect negotiation, but then B, having the necessary backup of 28 U.S.C. 1498 as a mechanism for ultimately determining a fair price, um, and I have just solved the entire problem. Thank you. Well, thank you, Fred. <laughs> this is probably a question uh, uh, for uh, Robert. <clears throat> a recent case in the Federal Circuit just held that patent rights were not property rights, but were public rights. And um, accordingly, uh, they, that was appealed to the Supreme Court on cert, and the court declined to take the case. But it may come back. Do you think that this public rights versus private property uh, helps your argument? And um, I should note that the issue in that case, which is MCM versus HP, involved the right to a jury trial before uh, a patent could be nullified. So it seems to me that this MCM case does have a, have a bearing on your argument that, that what Congress gives can be taken away. What you're running into, of course, is it didn't come from Congress. It came from the Constitution. And uh, that's the difficulty you're <coughs> facing with that argument. It's not what government gives. It's what the Constitution gives. Um, I'll just say, I don't know that case in particular. I'll read it. It's interesting. Um, on the taking side, I guess I think um, what's interesting is there are not a lot of takings cases, if that's sort of what we're, where we're headed, is sort of thinking about takings and how does it apply. I think there's reason to think that if you just take, this is why I asked the question about the Atomic Energy Act, like if you just take the patent, there's no compensation, and that's exactly what happens. And there's no argument that, that, that you could see this coming as a patent holder that, that courts would see that as a taking. What's interesting is there's not even law about that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that is not to say that in circumstances like this, and this gets to the kind of regulatory takings context, right, where the government never gave me this right in the first place, that, that takings law actually applies. So um, I guess that's just a brief response to that. Um, and, you know, then if there's compensation, um, you know, they would obviously be the takings, but it's been compensated. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to uh, um, just comment on this issue of what what happens if the if the intervention in the patent drives incentives down uh, to a certain level. I, and, and I think that it's a mistake to put on the on the patent uh, on the on the patent system the entire weight of the incentive system or the financing system for the development of new drugs. Uh, most of the cost to develop new drugs has nothing to do with the patent. It has to do with the cost of conducting clinical trials and things like that. Often the patents are developed out of a relatively small investments in, uh, and, or, or uh, even in, in many, in some cases, even things that where the driver was a public sector research that either a private or a public party at some point was able to sort of patent. You see this with CRISPR and things like that where it was a sort of a community that was in working on something, but somebody ends up sort of getting the brass ring at the end. But the cost of the clinical trials is, is, is you know, is, 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 a big, is a big expense. So should the patent system be the thing that you use to finance clinical trials? That's really the question you have. And uh, right now, that's, that's one of the principal ways you do it. But if you were to reduce uh, uh, what you get from the patent monopoly, uh, in orphan drug development, they, the federal government subsidizes 50% of the cost of qualifying trials. That, that lowers the cost by, by half of doing those trials. That's a pretty, you could deepen that subsidy, extend it to other drugs if you wanted to. Uh, the prize system, the prior review voucher, was a, which is a form of a prize system that's been running between $125 and $350 million, has really stimulated a lot of interest in, uh, in registering uh, drugs that people didn't care about before. They're trying to figure out what people are, what's going to qualify now. I, I work, got some, some uh, so I think that you can, you can create in financial incentives in the back end that are not related to the price of the drug. 
Uh, the prior review voucher is an example that we're doing right now, and the prize system is one that people, including us, think that you should do. And you can subsidize the trials like the orphan drug things to lower the cost of doing trials. You don't have to put everything on the patent to finance clinical trials. It actually creates a lot of problems in doing so. So I think that uh, uh, the types of, you know, uh, going forward and things like government use are, are the other things will be, be described. Uh, uh, you shouldn't dismiss them out of hand because you're so committed to the idea that they would reduce innovation unless you think that nothing else will be done to address your concerns over innovation. I, I, I notice nobody's here from Gilead, uh, so we're sort of trying them in abstention. And I feel compelled to you know, hear something as to what they would argue in response. And I imagine it would be something like, look, we put $600 million down, put it on lottery, you know, roulette wheel number 22, we got the hit, and now you're going to say we don't get our money for taking that risk. And not only that, did we win? We don't have a treatment. We have a cure for a very debilitating disease. I, I'd imagine that would, their argument is. My question to the panel is, how would you articulate their argument, and then what would your response be? Given the overall kind of approach to gambling in this country, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I don't think they would say we won the we won the lot we won the roulette wheel, and so you ought to pay us all the money in the federal treasury. Um, I think they would say, um, I don't think that would be a good argument. I think they would say that they, uh, at least what they do say, they say, well, you know, other, other ways, uh, if you have liver cancer, that's very expensive. And they say um, uh, that, they say largely that, right? What's interesting is that it used to be all the public health advocates saying we have to pay for value in drugs because our paradigm problem was crappy drugs. And so what we didn't want to do is pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for drugs that did, did very little or didn't help at all. So now what's interesting is that that has largely become something that, that you hear from, like you, have, you should pay for value. Um, and I think the trouble with that, and we do a little thought experiment in our paper, and we say, well, that's interesting. Like, you know, and on one hand, yes, I mean, you don't want to pay for no value. Um, but um, if you don't pay any attention to R&D costs, like you just like don't allow yourself to look over there, um, you can end up doing some crazy things. It's like Martin Shkreli is like, my drug is very valuable because it saves lives. Well, like, did you do any R&D? No, I didn't. Well, but still, it's very valuable, and so you could be dead otherwise. So aren't you willing to pay $10,000? Like, you know, well, well, yes, if my choice is being dead, but you didn't do any R&D. Like, that's crazy from an economics perspective. I mean, that's, that's, I think, one one of the scenarios, right, that we have to have in mind when we think about, like, the fact that there's value as a d disconnected entirely from R&D can't be the right way to think about what the appropriate amount is to pay for a drug. So so that is it tends, tends to be Gilead's response. There's value in this, which I agree with. But when the value is, is utterly, you know, there really is this problem that when you have a valuable, you know, intervention, if you price it, exorbitantly, you, you, you know, you have, it's just rent seeking, right? You're just getting massive amounts of money out of the federal treasury in part because we've started to think about drugs as a right. I mean, it's not exactly a right, but like we start to mandate coverage of drugs, right? And so, yeah, it's not a right, but it started, you know, there are mandated, there's mandated, and Rachel's been writing about this too. There's mandated coverage of drugs, you know, in federal programs of certain sorts. And that means you can kind of hold the government over a barrel. I'm sorry, you can't negotiate with me. I can charge you whatever I like. doesn't matter what I spend on R&D. It's a little like, you know, I don't know, your house is burning down, the fire department shows up and says like, okay, how much are you gonna pay me, right? Like that's not a public-minded system and no economist would set a system up that way. And that's kind of what my response to Gilead's response would be. Yeah, so um, they, the industry still uses the the R&D thing, um, it's cures at a high level. It's R&D, innovation, they still use it. R&D is gone, that's too technical. Innovation sometimes, but it's not as good as cures. Cures is what they're locked in on and it's a pretty good term. Um, but that's, but what, what Gilead has not talked about is their investment in the R&D. Um, they didn't put $600 million on the table, they bought the drug after it had already been pretty far. So they put down $11 billion on the table, which is already sort of priced in both all the risk so you actually could identify it if you, want, if you wanted to sort of go through the acquisition of sort of the, the Peter Bach model, you can take the $11 billion and say based off of that, and it's not that much more you want to go. 
Um, but what they are talking about is the value from is, is the value. And I think, following what Amy's saying, I just think that's it's really important that we not get locked in on in terms of the the value framework because it leads to these crazy outcomes. And of course, the and it, it, you can compare against you know an out of control medical establishment. So it's true. I mean, hospitalization is really expensive. Um, or the value of a life, right? We have a, our, our government puts a price on the value of a life. It's between five and ten million dollars. Um, it doesn't mean that you do that you don't take into account the actual cost of, of what of, of what a remedy is to save the life. Um, you automatically give everybody five to ten million dollars, you know, five to ten million dollars. Um, and the, the value, the whole value thing, doesn't make sense. If you, when you ignore the fact that, it, that all the pricing is in, is in the context of, of monopoly grants that are government granted monopolies in the first place, like it's this is not a it's not a it's not a market uh, like any other market. Uh, if it were, then we get it we get a different kind of pricing system, and you could say, well, yeah, people don't want to pay above the value, but they've got a competitive market to go for. All right, so we have reached the, uh, we have one more, and then I think we'll. Uh, <laughs> one more forceful uh, comment. Everybody has to have some lunch, so. Um, a, co a comment and a question for Amy. Just a comment about the Gilead investment. They paid $11 billion for farm access, but the goodwill, the value of Savaldi was only $74.2 million, and they're amortizing the $11 billion as an intangible asset, so it's not a sunk cost. So it's grossly overestimating their investment. But I wanted to just respond to um, Amy's discussion of the handling of the exclusivity issue. You suggested that one way to uh, get around the data exclusivity issue would be to get the generic registers as an, through an NDA and that the FDA could be creative in the requirement for evidence. I'm a bit troubled by that because the FDA is required to consider, to, is required to, ha to be presented with substantial evidence, which means data from adequate and well-controlled trials. If there are no trials, and the only trials are those that have been submitted in support of the originator, they've got nowhere to go. I don't think that that's a, 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 an, an adequate workaround except that we are entering a new era if the EMA are publishing clinical trial data in full, then that might be a way of utilising clinical trial data in support of an NDA that would allow FDA to work around the data exclusivity. I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. One of the interesting things about the FDA that in this context doesn't necessarily look so good is that um, a lot of the FDA is not statutorily determined, but is determined by FDA practice, even draft guidance, it's not even regulations. So, you know, whether the FDA has the discretion to say, well, what is an adequate and well-controlled trial? I mean, we actually know that from some research a colleague of mine at Yale did, Jill Ross, that the FDA has approved many drugs with only one trial, with trials that were not randomized, right? So, and could they create an alternative pathway that said this is what an adequate and well-controlled trial in this context is? Um, I think there's this historical practice where they've done that. Again, it requires motivation from the agency. Um, so I think DA has discretion, an enormous amount of discretion in terms of how it defines that. Um, and I would say um, we should be concerned about, you know, a, a requirement that would be a very high burden on a company, in part for the ethical reasons that you don't need more safety and efficacy data, and so why would you want to put people through that in a trial? Um, and so maybe you should be able, for example, to look at publicly available evidence, not actually data from a trial, but data from public regulatory submissions, um, in data, they're actually in the Savaldi context, there, it has been, there have been clinical trials of the generics. So, you know, in some scenarios you might have that. And remember, we're also only talking here about drugs where you really wanted to go after them in the first five-year window where the NDA, the NDA option really is the, the, um, the, the main one. So I think, I think the FDA has a lot of discretion. Um, I think that the European process is likely to be hidden behind a contract that would not allow you to do that. That's my guess. Um, we don't quite know yet, I think. But, you know, it's another area that if you, again, if you want to get serious about it, I think there's both things the agency could do to do this well. And you could, you know, legislate if you wanted to. 
Yeah, I think I think you're right to say you you, you want to be you don't want to sort of blow up the FDA approval process because it's really important. And the examples that Amy's are, are pointing to are examples of abuse at the FDA where they're not doing their job. You don't want to sort of fast track more abuses. But you, at the same time, you can say these are special circumstances. You can you can. It's not that hard. First of all, it's all it's all arbitrary. Again, you're just trying to work around some stupid government grant. It doesn't make sense in the first place of exclu exclusivity. So it's not that hard to be creative about it and say it's, this is what it's about. And then and I again when they want to do these things, when DOD wants to do it, but even when FDA wants to do it, they find solutions. It's only, you know, we, when there's not that will and we're kind of in this place and we're just trying to be super creative to come up with this maze solution, you kind of get to stuff that's not so satisfactory. But I think, again, when people want to actually affirmatively want to do it, not that hard to come up with the ways to do it that makes sense. But it would be, has to be for an NDA or a BLA because if it was an and or a, or a by a similar application, then they'd be quick, 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 get caught by the market exclusivity, which you couldn't. Yeah, but look around. what they did with, with the tentative approval. They just made it up. It is completely made up, tentatively approved. They could tentatively approve over an exclusive. I mean, just, they just could. All right. Um, thank you all. It's a wonderful discussion.
Hello. Welcome back. I hope everyone had a good lunch. Welcome, and thank you very much for coming to this panel to listen uh, to the officially titled, and I quote, long awaited, quote, non voluntary use of patents in court cases involving requests for permanent injunctions as a remedy to infringement under the standards set out, I need some water, by the United States Supreme Court in eBay versus Merck Exchange, and we even have a little site in the heading, 547 US 388 in 2006. I like to simply call it compulsory licensing issues and patent infringement, but you can choose either one when you talk about what happened here today. It is my honor to be here today with uh, such distinguished panelists and very interesting um, uh, uh, different industry and scholars that are here today to talk about these issues. My name is Hillary Brill. I am currently the practitioner in residence at American University's College of Law. I teach intellectual property classes and I teach technology policy classes. I happen to also be specifically interested in this panel because in one of my previous roles, I had been at eBay for 10 years. I was the head of government relations and I was their global intellectual property policy council. I happened to be at eBay in 2006 during the eBay versus Merck exchange case. So I can provide a little bit of a different perspective, hopefully um, as a moderator in this panel and uh, let you know what a practitioner's view of this case um, might have been for, if you'll just indulge me for about a minute and a half and then we will get to our distinguished panelists. In 2006, I was able to actually sit in the Supreme Court and watch the arguments uh, in front of the justices. And if you recall or don't know, and I won't go into the details of the case because our panelists might, but at that time, eBay wanted to use and was using a feature called Buy It Now. Now it was 2006 and 30% of eBay's actual listings were Buy It Now um, or had Buy It Now capability. Now I don't know what the recent statistics are, but it's much, much greater. eBay was trying to transition out of just being an auction type of website. People wanted instant gratification to continue to be competitive. They wanted to use Buy It Now. Merck Exchange owned a patent for a Buy It Now feature. eBay wanted to use that and went into negotiations with Merck Exchange. Then that stopped. Merck Exchange sued eBay, which brings us to where we are here today. eBay lost the case. However, it did set up a precedent for injunctions that technology and e-commerce industries still rely on and use in many ways today. It created, and I won't go into detail, but the four-factor injunction test. Um, if I get this correct, I believe it includes irreparable harm, or they call it injury, public interest, the balancing of hardships, and whether or not you can have adequate monetary um, compensation for what's at issue. So what happened was eBay lost, but they didn't have to stop by now. So for all of you people who use eBay, and if you don't, go check it out, you still can use buy it now because the court decided that under this injunction standard of eBay paid, they could continue to use this. Now in the e-commerce sector, as I said, that was a movement um, forward. It was a, a loss and a victory. And in the technology sector, it's a question of innovators versus competitors and who gets to use a patent. In technology products, you can have hundreds, maybe thousands of patents in one product, like in your, you know, in a smartphone or in a watch. But you guys are here to talk about something much more important. You're here to talk about medical patents in devices or in pharmaceuticals where just one patent can make the difference between receiving access to life-saving medicine or life-saving medical devices. So that's the perspective from a technology practitioner, but you're here to hear these distinguished panelists. And it really is my pleasure to introduce Andrew, Andrew S. Goldman. He is the Council for Policy and Legal Affairs at KEI. 
He is an attorney in Maryland and New York, and he's admitted before the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland. At KEI, Andrew provides integral legal analysis to support KEI's advocacy work, including domestic statutory and regulatory issues, and including those related um, to government rights and federally funded patents, and internationally on various trade agreements such as TTIP, TPP, and RCEP, as well as on compulsory licensing requests on multiple continents involving expensive medicines for hepatitis C virus and cancer. Prior to joining KEI, Andrew was an associate for IP in Baltimore, where he practiced copyright and trademark in litigation and transactional work. Andrew is a graduate of University of Maryland School of Law. He received his MA from Columbia and graduated with a BA in politics from Princeton University. Our second speaker, Professor, Ra Professor Rachel Sachs, is a scholar of innovation policy whose work explores the interaction of intellectual property law, food and drug regulation, and health law. Her work explores problems of innovation and access considering how law helps or hinders these problems. Professor Sachs' scholarship has or will appear in journals that include Harvard Journal of Law and Technology, the University of California Davis Law Review, the Yale Journal of Law and Technology, and the peer-reviewed Journal of Law and Biosciences. Prior to joining faculty, Professor Sachs was an academic fellow at the Center for Health and Law Policy, Biotechnology, and bioethics and a lecturer of law at Harvard Law School. She also clerked for the Honorable Richard Posner of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. She received her J.D. magna cum laude from Harvard Law School and a Master of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. She received her A.B. in bioethics from Princeton University. And our last speaker, Matthew Herper. Did I say that correctly? Oh, I'm so glad. He is currently and has been for quite some time. I, is it 17 years at Forbes? Is my research correct? <laughs> he was two when he started. Um, he's a, currently the senior editor at Forbes magazine, and I quote himself, and I found this. He says that I believe this is biology's century. <laughs> Did you? I don't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> he has covered science and medicine from the Human Genome Project through Biox to blossoming DNA technology changing the world today. He consistently covers biotech and pharmaceutical industry and is one of the most prominent journalists in this space. In fact, I found out by some of my little research that he was named one of the top writers to follow, um, particularly for his blog on the drug business. The Medicine Show, which is your blog or is that your... Okay, well, I found it looking for some information, and it has been called essential reading for anyone trying to make sense out of today's headlines. So if you don't have it anymore, I think you need to bring it back for essential headlines. Got it. Got it. So we are lucky to have him here today because he can help us with the essential headlines. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers to discuss a compulsory license thing and patent infringement issues, particularly with your experiences. And Andrew, I believe you're going to be first. Hello. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to talk about eBay compulsory licenses. As uh, Hillary just said, judicially mandated licenses post eBay versus Merck Exchange, and today we, we just want to focus on medical technology patents. There's a lot even in that sentence, so I just kind of want to start. I know that we have a lot of lawyers and professors in the room, but for, there's some that aren't. So let's just back up and start from the very beginning. Um, we're talking about patent infringement cases here. Um, and we're talk, when we're talking about eBay compulsory licenses, we're talking about um, the questions of, of injunction and when injunction is going to be denied. So what's an injunction? An injunction is basically a court order to refrain from doing something. When we're talking about damages, we're talking about, typically talking about money, um, monetary damages. So the rule before eBay, just to really go back, um, the general rule in patent infringement was monetary damages for past harm plus a permanent injunction 
going forward, an injunction being a, a sort of forward-thinking remedy. And then in the in the case of eBay, and uh, Hillary talked about it a little bit, I just I'll walk through it really fast. Um, it's a patent infringement case. Merck Exchange had a business method patent that was sort of similar to what eBay was doing. It's a, for an electronic market designed to facilitate the sale of goods between private individuals. Um, Merck Exchange tried to license the patent to eBay. They failed to reach an agreement. They sued eBay in the Eastern District in Virginia. At the district court level, they, they were found, uh, eBay had found, a, uh, was found to have infringed. Um, there was damages awarded, but there was no permanent injunction. Um, at the appellate level, the Federal Circuit reversed, and they applied that general rule that I just mentioned about injunctions. They, so they, they granted uh, the permanent injunction. And then it was taken up to the Supreme Court, where the question was really whether that, per, that rule about injunctions was appropriate for, for patent infringement. And the Supreme Court ruled for, for eBay on this. E eBay tried, e eBay argued that a traditional four-factor test, which Hillary mentioned, um, using principles of equity, or just principles of fairness, should apply to cases of in patent infringement. And so this, this is the four-factor test. For permanent injunction, the plaintiff has to demonstrate irreparable injury, the, the remedies at, at law, for example, monetary damages, are inadequate to compensate for the injury. That the remedy in equity is warranted after a balance of hardships, so basically just balancing the arguments of which side would be harmed um, if an injunction is granted or if it's not granted. And the public interest, that the public interest would not be deserved by a permanent injunction. And the court ruled for eBay, and they held that the four-factor test here would apply to Patent Act disputes. So why is this important in the context of what we're talking about? Um, so injunction after this case is, is no longer the default remedy for patent infringement. Um, and, and when an injunction is denied, it allows the continued infringing use of the patent in exchange for a running royalty. And there are quite a few cases where this has happened, where courts have denied the injunction and granted a compulsory license for the patent set issue. Um, eBay compulsory license is just a, a general, I think Fred will later talk a lot about the TRIPS, uh, WTO TRIPS agreement, but these compulsory licenses would, would fall under Article 44 of that agreement on injunctions. Um, that's in Part 3 on the enforcement of intellectual property rights. In Paragraph 1 of Article 44, it provides that judicial authorities shall have the authority to order a party to desist from an infringement, so basically to enjoin them. And in paragraph two, that members can limit the remedies available against such use to payment of remuneration. And article 45 on damages is also relevant here. Um, for examples of, of how this has played out in, in the courts on cases of, of medical technology patents, there's, there are lots. This is not an exclusive list, but you can see there have been cases having to do with uh, oral contraceptives, arthroscopic surgical instruments, transcervical contraceptive devices, uh, things for cardio surgery, transcatheter heart valves, surgical spine devices, grafts, hep C diagnostic tests, and so on. Um, so I, I just wanted to walk through a few cases to demonstrate how this has worked. Um, this is a case called Bard Peripheral Vascular versus W. L. Gore and Associates. It's from 2009 um, from the uh, district court in Arizona, the federal court. Um, it's a good case to look at in terms of how the court looks at the public interest when we're talking about medical technology patents. Here, this was a patent infringement case that had to do with cardio technologies, grafts, cardiovascular patches, stent grafts. Um, so the, uh, on the motion for injunction, the injunction was denied. Um, the court focused on two of the four factors in particular, the inadequate remedy at law um, and the public interest. Um, they, the courts, as far as the inadequate remedy at law, the court said that a fair and full amount of compensatory mon money damages, which here was about $185 million, when combined with a progressive compulsory license will adequately compensate plaintiff's injuries such that the harsh and extraordinary remedy of injunction with its potentially devastating public health consequences can be avoided. And the public interest 
um, factor, the district court said that the potential disruption in the availability of the product to thousands of cardiovascular patients was, was going to be a, a real problem. And there's a, there's a long quote here. I won't read the whole thing, but the point is that the, the court was saying that the risk is too great. Uh, placing Gore's infringing products out of reach of the surgeons who rely on them would only work to deny many sick patients a full range of clinically effective and potentially life-saving treatments. Um, the royalty rate in this case was set at between 12.5% and 20%, depending on the type of the product. Um, it was affirmed on appeal. Um, and then in rehearing on banc, it was vacated only as to the, the willfulness of the infringement, but this part of the ruling stands. Um, the next case is uh, Edwards Life Sciences versus Core Valve. Um, this is kind of this is an interesting case from 2011, uh, the federal court in Delaware. Um, this has to do with transcatheter heart valves. Um, core valve was found to have infringed. Edwards was awarded $72 million in lost profits and a $1.3 million reasonable royalty. The injunction was denied. Um, and the court, I'm not going to read you all of this, but uh, we'll circulate this stuff later so you can, you can look at it if you're interested. But um, the court was, in this case, uh, particularly interested in the arguments having to do with core valve just packing up and moving to Mexico if an injunction were granted, which is kind of relevant in our uh, President Trump universe right now. But um, the, 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 in, the, um, in the public interest factor, um, you can see the court said the public interest would not be substantially advanced or harmed by the issuance of an injunction since core valve would be able to continue manufacturing the accused product abroad without seriously affecting the supply of the product available to the public. Um, this, was, this was a case entirely about manufacturing. There were actually no sales of the infringing product in the United States. Um, and a lot of it really had to do with kind of sloppy, I shouldn't say sloppy, but um, the, the failure to build out an evidentiary record um, and that's something that you'll see in, in a lot of these cases where, you know, Edwards um, tried, argued things, speculate, speculated a lot of things, but didn't really produce evidence. Uh, the next case, Conceptus versus Whole Logic. Um, this is a case from 2012. Um, this had to do with a transcervically introduced permanent contraception system. Um, this was, uh, this injunction was denied um, the court primarily for, looked at the last three. The first, the irreparable harm factor actually weighed in favor of an injunction. But um, again, it came back to this issue of the clear public health benefits, the public interest, the clear public health benefits from having a choice of different products with different qualities, and what would happen if you, if you removed one of them. And in, particularly here, this was a, a case where there's, there was only two products on the entire market for this. Um, the case ultimately settled after all this, and it, they, they agreed to a 5% running royalty. Um, next case, I'm, I'm almost, not too much more of this. Um, Smith and Nephew versus Interlace. Uh, this is a case from 2013. Um, the patents had to do with an arthroscopic surgical instrument, a surgical endoscopic cutting device, and the method for its use. Um, the, on the motion for injunction, there was sort of a, the court found the first two actually weighed slightly in favor of the injunction, but the last two um, really, really weighed against it. And um, the, in the public interest factor, um, they noted that um, the defendant's evidence of the, the negative impact to doctors and patients, so if they actually were to have granted this, um, would outweigh the plaintiff's evidence that there were no clinical studies showing any advantage over of the one product over the other. Uh, and the court said that because different doctors may find one device or the other more suitable for particular uh, intrauterine tissue procedures, health providers and patients benefit substantially from having both products available to the market. Um, the, this is a case of Bayer versus uh, Watson. This is from last year. Um, and it had to do with an oral contraceptive. Uh, the permanent injunction, motion for permanent injunction was denied. 
um, this was a case where Watson had not actually yet introduced its generic. They had filed um, an ANDA. Um, and the main factors in this case were actually the first two. This is kind of, it's kind of interesting because this, is, this demonstrates that not every court is going to look at the public interest the same way. Um, th in this one, they actually said that the public interest weighed slightly in favor of Bayer. And the court was, they said that, okay, there's a public benefit to having an earlier launch of a generic, but the court was actually more focused in the importance of protecting the patent, the validity of patent, and encouraging investment. So there's actually the first two factors in this one um, that swayed it. Um, this is actually a trade secrets case, and I just wanted to put this one up here just to illustrate that this is, uh, it had to do with um, a transcatheter mitral valve, so still t med medical technology patent issues, but this was a trade, a trade secret case, just to say that this four-factor test has applied beyond patents, um, and just to sort of demonstrate how that has worked. Um, and you can, you can I'm not going to read all this, but again, just sort of focusing, look at the, the public interest. Both companies had prototypes, um, and the court, uh, I believe they denied the injunction in this case. They, they said that if they were to have granted the injunction, um, it would have imposed uh, an 18-month an delay in the progress of one transcatheter mitral valve device that works, and thereby keep a life-saving device off the market for an additional year and a half. Um, and that is it. I, th this is, I didn't want to overstate this. There are plenty of cases where injunctions are granted, but um, this was just to sort of illustrate how these things have worked. And um, thank you very much. Person, sorry. Uh, so I don't have slides. Um, Andrew has very helpfully gone through a number of the relevant cases in this area, and um, I'm going to focus in on one of the prongs of the eBay test, specifically the public interest prong, and consider the ways in which uh, courts are applying this prong, what they're doing, and then what should they be doing. So I um, have to say I haven't read every case involving injunctions because there's a lot of them, although I like to think I've read most of the ones involving medical patents. Uh, and then eventually, essentially what's going on is that courts do not treat this prong of the test very seriously, especially as compared to the other prongs of the test. They often spend a lot of time talking about adequacy of damages or irreparable harm. Um, but they don't spend very much time on the public interest factor in a way that I think is problematic. And so uh, something that is very common to see, not so much in um, the medical sector, but in uh, cases involving other types of patents, is that the court just asserts that there's a public interest in a well-functioning patent system and then sort of moves on, uh, which is interesting but not very satisfying. It feels really incomplete. Uh, in health-related cases, though, there's a couple of different kinds of things the courts do. And actually, Andrew, can I go back through your slides? Sure. Okay. Um, so, so this is an example of one of them, right? This Bayer case uh, is one about, um, you said it's an ANDA, right? It's a case involving a generic and a branded company. Um, and courts will often acknowledge the needs of patients here, right? It's typically placed... Um, as against the interests of having a well-functioning patent system, um, but often the analysis looks something like this. So there's um, a District of Maryland case that I like from a couple of years ago in which uh, Par Pharmaceuticals is suing a generic company about a drug that treats um, unexplained weight loss. Uh, and they want to know whether we're going to allow the generic on the market. And the court, they get to the public interest prong and they say three sentences. They say, the court recognizes that the public is served by the availability of low-cost generic medications. Great start. On the other hand, the public also has an interest in the protection of valid patents because it promotes innovation. This factor, therefore, is neutral. That's it. 
Uh, so this is sort of similar, right? And, and they say here, in this case, the Andrew's going over that it's slightly weighed in favor of Bayer, whereas the court in my case said it was neutral. But they sort of do this, right? They say on the one hand, we've got patents. And on the other hand, we've got the needs of patients in this particular area. And those are both really important. And what do we do? And how do we know? So they don't do a lot more uh, deeper investigation of the question. Now, there are other cases which weigh these factors and find in favor of uh, the defendants in particular. So uh, this is one of them, the Smith and Nephew case that Andrew went over, as is this Conceptus case. Uh, these are mostly cases that are between two branded competitors or would-be competitors, depending on what stage uh, we get the opinion at. Um, and I think Matt is going to talk about the case that was recently decided between the PCSK9 manufacturers, right, where we have a court um, looking at these two companies which have different branded products competing in the market, and they say, yes, there's a traditional notion that being a patent holder is really important and we want to value that and it matters in the public interest analysis, but also in that case what the court said was the public generally is better served by having a choice of available treatments. And so you see that here um, in this case that Andrew is citing, and you also see that here in the Smith and Nephew case. So the court, in some cases, ultimately grants the injunction, like in the one that, that Matt is going to discuss, and in some of these cases doesn't grant the injunction because there are, of course, three other factors to this test, and the court has to figure out how these shake out as against each other. Um, but the opinion may, in fact, say that the public interest weighs in favor of the defendant infringers. Uh, there's a handful of really old cases I like to look at in thinking about what kinds of factors the courts care about. Um, so there's a couple of cases, a Hybrotech v. Abbott and Vitamin Technologist v. Wharf, where the court denies an injunction but says it's doing so only because the patentee isn't marketing the technology itself. And so this is the only way the public will be able to access the invention in question. This is a little bit strange if you're a patent law person because uh, other countries have something called the patent working requirement, right, where basically the idea is if you have a patent on a particular technology, you have to practice that patent within the country. And if you don't, there's either forfeiture of the patent or a compulsory license is issued. But the U.S. hasn't had a working requirement for a very, very long time. And, and going back to something Zach said uh, much earlier in the day, when it did, I think it was only against uh, foreigners. So there are some ways in which we've structured the laws in, in certain ways, and people didn't believe that it was going to be held only against foreigners, so we got rid of it. I'm not sure if that's why. Um, but it's odd to see courts granting what is essentially a compulsory license to these patents where the patentee isn't practicing them because I thought we'd gotten rid of that. Um, and I do want to be clear about this because technically this is about injunctions, but we're, we are talking about compulsory licenses, right? When we tell a patent holder that we're going to give them a judicially determined amount of damages, but we're not going to give them an injunction, we've taken their right to exclude. That's what we're doing here. But by contrast, I do have to recognize that granting an injunction doesn't mean the case stops, right? It doesn't mean the losing party won't be able to sell, this, uh, sell its product. We often do have settlements, uh, and it's just that the parties are bargaining against a much different backdrop, against a much different bargaining position of the two parties in which the patent holder can demand a much larger share of money in exchange for the license. Uh, the other cases which I, I have to mention because they're they have really great facts are the sewage cases. Um, so one of the cases that gets cited a lot in the literature is from 1934, City of Milwaukee v. Activated Sludge. Uh, the Activated Sludge Company sues the city of Milwaukee for infringing its patent on a method of treating sewage. And they win on the infringement ground. But the Seventh Circuit says, no, you can't have an injunction because if we give you an injunction, Quote, it would close the sewage plant, leaving the entire community without any means for the disposal of raw sewage other than running it into Lake Michigan, thereby polluting its waters and endangering the health and lives of that and other communities. And we think that's bad, right? To be clear, we think that's bad. Um, uh, and other than that analysis, which actually is quite detailed, it's also quite old, um, many of these analyses are quite superficial. So when the courts are thinking through the public interest analysis, uh, they don't have a lot of uh, information, which is the one where you talk about how 
the parties didn't introduce information. Um, they don't have a lot of uh, framework to give content to their analysis. And then also the parties don't present evidence uh, on these questions a lot of the time. So the courts really don't have a sense of what's going on and what they should be doing. And I do think they're hitting on a lot of really good, important things. So I would agree that you know paying attention to whether the patentee is actually marketing their own project, a product is actually practicing the invention. As a normative matter, that seems to me like a pretty good rule of thumb in considering whether the public interest would be served by granting an injunction. Uh, but more generally, in, in my view and in the view of other scholars to have looked at this question, uh, courts can and should do a lot more analytical work in deciding this and other aspects of the injunction standard. So they should be asking questions like how many people are affected. So as we see in the sewage cases, when it's entire cities or municipalities who would be affected, that makes courts really nervous. But that's a case where they can see it. They're all in one place. There's a particular identified population. Whereas when there's some people spread out or it affects a smaller number of people but in a more concentrated way, courts have difficulty seeing that and figuring it out. And so maybe when we're considering whether there's a condition that affects a lot of people to some degree or a smaller number more severely, that should matter to courts. Uh, second, who are the people that are affected? Uh, I wouldn't be shocked in some of these cases to find that the burden of the injunction will fall most heavily on the poor and otherwise marginalized, and that worries me if it doesn't, uh, as a doctrinal matter, have to worry the courts. Third, what will be the effect on these people if we grant the injunction, which is sort of the ultimate question at the heart of the public interest analysis. And so here I'm envisioning something more than what the court in the PCSK9 uh, case says when they say that the public interest is served when there's a choice of available treatments. So the court can ask a lot more specific questions like what is going to happen to patient care, right? At least some patients may go without the drug during a transition period. How does that tell us what the shape of any sort of remedy should look like, whether or not we end up granting it? Um, if there's a generic or a branded competitor already on the market and we kick them off, what does that do to the price of the first innovator product? How should we think about that? How do we think about insurance companies who have negotiated contracts with one uh, with a provider who's now going to get kicked off the market, what does that do? Uh, and I don't think there are clear-cut answers to how the courts should um, answer the public interest prong and answer the injunction question as a whole if we know the answers to these questions. I think it's complicated and fact-intensive. And this actually gives me pause about what I'm saying, right? Because we don't... Uh, uh, Sometimes we're nervous about the capacities of courts to resolve some of these questions. And so if you give them an expensive, fact-intensive inquiry to do on top of the analyses they're already doing, we might have concerns about whether the courts should be doing this, whether their accuracy would be improved relative to the current situation in which they sort of say some platitudes and then they throw their hands up. But a lot of these questions are pretty easy to answer and the courts can understand them and they should be making a more informed decision even if it's not quite as principled as we might like. Uh, one thing I do have to say, because there is something about this idea that worries uh, me in a way, it doesn't worry everyone here, and I know you're going to yell at me during the Q&A, which is fine, um, but I do worry sometimes that we're punishing the companies who have already done the right thing. Uh, so if you have a company um, you know, like Gilead, who has made a cure for a chronic disease, um, and we say to them, and only to them, we're going to take your right to exclude because you affect so many people and they're poor and marginalized, right? They take off all of the factors that I've suggested. Um, I worry that it for encourages companies on the front end to make different choices going forward because I like to yell at the companies who aren't in the space in the first instance, but not everybody does, and it doesn't get quite as much notice. So um, it's one of the reasons I think we should be careful in figuring out this analysis because if you just run it sort of mechanically, um, it ends up that the companies we want to be doing the most work going forward get um, hit the hardest with this sort of remedy. Uh, so more generally in figuring out when courts should determine that the public interest lies in favor of one party or the other, there are these additional pieces of information that courts should have but don't uh, and that weigh in favor 
um, of enabling them to figure out what should be done. So if you've got two competing branded products, we can set out a framework for them to figure out what they should be doing. And that might be different than a case in which you've got a generic trying to come on the market um, and you've got a choice between a generic and a branded product. We might ask questions about what weight we should be giving to the behavior of the defendant as well as the plaintiff. Uh, and it's hard to say what courts should be doing um, definitively, but it's also not really possible to defend the proposition that this is sort of the right way to do it. And so shifting towards a more informed system where the courts have more information about what they're doing um, does have some procedural costs, but I think it has real informational value as well. Cool. Thank you. All right, I also don't have slides, and forgive me, but I am a journalist. Um, and uh, that means that I've approached a lot of these issues with a very different uh, mindset. One of the reasons you become a journalist is because you're interested in who covers science and law. It's because you're interested in science and law, but really kind of only the first chapter. Um, and it, you're a bit impatient with all of it. Um, and what I really do is I cover, uh, I've, what I've been doing for all this time is I cover companies. And what I've seen, uh, what I know about patents comes from looking at it from the perspective of someone who looks at these entities that develop drugs, sell them, market them, sometimes over-market them, sometimes they're wonderful, sometimes they're horrible. But, And I've found that it's very useful in covering these areas to kind of go back to first principles and ask what the heck is this patent supposed to do and is it useful? Not just does it confirm to the law or can I get some experts on the phone, but what is this company I cover who's asserting a right trying to do? Can I explain in plain English? And why does this company that thinks they don't have that right have it? That long preamble going back to cases that I can remember, one of which was Pfizer and erectile dysfunction drugs, where, um, which I didn't look up before coming here, but where companies were accused of patenting here. That if you have a patent that's too broad, you can't invent any drugs, because one company owns it. The same issues that we're seeing with the CRISPR cases now. What upset me about the, um, the stay in the Regeneron Amgen case, Regeneron Sanofi Amgen case, that that was the most recent example of this. And what surprised me was that um, it seemed like the court had gotten a lot of the impact of what they were proposing backwards to me at the time. Now, as a spoiler, that injunction that has been stayed, things are progressing exactly how, as I, as a, someone who watches the space, would kind of expect them to progress, which is the drugs are staying on the market and we're going to have a patent case unless they settle. And maybe you can read this injunction, injunction as just a way of telling the folks at Regeneron that you guys better be really sure about this or you better work out a settlement because these are the stakes and, and putting some pressure on them to, to make this whole thing go away. This is a case where we have two drugs. Um, that do essentially the same thing, but have some important clinical differences that are mainly the result of how they were studied. Um, one can be given in a lower dose than the other. Uh, that mean the decision of the court was that there was no public good in those differences. But what bothers me as someone who covers the industry is I know that if you take that first drug off the market, temporarily, you're probably not getting it back. It's an irreversible decision. Um, I've heard some counter arguments from executives in the industry that you need to be so certain of your IP and that, uh, that this makes it more likely that people are going to try to bring drugs that are exactly like yours and maybe Amgen has a point. But the thing that was upsetting about the injunction was that it was essentially making a permanent decision not to give patients a medicine they needed. Um, and to remove a situation, the whole argument Amgen made that there was irreparable harm was that there would be price negotiation between the two drugs, and because there was competition, their drug would be cheaper. 
And because you don't know how much more they could charge for it without the competitor existing, you can't judge what a monetary damage would be. I mean, by that standard, you can never have, you can never leave a competitor on the market. So um, that was upsetting as an injunction. The, the plea I make to people is that I do think, having covered this industry for a long time, I hear a lot of assertions that it's not true that you need these patents to um, develop drugs. I got in an argument on Twitter with a guy who was tipped to be the FDA commissioner at one point about this topic, and he was arguing that we've never really done the experiment of what a drug market looks like without patents. I'd submit that we have. We have a supplement industry, develops very little of value. We have a, we have drug businesses in places like India where patents were completely not enforced. We can argue that they should, that there are cases where they shouldn't be enforced or you should have walk-ins. But those markets haven't developed a lot of innovation. Uh, the cases where we've had innovation are the cases where there are barriers. And sadly, when people jack up the prices, um, more companies follow them in, in a gold rush mentality to create more drugs. So you are funding innovation by raising prices. That just, the problem is you just have to decide what it is you want to buy. Um, that's all I have to say. I'd rather move to Q&A. Uh, thanks for having me. It was... but I guess not. Oh, it's for you guys. Hello. Um, th first of all, thank you all for your presentations, and I think they complemented each other very well. Um, uh, for what it's worth, I, did, uh, I, I just want to add something to uh, eBay's perspective on, on the case, because Andrew said we won, and I said we didn't win. Um, yes, at the Supreme Court, we won the injunction, but to us as a company, us, I'm not even there, eBay as a company at the time, felt that the fact that someone did not use the patent made it that much more frustrating to actually um, have to pay them for the patent. And you talked about it briefly. I think you did. One of, one of you guys talked about that briefly. And I, I would like your thoughts perhaps on the, the, the patent rules. I mean, that was an issue that was, you know, it's a policy issue. But in medical patents, um, w what is the situation with whether you want to call them patent trolls or use different language, um, and, and in terms of perhaps your knowledge of court cases, how is that treated? Should it be treated differently? Any thoughts about that perspective of um, the calculus in determining who gets access to, to which patent and how to use it? Yeah, so uh, I will say there are some scholars who've written about the idea of bio patent trolls, uh, but it hasn't really been a widespread thing in the way that it is in many other industries, most, most notably right business methods or software patents. Uh, and you know, to that extent, the public interest analysis uh, may also look a little bit different. You know, the public interest in the buy it now is you have to do the auction or something, I suppose, whereas the, the public interest in, in this case is, you know, you don't get to find out that you have this horrible genetic condition or you don't get treated for it or whatever it is. Uh, and courts, I think, uh, appropriately recognize that there may be a difference there, but it is just one of four um, factors to consider. So there's some people who think there are biopatent trolls, but it is a relatively uncommon thing. Imagine, just to use that dumb journalist, imagine a company uh, having a patent for a drug that was available from someone else and blocking. Um, I mean, which the reason the Regeneron Amgen case was so surprising, one reason is that I've had people in the business telling me that this doesn't happen. One, Bob Nelson, who's a venture capitalist who's founded a lot of companies 
founded Illumina, which is the big DNA sequencer maker, founded the company that makes flu mist, the nose spray flu vaccine that turns out doesn't work. Um, but he, he's, he, I was talking to him about this with relation to cancer treatments, CAR T cells, and he said, Matt, no judge is going to tell you not to give the sick kid the drug. No one's going to tell you we have this amazing cancer cure and you can't give it to them. They're just going to make you pay a royalty. So, didn't wasn't true in this case, and then it was, and maybe it won't be. But uh, could the panelists react to the public interest analysis in a case where? on the CRISPR type patents where the NIH funded the research of people that hold uh, at the Broad Institute in Berkeley uh, the development of the patents. The patents themselves aren't products. There's almost no investment. They essentially just assign those to companies whose job it is to sue people or license people to use the patents. And yet they, 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 they deny the public the, uh, or even other companies the freedom to use those tools to develop products in different therapy areas. What would the what would the what should a judge look at if there was a, a case where somebody was seeking sort of a, essentially the right to infringe patents going forward in order to develop a product where they couldn't get a license from the Broad Institute because they'd uh, or Berkeley because that they'd assign it on an exclusive basis for that therapy area to a different company. So, is it, your question is how should the court? Address the public interest factor for in those cases. Um, well, I mean, I, I think you mentioned this before. I mean, it's it's CRISPR as as far as I understand it. I mean, I, I, it's you know, whoever has gotten there first is then you you're sort of preventing the other companies from moving forward with it. And so the public interest factor. I mean, I thought Rachel's suggestions were very good about how how the court should should be thinking about the, the value to the public but um you know what 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 does this, the public stand to lose from uh from that from having to go through the the patent hurdles with crispr um uh, the typical public interest standard in favor of the patent is usually because people won't make the investment this is a case where the public sector made the investment. I mean, the, the person that's holding the patent didn't make any investment. And in and, and the case of the Berkeley people, they got millions of dollars of prizes for what they did before they licensed anything. I mean, that's uh, so, uh, and they're going to make, but but there was no investment required. And it apparently it only costs about $75 or something like that to use this tool. So it's a very inexpensive thing to use the tool itself. So yeah. the argument that there's an investment issue is, doesn't seem well, to really the ring true in, this. in the treatment, isn't it? I mean, the, the exactly. But the, so the people Editas was able to raise however much money they raised. It was a lot of money uh, um, because the Broad patents were supposedly exclusive in the CRISPR therapeutics and Intellia. There's hundreds of millions of dollars now because you had these patents to develop treatments. But they're not. But that money is not. That money is to monetize the value of the patents. It's not to develop products. And so, I mean. Uh, I, I'm not saying that the people that develop the products uh, that, 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 that use the CRISPR technology into a therapy shouldn't be able to get rights that are exclusive and charge prices for them. But I'm saying is that, is that what is the public interest in, in, in allowing Berkeley and Broad to say, this person here can use those patents to develop in this therapy, but this other person can't because we don't want them to have to compete against each other. I mean, it's in, it's in Berkeley and MIT's interest to charge really high, you know, to sort of squeeze squeeze people as much as possible, but it just sort of slows down the development of new products. I, I, I don't, I don't I, as, you see, I'm talking about the CRISPR patents themselves, at, at, at the ability to use those patents as opposed to the products that use that technology that go further, because there, there'd be other patents that would come for the, the people that but would the use the technology. But the reason that they were able to raise money to... Who's they? The reason that venture capitalists behind those the three companies doing gene therapy work with CRISPR, which is what those licenses are for, were able to raise money to do that was because they had what looked like IP that would exclude um, other people from coming in. That They'd have freedom to operate and there wouldn't be other companies. So they could go to their venture capitalists and say, look, 
there are these indications, it's going to be hard to develop a treatment, but we think there's only, there's going to be us, there's going to be these other guys. Somebody is going to have to pay somebody else a royalty, but we need this money. So arguably without that, they might not have been able to raise that money to do that work. I can see your argument that that's not true, so I'm not quite engaging with it, but that's the, that's the money that it's, they were able to raise money to do drug development because they were going to be only I mean, Editas, when they initially raised all that money, which was the biggest raise, was sent, was kind of claiming they were going to be the only game in town, and at the time had Berkeley in too. And it was when that split happened that you got other companies. But there's a there's a financial value that can be used to fund innovation. Now you're getting to the argument of is it is it better to have more competition, and are you are you closing the funnel too early? <coughs> Jamie, I'm an answer your question and then I'm gonna fight the hypo um, so to my knowledge no court has ever and I this is easily googleable so someone should be able to falsify me like immediately um, uh, you can figure out pretty easily if the court has used the phrase by dole close to the phrase public interest in uh, one of these analyses and I haven't seen it but if anyone is on Westlaw and would figure that out that would be cool um, but my guess of what they would do is they would just look to the purpose of the Bayh-Dole Act, where at the start it sort of says, you know, it's the, the policy of Congress to use the patent system to promote the utilization of inventions arising from federally supported research. And they would just say something like, and because of that, we're not going to second guess what they've done in enabling these institutions to have patents. Now, I understand what you're saying and where you're coming from. I suspect the problem, and this is my fighting the hypo response, is that um, you can point to the city of Milwaukee and say they're going to be actively harmed if we don't, uh, in, if we don't allow you to use the sewage patent, but you can't point to anyone in particular just yet and say this is the person or group that will be harmed if we don't um, uh, enjoin this conduct, and that's a problem. It's just a practical problem that we have all the time in this area where the beneficiaries are invisible and that um, causes us to have difficulty in actually doing this. Yeah, I just want to clarify that. I was, I was, I mean, you could go through the the NI, the NIH or something and try and get a Barchin type remedy. I was talking about suppose that that they were not inclined to do anything at the NIH, which is I think historically what the case has been. The question is, could a judge then yeah. take it upon himself? Uh, I, I mean, if if on all these other cases they can kind of do the thing, it would seem to be it would seem to weigh move the public interest factor in a certain way if, if you were not looking at the patent owner having uh, paid for any anything in terms of their own investment in the thing and, and ha had made no investment in the development of a product. And as simply as people, as you mentioned, the eBay case is essentially in the, in the process of trying to prevent other people from doing stuff as opposed to doing the stuff themselves in terms of research. I, I haven't... Hello. I haven't seen, just to iterate what Rachel said, I haven't seen any cases where the, the court looked at something that way, but there's nothing that I can think of that would stop anybody from making that argument and having that be a valid argument for the public interest. I, I, I kind of mentioned this very briefly before in some of the other cases, but it really, a lot of these cases turn on whether, you know, on what's been argued and what's been put into the record. So if, if, for example, that argument were made and you backed it up with evidence and the court would look at that and say, hey, that's, you know, that, that's a good argument and it could, it could turn the case, so. So I haven't seen the uh, UCB um, CRISPR licenses, although all the companies are public, so I assume they're filed and I can do, uh, and I probably will. But as a general proposition, UC Berkeley and their licenses have very sophisticated mandatory sub-licensing provisions to specifically address the issue you raise, that is that all applications of a technology will be exploited. Um, and, you know, Carol Mamura is a smart woman, and I, you know, she will fully appreciate the breadth of the CRISPR patents, and I can't imagine that those provisions aren't included in the licenses that UC Berkeley granted. Well, and the broad license to Editas covers exclusive, it is, it's only exclusive for stuff they develop. So if they don't do it, somebody else can do it. 
uh, Fred Abbott again. Uh, I wanted to respond a little bit to your observation, Matthew. From It's a technical patent law issue. Your friend observing, which I think is an interesting point, that a court would not make a decision in which a young child with you know, macular degeneration isn't being treated because the court's going to enforce the patent and they would provide a royalty. And you said it can come both ways. The difficulty, I think, and this is just putting a technical issue on the table, is that patent uh, cases usually or must arise uh, when the defendant who is suffering a legitimate fear of prosecution or infringement of the patent is challenging the validity of the patent being infringed by the patent owner. But there must be a case in controversy involving, depending on how you go, and this came up in the Myriad case, right? There was a lot of trouble bringing a case against Myriad Genetics because the alternative providers of the service couldn't demonstrate a legitimate fear of being sued by the patent owner and so forth. Without going into all of the details, the problem is you usually don't have the party who is seeking not to have the injunction provided being an individual litigant such as the individual patient who will suffer if the patent injunction is granted. So it might be an interesting sideline of this to how do you actually get the public interest uh, party against whom the patent is going to be enforced as party to the litigation versus only, for example, a prospective generic producer and the, the patent owner. But that's one reason why this doesn't come up so often when you're actually looking at the public interest side of these potential injunctions. Understood, but I mean, the argument was, and this is a venture capitalist who thinks in very broad strokes, and his argument was simply, these don't happen. The experience of following companies is that these kinds of injunctions um, are rare. In fact, they do happen. Uh, it happened in the uh, Genentech versus, uh, what was the name of the company that was making the uh, other drug for uh, short stature? There were two drugs for... This is 10 years ago? More than that, yeah. but yeah, and it was ten years ago, and, and it was uh, it was it's not it was growth hormone. It was I think it was IGF one, but they um, but the you know there certainly have been cases where there were sick kids, and one of the drugs was told get off the market. So it it doesn't always hold true, but it's a bet it's a thing that you hear from people in industry as a as a, an article of faith as they're putting all their money behind something. Uh, so I would, I think Robert has, has left, but I would be interested in hearing from someone from Public Citizen, because I know they've brought some of these sort of public interest patent challenges or would like to bring some of these public interest patent challenges, but there are standing problems, as you say. Um, but I think there's nothing stopping them from filing amicus briefs or trying to get evidence you know, to the relevant parties who are going to say this is how many people are going to be disadvantaged or harmed uh, in the relevant case. Uh, there's also interesting questions, I think, about induced infringement liability in this context. I don't want to get too far into it because this is maybe not the, the room for that. Um, but if you take some of the 271B case law seriously and you say this is really about physicians doing something that's then being attributed to a company, they may have the incentive to get involved and, and say something. Well, thank you all. Our time is, um, we've actually gone over. Um, I hope that this has given you a bit more insight into what compulsory licensing issues are. And I think there's a lot of food for thought for the future in terms of how this is going to unfold in future cases, um, weighing the public interest, how to get public interest issues and ideas out there, and how to incentivize the, the drugs that we need to be out, that need to be made. So there's so many issues that I wish we had more time to explore and get more of your thoughts on, you know, what's broken and what isn't and what could be fixed. But um, our time is up. And uh, with that, thanks again to all of our speakers.
Is this, is this on? It's on now. Hi. Hi, folks. We're getting ready to start the next panel. And you wouldn't want to miss anything in the next panel because it's going to be a doozy. So, hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my name's Alicia Mundy, and um, I'm the investigator for Senator Bernie Sanders looking at the high price of drugs and health care. And I'm with the Budget Committee, uh, Senate Budget Committee. I used to be with the Wall Street Journal and um, wrote on drug pricing and march in rights and a few other things. Um, and I'm, I'm fascinated by these issues. Um, right now, my boss is dealing with a company you may have heard of called Marathon Pharmaceuticals. And um, they have taken a drug that they've done no original research on and uh, have gotten it approved for orphan drug designation, and they're going to start charging $89,000 for it. And you can pay $1,000 and bring it in from Canada, where it's been on the market for a zillion years and been used off-license for Duchenne muscular dystrophy for 20-some years and quite effectively. So we care about these issues. This is a really cool panel. Um, the first speaker is going to be Hannah Vogel, and she's the legislative assistant to Lloyd Doggett, who's from Texas. He's from a um, a small liberal liberal district in Texas near near Austin, and uh, thanks to a lot of work that Hannah's put in, um, Representative Doggett is very concerned about the high price of drugs. He was concerned enough that he did not support the 21st Century Cures Act because when he looked at it, he began to see, as others have, the uh, you know the the possibility of endless monopolies, sort of you know in perpetuity uh, licenses. So uh, we have Hannah here today to talk about what her boss is doing and and what what is going on in the Hill or can never go on in the Hill. Um, our next speaker is going to be Alan Black, and Alan is well known as the person who brought the Faberzine case. Um, which, as I recall reading, was considered the best case that could make, uh, make a demand for marching rights or royalty-free rights. And it's like, if you, if you can't get the NIH to go along with this case, then you might as well give it up. So we have, we have Mr. Black here. We have Aaron Kesselheim, um, who is uh, both a, a scholar on law and um, on medicine. And he's worked a lot on the issues of the public interest and monopolies and the public interest and licensing and exclusivity rights. And is there any way to, to you know, balance companies, uh, companies' needs to be able to make a reasonable profit and, and guarantee that they have exclusivity to some point and still balance that with the needs of people to have accessible drugs, the issue being that it's, it's a safety issue if you can't get your drugs to begin with, so that starts there. And then the, uh, we have also, uh, we have Jamie Love here, and then we have um, Ashley, do we have Ashley Steven? There, okay, um, who was the former president of the Association of University Technology Managers and uh, is now the president of the Focus IP Group. And that's a pretty interesting organization. I think the current president um, was here earlier, may still be here. Um, and they are you know, very much in favor of the public interest, but also very much in favor of looking at things through um, you know, the lens of here's the law, here's the patents, here's what, here's what entities are guaranteed in return for their interest and investment in the work. So this will be very interesting. So, uh, I'd like to start out with Hannah and just ask what's what's happening in Congress is there is there any hope and uh, um, what would you what would you like to see in terms of uh, licensing and changes in licensing with companies thank you Alicia and um, I'm really excited to be here I uh, hope to not kind of go above my pay grade and, and <laughs> I know there's a lot of really smart people in this room who've studied this for a lot longer than I have um, and my pay grade is publicly available so you all know what that is. Um, but I, I'm here hopefully just to give a little bit of political uh, perspective and 
Um, I just am going to be keep it brief, but uh, talk a little bit about what my boss has has done in the past. Um, like Alicia said, he's been uh, very interested in this issue in terms of protecting taxpayer investments in uh, research and development. So um, last year, uh, about a year ago in January of 2016, um, we led a letter with over 50 members of Congress um, that just asked for official guidelines on uh, clearer, more clarity uh, in the guidelines on when margin rights can be used. Um, so a, a more detailed definition of what that sort of reasonable access availability on reasonable terms might mean in a practical standpoint and whether it ever uh, could be used to um, uh, whether it can be used to look at the price as a component of availability of on reasonable terms. Um, and so it was just a kind of simple uh, request for guidelines, um, understanding that, you know, this might provide clarity for the industry um, instead of dealing with it on a non-transparent case-by-case basis, um, which, you know, has been working out okay for them so far since some of them have gone through, but um, to provide a little bit more direction on what that provision might actually look like in practical use. Um, in March of 2016, we got a response from HHS. Um, which, you know, basically relisted the criteria that was already available and um, said, no, we, we don't think you need, you need anything more. We're going to continue doing this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and so it, they basically insisted that the, you know, past uh, guidelines and the past cases were enough, were sufficient to get an inference of, you know, when you might be able to use Marchin, which is so far never. Um, in March of 2016, we followed up uh, again with this time a bicameral ask. So it was, uh, I believe, six members um, of uh, the House and, and six senators, um, including uh, Alicia's boss, uh, Mr. Sanders, led on, on the Senate side. Um, and this ask was to hold an open and transparent hearing. You know, we heard their, their call for dealing with this on a case-by-case -case basis loud and clear. Um, so we said, okay, if you're looking at this on case-by-case -case basis, how about holding an open uh, public transparent hearing on Extandi, uh, the Extandi petition, which was filed by KEI. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're really just looking for insight into their decision-making process since these um, the ability on marching rights exists. We just want to know what are the conditions under which it can be used. Um, and then a, a couple of months later, um, we got word that this was denied. They felt like their processes were, were sufficient to develop it um, internally. Um, and we heard also from um, Mr. Collins that their you know, concern over having a freezing effect on the relationship between NIH and publicly funded institutions and um, and manufacturers. Um, so it's been, um, you know, obviously a frustrating process, but um, I think something that we're still looking for further clarification on. We do have a letter drafted with a very significant amount of co-signers to the new administration, essentially repeating the request. Um, this letter has not gone out yet. We've got a, a couple other things on our plate with the new administration right now. Um, so this has kind of been uh, bumped to a later date, but uh, it's certainly something we're, we're still interested in and, you know, we're always looking um, from a political and a messaging standpoint for ways to explain this in the ways that, that my boss sees it, which is that this is really taxpayer protection rights. These are rights that protect the investments that taxpayers have made so that you're not seeing them getting hit uh, multiple times um, in terms of, you know, their taxes are going towards it and then they're also paying for it in significant, um, they're paying much more in, in many cases than in other countries. Um, and so, you know, making sure that we're being responsible with the investments that we're making in public funded research. Um, so I'm going to stop rambling off there and, um, you know, once again say thanks to all of you for coming in and I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the other presentations and some of the discussions that will be going on later. Hi, everybody. My name is Alan Black. Uh, and I first just have to thank Jamie and Manon and Andy and Zach and Claire for putting this together. I've worked with Jamie since, gosh, back in 2009 when we filed the first petition. And as a, a practitioner, I have patients that are quite literally alive because of the advocacy work they've done. So independent of the policy aspects, um, the work that uh, KEI is doing and 
uh, other groups are doing are, are really actually saving lives. And I can, I'll actually list some of those for you. Uh, I'm not that important, but how I got involved in these litigations, I guess, is. I started out as an assistant professor. Uh, I worked in immunology and vaccinology. I worked in STDs, worked in developing an AIDS vaccine. And in my 30s, I thought I'd go back and go to, go to patent law. I really thought I was going to be a biotech patent lawyer, sit in my cubicle, and interestingly create monopolies, sort of be the anti-American, you know, we're going to make a lot of monopolies. Uh, but that changed in 2009. Uh, a close friend of mine has a rare disease. Uh, it's called Fabre disease. If any of you have seen Lorenzo's oil, it's the same sort of disease. Lipids build up in the cells and ultimately clog the kidneys, the brain, the heart. Uh, males who have this genetic disease die by the time they're 50. So it's a death sentence. Uh, taxpayer funding created the treatment for Fabre disease to for Bray patients to live relatively normal lives. They can live into their 60s, their 70s, and their 80s. Uh, it was done at Mount Sinai. Uh, price, interestingly, wasn't an issue. Because it was such a rare disease, the uh, insurance companies almost always paid for it. And when there wasn't payment, uh, sort of stopgap measures came into place by uh, uh, charity, charitable organizations. But then Genzyme contaminated the supply with a rodent virus, which decreased output. Now, there's an argument that the rodent virus isn't dangerous. I disagree with it, but that's secondary. The point is, they couldn't make enough uh, Fabrizyme for the 1,500 patients that were in the U.S., much less the 7,000, maybe six to 7,000 in the, in the world. Uh, the FDA had a consent decree against them for $175 million. There were glass, rubber, and steel particles, which caused, caused clotting in some of my patients' uh, lungs. and uh, It was an absolute nightmare. So Genzyme sua sponte came up with what, was, what they call a rationing plan. Uh, those in medicine will understand that this is actually triage, uh, rationing for access to something that is required to survival is not rationing in the sense of like, well, we'll split what's left of the food. Uh, the U.S. patients were initially banned from access to the drug while they built up stocks. In theory, so were the European patients. The shortage continued for almost three years. And of course, the FDA approval is based on receiving one milligram per kilogram every two weeks. But no patient was allowed to receive these FDA approved doses. So the uh, triage decision was to give small doses instead of full doses. And again, people in medicine, this may seem sensible unless you're going under the knife and somebody said, well, we only have a third the anesthesia uh, for you. So, so my friend came to me and uh, we were, literally went to the, the uh, Pittsburgh football games together and he said, I'm dying. This they diagnosed me three years ago. I can feel the pain coming back. My heart's failing. My kidneys are failing. They've run out. Is there anything you can do? At this point, I'm a patent attorney. I teach as an adjunct professor, and I have never been in a courtroom in my life except as a spectator. And I sort of thought about it, and he's a friend. I said, yeah, you know, this was developed with federal money. You have a right of access under the Bayh-Dole Act. We can ask for March in. And then I literally thought of Jamie because I taught his case in Ray Norvier. And uh, he, he graciously agreed to handhold me through this process. You and me both. <laughs> Not yet. One day, maybe. <laughs> so, and, and please keep me on time. I don't want. I really don't want to run over. The the, the facts are just bizarre. Uh, we petitioned the NIH. Uh, to let others license the patent. Well, of course, this makes absolute sense because they're not making it. So this isn't even an issue of they would lose sales. They, there would be a royalty that would go back to whoever was selling it. So technically, for the shareholders, they'd make, they'd make more money under a compulsory license than they would without one. Uh, of course, you can't uh, ban non-use and misuse of a patent. 
Um, NIH first came back and argued that it would take too long to get another company up and running and that the regulatory environment for the FDA would take years and years. So in other words, your petition is pointless. Your clients are going to have to die. Um, Genzyme was told by, at the time, Genzyme, now it's been bought by Sanofi, uh, that there would be a full supply by 2011, which, of course, was ridiculously optimistic. Um, as I mentioned, triage, uh, the science of dosage is called posology, and only doctors can decide how much you get of a drug. That's not a corporate uh, right. It, uh, it turned out in the Europe, the low dose had been banned. Not only had the low dose been shown to be effective, but uh, if you give small doses, it tended to accelerate the disease. Nobody explained why, but Europe said, oh, it doesn't matter why, we're going to ban it. So Genzyme returned Europeans to the full dose, even though it was funded by Americans, and cut the dose even further for Americans under the Bayh-Dole Act. At this point, I repetitioned the NIH and said, we've got to get full doses. Europe is getting full doses. Why aren't Americans getting full doses? Uh, at this point, NIH realized they were in a political bind, is what I think, and they waited three years until the shortage was over to issue a response which said, this, is, this petition is now moot. So they mooted it by sitting on it. Uh, I knew that was going to be coming with the FDA. There's another type of petition you can file called a citizen's petition. I filed under more of a civil rights type of uh, approach, which is there's a right to this drug under Bayh-Dole, not just a license, but a right to get it. Uh, the FDA again sat on it, but I did manage to uh, file a case in D.C. arguing that this was a violation of the Administrative Procedures Act. You can't sit on something to wait till it's moot. Uh, ultimately, pleading didn't go anywhere. Uh, and just as a final note, why did Genzyme ration the U.S. but not Europe? Turns out there was competition in Europe for this drug. There was an entirely different patent. The only thing that protected the monopoly for Fabrizyme in the United States was the Mount Sinai patent. And because Mount Sinai had been the first to put their patent in under a different statutory scheme, the Orphan Drug Act precluded another person from entering the uh, market. So it turned out that Shire made their version Replegal in Europe. It competed with Fabrizyme in Europe and there was no alternative in the U.S. market. So, of course, to keep people on the drug in Europe, they started shipping full doses overseas. So, as you can see, this is just one of the most odious uh, perversions of the Bayh-Dole statutory scheme. Uh, so, it's over. Um, my patients are getting Fabrizyme. Two died during the shortage. Uh, another client I have with a similar drug in a similar situation for Cirozyme, uh, died shortly after the shortage. Uh, all the patients are really sick. And uh, so we've continued. We still have a tort case, a pharmaceutical liability case against Sanofi uh, over these, uh, the way these patients were treated. But the bottom line was, and it was for me, for my friend, for my point of view, the MDs, the FDA, public health service, NIH, trained public health authorities, even patients' doctors were completely useless in trying to get drug access. It was as if my client was living in the middle of a third world country. And uh, of course, the pharma and MBAs were coming up with their own way to sell the drug. So there's clearly something wrong. I've used a lot of legal techniques to try and get drugs to patients, but nothing's been successful yet. So what I'm hoping from you guys is give me the ammunition to take to save people's lives when they need access to a drug. And thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I have some slides as well. Is it? Do I, there it is. All right, so um, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and to be part of this panel. Um, and uh, thanks for organizing this day. So my name is Aaron Kesselheim. I'm a, a physician and a lawyer and associate professor of medicine at, at Brigham Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. 
Um, and I run a research group called the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law. Um, we F five. There it is. All right, great. All right, so um, so I, I want to talk today about March and Rights um, and, and talk a little bit about their application to uh, to solving the issue of, of high drug costs. Um, so I run the research uh, this program on regulation, therapeutics, and law. We don't have any affiliations um, with any um, pharmaceutical company, medical device company. We're funded mostly by uh, private foundations um, and and the government. Um, and, and do a lot of work. We're sort of one of the largest and, and most prolific research centers uh, focusing on the areas uh, of the uh, law um, and, and the pharmaceutical market. So um, I'm going to sort of step back a little bit and present some basic uh, information first on the Bayh-Dole Act and margin rights, just to try to orient people in the room who may not, um, who may not know a little bit about the sort of background. Uh, and then talk about some research that we did in this on the subject of the application of March and rights to um, high cost drugs. So the the goal of the Buy Dole Act was to encourage investment in R and D and to bring the fruits of the of, of R and D um, that the government was funding to market. And it was originally um, intended to allow U S small businesses and nonprofits to retain control of the patent rights in inventions that arose from uh, government funded agreement, and then was extended to uh, a few years after its approval to, uh, by executive order to large corporations. Um, the, the, the goal of the, so Bayh-Dole allows, um, allowed uh, government uh, funded research uh, institutions um, to offer exclusive licenses to private firms in order to commercialize the, 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 the research. It also provided these margin rights um, that accompanied these exclusive licenses, and that's the sort of point we'll talk about today. But it also gave a, a, a it gave uh, back to the government a non-exclusive, non-transferable license to practice the invention on, on its own behalf. And I want to come back to that uh, provision of the Bayh-Dole Act at the end. Um, this is the section of margin rights. It's a right in accordance with such procedures. Uh, to grant a non-exclusive license um, upon terms that are reasonable under the circumstances, um, and if the federal agency determines um, that one of four conditions are met. So margin rights are allowed to be instituted if, um, uh, under the statute um, if one of, if the, the, sort of the, the federal agency determines um, that there are one of four different conditions are met, and these are the four conditions. That the licensee has not taken effective steps to achieve practical application of the invention, that health and safety needs exist that aren't reasonably satisfied, um, that a government-funded invention is required for a public use specified in federal regulations, um, or that a sublicensee violated its agreement to substantially manufacture the product in the U.S., and then subsequent in the statute, practical application in the first, sec in the first section is defined as the invention being used and made available to the public on reasonable terms. Um, so in the course of our research, we looked at the four different uh, at the, at the, the different instances, there are basically five different instances re related to four different uh, products over the last 30 years in which March and Rights had been instituted. And we talked, looked in depth at these cases and talked with a lot of the people involved in it, some of whom are in the room today. Um, and uh, these are the different cases in which have been invoked here. And we already heard about the Algalcides case. Um, and we'll hear, I'm sure, from Jamie more about the Ritonavir case. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and Hannah mentioned the, the enzalutamide, um, the work that, that they had done around enzalutamide. Um, but basically, most of them fall into Clause 1 and Clause 2 rationales that, again, there has not been a practical application, which means making the product available on reasonable terms. Um, notably, Clause 4 has never been invoked, um, and that's mostly because the, uh, the NIH gives out um, waivers to allow companies to manufacture the product overseas like candy. Um, and, and maybe that's another a topic for another day. Um, but, but in the course of our research, you know, we came up with some, a couple major conclusions, um, and I, I just want to go over them uh, in brief um, and so as not to take up too much time. But our first conclusion um, was that the legislative history of the Bayh-Dole Act and the plain language of the statute established that reasonable terms should, in fact, take price into account, um, particularly if it's blatantly unreasonable and if it's a key factor in limiting access to the project. Now, maybe this wasn't explicitly mentioned in the statute because the statute was originally limited to small businesses and nonprofits. Um, but if you're interested in this topic, I, I suggest you look at Arno and Davis's um, excellent law review piece on this issue in which they go through the legislative history 
um, and the plain language of the statute in substantial detail. Um, these are some of the quotes um, from their piece. Um, you know, the Senate committee overseeing the Bayh Dole Act wrote in its report, agencies will have the power to exercise marching rights to assure that no adverse effects occur from the retention of patent rights. Although there's no evidence of windfall profits, the existence of the payback provision reassures the public. Another, you know, in, on, also as part of the hearings leading up to the bill, um, another, uh, another, um, there was more testimony that marching rights were developed to address the issues of windfall, suppression of detrimental effects. An industry spokesman stated that if a contractor fails to supply the market adequately at a fair price, then there's reason for requiring it to license both the background patents and the patents stemming from it um, um, to the contract work. So again, I think there is substantial evidence in the legislative history, even though there have been quotes from um, both By and Dole in the subsequent years afterwards um, that they did not intend this. I do think that if you go back to the original data that there, that there was um, evidence that they did intend um, the, the margin rights to cover um, excessive pricing. Um, that being said, I think it's also important to recognize that there aren't too, it isn't relevant in, in that many circumstances in which the government has played an important role in drug discovery. So um, there is substantial research, some of which we've published, some of which um, Ashley Stevens has published, um, suggesting that, that um, a, a major, there is a, a that, that transformative drugs in, in, that have been developed in the U.S. in general tend to come from um, government-funded research and publicly-funded uh, um, science in academic centers and in government laboratories. Um, and so there is a substantial government funding and a substantial government interest in a lot of really important drugs, a lot of which are then become very expensive. Um, but in order for the Bayh-Dole marching rights to work, you require a government interest in all the listed patents. And in many of these cases, the essential government invention either wasn't patented or the company has developed subsequent patents afterwards that, uh, that, that where the, there isn't a, a direct government involvement. In those cases, the marching rights really wouldn't work in terms of uh, uh, improving uh, cost and access to the product. Um, it also requires another manufacturer that's interested and able to make the product, and this is some of the arguments that were used in the Egalcides case, um, you know, and again, whether or not they were legitimate, but it does require another company to go through the steps of getting the drug FDA approved in the case of a, of a, a sort of very complicated biologic product like in the, in the Fabray cases, um, that might be difficult. Um, so conclusion number three is so some people argue that margin rights, the existence of margin rights, they may actually be working um, and that the sort of shadow effect of the margin rights existing um, exerts uh, some impact on the people who may be interested in, in commercializing um, research that is developed in academic centers. Um, and in fact, there is no evidence that in the last 30 years or so that we've seen products left on the shelf that margin rights are needed to come in and act on because uh, the company hasn't, uh, hasn't ever tried to commercialize them. Um, and in fact, the um, uh, uh, margin rights cases, especially in the Abbott case and in the Cellpro case, ended up leading the manufacturer or, or the, the government to engage in some minor concessions to try to improve access to the product, or in the case of Abbott, to try to slightly improve the cost that they were offering of their Ritonavir product. And some people argue that margin rights, you know, that the products are getting out there. Even if they are costly, the goal of the Buy Dole Act is to get the products out there, and those products are getting out there. So I do think it's important to kind of point to this kind of strain of argument as well. Um, and then in general, what we found is that there's little prospect that margin rights would be invoked in this regulatory and political climate to regulate the pricing of a healthcare product. Um, some of the examples that have come up, it's difficult to envision a more compelling scenario um, that margin rights would be invoked. Um, of these extremely expensive products that were developed based on, on, industry, on, on, uh, on government funded research outside of a price that's just so exorbitant um, that a majority of patients and payers simply could not afford it, which is still, thankfully, a hypothetical scenario. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of, uh, of also agreement that the NIH is ill-equipped to invoke a march in petition and is very wary of potential negative ramifications that the enactment of march in rights would have on virtue commercialization. And usually a lot of people at this point bring up the anecdote of the 1989 attempt of, the, of NIH to in invoke um, a reasonable pricing clause in its combined research and development agreements that it, that, it, that it developed as a result of some of the controversy around the high price of the AIDS drugs that emerged from the NIH in the 1980s. Um, and, and I think that this example is of questionable current relevance because these days manufacturers have generally reduced their investment in internal drug discovery and are becoming increasingly dependent on licensing ideas emerging from public funding. So federal subsidized um, technology is now a high cost and cost effective resource 
that forms a basis for therapeutic development. Um, and and in, I think in the modern era, a judicious exercise of marching rights is unlikely to chill private sector interests. Okay, so um, in a, my last couple slides, I want to just, just mention the fact that Section 202, which is this reverse um, grant of, of rights to the government, may actually be a slightly better alternative. Um, this, so this requires that research grantees that obtain patents claiming federally unfunded inventions to confer a non-exclusive royalty-free license back to the U.S. government, which permits the government to practice the invention or to have it practiced on the government's behalf. And in the words of Senator Bai, this license allows the government to use for itself and the public good inventions arising out of research that the federal government helps to support. So generic manufacturers could sell a product based on a certification that the patents will not be infringed because the approval of it is being is solely being used for the purpose of producing the sale to the government to a government body for use for the um, any government purpose by the DOD or the VA or, or through Medicare or Medicaid. So the advantages of using Section 202 is that you don't really need the NIH to act in, in terms of taking the steps to, to do margin rights. The government already has the licenses. Um, and it doesn't interfere with the private marketplace, and it can, act, can, can be used as early as four years after approval of small molecule drugs, although, again, only applying to public programs. Um, and again, it still does require government interest in all the relevant intellectual property. And we've talked about some of these other alternatives today, the option of using Section 1498, um, better university stewardship of patents, um, formal NIH payback, um, for products that become blockbuster products based on, on, on government-funded works. Senator Wyden has, and Francis Collins has come out in support uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a very small payback for, for some of these products. And then, of course, direct legislative options to address drug pricing that may occur at the state or federal level. So thank you very much. Traffic, traffic jam. I was uh, going to end with Jamie, but I was going to ask if Professor Stevens could come up. So uh, thank you, Jamie. I want to thank you for inviting Autumn to uh, present here. I think it's probably the first time we've presented at your functions. I doubt we're going to change your mind, but uh, it's nice to have our uh, uh, point of view heard. I'm going to make three points today. Uh, first of all, the purpose for including Marchins in Baidol was not included as a price control mechanism. Secondly, that margins would do serious damage to the US's innovation system. And finally, when you look at the economics of drug development, margin is not economically justified. Autumn itself has no position on whether the government should intervene to moderate or reduce or somehow limit drug prices. That is simply not our area of expertise. But Autumn does firmly believe that using margin provisions of Baidol to single out drugs discovered at public sector research institutes and allow them to undergo premature genericization by issuing compulsory licenses would be a very short-sighted piece of public policy. Autumn is actually a, a big believer in voluntary licensing, which stems from the work of Amy back in 2001 at Yale, and we would argue has resulted in many more drugs being available to many more people and at lower prices, first for HIV and more recently for hepatitis C in the developing world than all the compulsory licenses ever issued. So first of all, my first point, Bayh-Dole didn't intend Marchin to be used as a price control mechanism. So the purpose of the Marchin provision was to ensure that dominant companies couldn't license uh, promising in university inventions to suppress them so that they couldn't be used to compete with their existing products. I think the best statement of this and documentation of this was the remarks and the testimony of Senator Bai himself at the March 25, 2004 NIH hearing on Jamie's Norvia petition. Um, it's also been confirmed by Senator Dole, by Joe Allen, who was by staffer, and Norm Lacker, who had been the patent counsel of DHEW, who drafted the implementing regulations of Bayh-Dole. And it seems that NIH has accepted this view. And indeed, universities in the years since Bayh-Dole have, have developed sophisticated licensing capabilities and include due diligence provisions in their licenses to ensure development. 
And then if the licensee doesn't meet their commitments to develop the technology, uh, the license could be terminated and the associated know-how that the licensee has developed, very important, is recaptured by the university for relicensing. A classic example is Emory and Emtrizitabine. It was licensed to Glaxo. Glaxo took it into phase two and terminated the license. Emory recaptured the intellectual property rights and the know-how, relicensed it to Triangle Therapeutics. They were acquired by Gilead and uh, Emtrizitabine uh, re received FDA approval. My second point is that Marchin would do serious damage to the U.S.'s innovation ecosystem. BIDOL was enacted, as somebody earlier today alluded to, as an economic development initiative to, to combat the decline in U.S. manufacturing competitiveness in the 1970s. Sounds familiar somehow. Uh, again, Senator Bayh's testimony at, uh, in 2004, I think, documents that. And numerous studies since have demonstrated that it has exceeded beyond all expectations over the 36 years since. There is the bioindustry organization University of Georgia study, which showed that 282 billion to 1.18 trillion of gross industry output over 18 years. Studies that Autumn has done looking at licensing data that show about $100 billion of annual product sales, which, for, as an example, is greater than total annual net farm income in the U.S. the last several years. And a study I did that showed that $103 billion of global sales of drugs discovered in whole or in part of public sector research institutes in 2008. So, Bidol is a good thing, it's an effective thing, and we should approach changes very carefully. As a result of this, academic inventions are a critical source of innovation for companies. Um, the data from my 2011 New England Journal study was that 9% of all NDAs in a 17-year period and 22% of the most innovative drugs, i.e. new molecular entities afforded priority review, uh, tracked back to public sector institutes. Critical pieces of the internet were invented in academic institutions. The World Wide Web itself at CERN, the web browser by the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, email programs that can attach documents, also at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, distributed servers, Akamai by MIT, Google by Stanford, and so on. But it's a fragile ecosystem. Academic innovations are usually totally untested. There's little or no market validation. There's little or no technical validation. They're ahead of the market. The median licensing time to li uh, uh, is four years from when the invention disclosure is received. That's how long it takes the uh, industrial sector to catch up. Only 30% of invention disclosures, which is about 50% of new patent applications, ever get licensed. Lisa Nelson, who ran technology transfer at MIT uh, for, M for many years, once said, a hot academic technology is one that two companies are interested in. Only 3.5% of invention disclosures result in a marketed product. Most technology licensing offices lose money. Only about half of active licenses, 20,000 out of 45,000 roughly, generated any income in 2015. Only a quarter of them, about 10,500 out of that 45,000, generated running royalties on product sales. And only a half a percent, 227 licenses generated over a million dollars in 2015. Over half of technology licensing offices lose money gross. They spend more money than they bring in. Half of our expenditures are for patent expenses, which is how we turn scientific results into intellectual property that can be licensed, and half is for people costs. Only 16% of TLOs in 2008 were profitable, uh, net profitable. That, that is, they kept enough of their income after covering their costs and uh, uh, to cover their cost after sharing with inventors and making grants for research. Now, exclusivity is crucial to incentivizing companies to invest large amounts uh, to develop embryonic academic inventions. Before Baidol, the U.S. government owned federally funded academic inventions. They were licensed by the NTIS, who would only grant uh, non-exclusive licenses. And they had a 4% licensing success rate. They licensed 4% of the patents they got, compared with the 50% that we do now. And there were two assertions of federal rights in the mid-1960s that led to research being described as contaminated or tainted 
if it had received federal funding. There was five flora uracil at the University of Wisconsin, a $500,000 plus investment by Roche, which was big money in 1956, less than $25 of intermediate chemicals uh, charged to a grant. The government demanded assignment of the University of Wisconsin's interest in the patent and later granted a royalty free license to Allegan. And then there was Gatorade from the University of Florida. The government forced the University of Florida to abandon the patents, and in fact, commercialization was based on the trademark and the trade secret. As a consequence, no drug for which the government owned the patents was ever developed and received FDA approval. There was a Chinese war between academic research and industrial research. And these were the barriers that Baidol was intended to break down. Now, as Aaron said, one of the big components of Baidol was to allow exclusive licenses for five years. And this five-year restriction was removed four years later in the 1984 amendment to the stevenson Wider Act. In 1996, the first year which we have data, 52% of licenses were exclusive. In 2015, it was down to 34%. But for that third of technologies that are exclusively licensed, the exclusivity is critical and the license wouldn't happen without it. And since Baidol, exclusivity once granted in an academic license has never been removed by a third party. So I was expecting to have to justify you today that these stories from 50 years ago were still relevant. But all the wonderful history has, that has been uh, displayed here today on old laws and old cases, I don't think I have to. Um, yes, the technology and the economics are vastly different from what they were 50 years ago. But the fundamental business principles of the need to be assured of a return for making very high-risk investments to develop embryonic, uh, untested academic inventions remains as true today as 50 years ago, and exclusivity allows that return to be made. And as someone once observed, those who ignore history are destined to repeat it. Now, academic inventions compete with internal company inventions for development resources. Only 12% of drug candidates that start clinical development receive FDA approval. And companies are very sensitive to constraints on their commercial decision-making freedom. Uh, Aaron raised the issue of the NIH's reasonable rise, pricing clause in its creators. Uh, there was a requirement that there be a reasonable relationship between the, pricing, the pricing of a licensed product, the public investment in that product, and I'll come back to that, and the health and safety needs of the public. Both Videx and Taxol were licensed under that clause. Their prices were competitive with other comparable drugs. The reasonable pricing uh, requirement was determined to have been met, and they're now available generically. And as Aaron observed, the reasonable pricing requirement was removed in 1995 because Harold Farmas, then the director of the NIH, said they had found that the uh, clause had been a significant uh, deterrent to companies wanting to collaborate with NIH and no one has since suggested reintroducing it. And if reasonable pricing is a rubber bullet, painful but not serious and survivable, margin is a nuclear bomb. It would result in gener genericization and reduction in pricing by 95% within six months. And my third point is that margin is not economically justified. The pathway from academic lab to market is long and tortuous. And frankly, the more radical the innovation, the more tortuous. I'll give you an example, checkpoint inhibitors, which I think uh, people would agree is probably the most important cancer therapeutic approach in decades. Uovoi was the first drug to successfully treat metastatic melanoma, came from the University of California, Berkeley. Obdivo came from Kyoto University, and depending on the outcome of an inventorship fight that's going on currently, maybe the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And then under the same patents, K. Truda, which is the drug that saved Jimmy Carter. So, Yervoy, uh, James Allison at UC Berkeley discovered negative regulators of the immune system in 1995, a molecule called CTLA-4. And he showed that by blocking CTLA-4 using MABs, uh, monoclonals, he could ramp up the immune system, in a mouse at least. Berkeley filed patents and started looking for a licensee. They couldn't get any major company to develop the concept. We'd kill the patient of rampant autoimmunity before the tumor shrinks. That will never work. That was their standard response. After f three years, they finally got a licensee, Nexstar in Colorado, and the rights to CTLA-4 went through the hands of eight companies in six years. 
the first four product companies, uh, concepts, uh, product concepts for CTLA-4 were for the monoclonal to be an adjunct to enhance the efficacy of another drug. And Gilead, a company we've heard of a lot today, who I think people agree is a sophisticated company, was so discouraged, uh, they had bought Nexstar, they sold their royalty rights on Yervoy for $8.5 million in 2004. That's what they thought of checkpoint inhibitors. And Medirex, which acquired the rights from Gilead and, and Bristol-Myers, eventually returned to Allison's vision of monoclonal antibody monotherapy. And UC Patents had four years left when Yervoy was finally returned, uh, approved. Secondly, commercialization depends on massive investment by the private sector. Uh, Thomas Edison once observed that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Inspiration is invention, which comes from research. Perspiration is development and reduction to practice. And I think Jamie agreed with this uh, split before lunch. And it's important to recognize that government grants only pay for the inspiration part of this. The private sector pays for the perspiration. Let me repeat that. Academic scientists only discover drugs with federal funding. They don't develop them. In fact, I think the only drug that has been substantially developed by the government was Taxol, which got $400 million in NCI funding over 30 years. And NCI still needed F F um, Bristol-Myers to develop a production method to enable FDA approval, which was actually achieved with a semi-synthetic process invented by Florida State University, which finally made the world safe for the Pacific yew tree and the spotted owl, which was under extreme threat. And Taxol was competitively priced with other cancer drugs and was determined to have met reasonable pricing, and it's now available generically. And let's talk about Extandi. Uh, Medivation is unusual. It breaks out its R&D expenditures by project, and you can look at their 10Ks and estimate that they and Astellas spent over a billion dollars to develop Extandi. UCLA's grant funding is not publicly available. Was it a million? Was it 10 million? I'm not sure it matters, but it certainly looks as if Edison's formula of 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration applies. And in return for that 1% of federal funding, we're going to strip them of their exclusivity and take away half of their exclusive period? Ask yourself if Medivation and Astellas would have made that billion dollar investment if they had thought that they could have had nine years of their exclusivity taken away from them. So in conclusion, Autumn's position is that if exclusivity of an academic license was once ever taken away by a government margin in issuance of a compulsory license, no company or venture capitalist would ever trust the integrity of an exclusive academic license again, and investment in developing academic technologies would grind to a halt. And unfortunately, this is not amenable to a controlled experiment. Once that genie is out of the bottle, it cannot be put back in. And the historical precedents I've cited, I think, support this. Yes, you might win one or two drug price battles, but you would totally set back the war on disease, which academic uh, scientists are making a significant contribution to, and Autumn believes this would be a reckless and foolish act of public policy. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce the host, uh, Jamie Love, who's going to uh, explain it all and uh, set us back. Uh, you, could you, uh, Zach, do you know how to put my, my uh, what? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have some slides, but I, I'd like in the beginning to respond to a couple of things that uh, Ashley said. And um, I, I thank Alicia for putting me second, because I, I really feel like I have to respond to a few things. For, first drug, I... Uh, my, I'm an economist by background. Uh, I was asked by Ralph Nader when I worked for him in, 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 and Congressman Wyden in 1991 to look at the development of Taxol, which was a drug that was developed by, through the U.S. government. The U.S. government at that time had, had, had funded all the clinical trials on the drug, and 
they, uh, they were using a contractor named Hauser Chemical. They used several contractors to manufacture the drug. And uh, they brought in Bristol Myers Squibb at the very, uh, very end of the process to file the NDA on this cancer drug. And um, uh, at the time, they were, they were paying the, the contractor 25 cents a milligram for uh, the production of the product. And when Bristol Myers put the product on the market, they, they, they didn't know how to make the product, actually. They actually hired Hauser, and Hauser was then a contractor for Bristol Myers, and Bristol Myers put it on the market at $4.87 uh, uh, a milligram. And there was a series of congressional hearings on this. And actually, it was the effort by the members of Congress, including uh, now Senator, uh, Senator Sanders uh, and uh, Congressman White and other people to push for having reasonable prices uh, on, on, on this and other drugs that were involved that led to the efforts to repeal the reasonable pricing clause, not because it didn't work, because they didn't want it to work. Uh, they, they were afraid that maybe they would start making it work, because we were, people were looking very carefully at the time. The, the data on CRADA is interesting, because uh, what, what, what Ashley could have mentioned is one of the reasons why the CRADA agreements, which are not done by universities, by the way, they're done by uh, the NIH or the Army, they're done by federal agencies, the CRADA agreements or a cooperative research and development agreements provide an exception to the, to the notion that you can give public notice when a federal government issues an exclusive license on a patent. And it gives you exceptions to other obligations you'd have or restrictions and limitations on the grant of an exclusive license. So they're popular in a way because they shield the company from public notice and comment on a proposed exclusive license, and they're popular also because they, uh, they, they reduce some of the barriers the federal government has in issuing exclusive licenses. But we asked the NIH, we said, you, you're always talking about how when the reasonable price clause declined, that the number of creatives shot up. I said, we'd like to look at those creatives, and we'd like to figure out what they were and whether they produce drugs or not, just to see how effective it is. As a backdrop, we spent a lot of time looking at new drug approvals, and we asked ourselves how many of these new drugs have marching rights, because we're interested in doing these marching cases. And one of the things that comes up is very few of them do. So if the Bayh-Dole Act is so super-duper uh, uh, successful, as Ashley's described it as, why is it so few drugs that come on the market have any Bayh-Dole legs declared the thing? Is there just like passive underreporting of the government rights on patents, which we think is an issue? Or is it just because the Bayh-Dole Act is not very effective in the commercialization in the first place, and so the dire consequences of the economy toppling over if you basically do marching rights isn't borne out by the data on the development of new drugs? In terms of the voluntary license and the great value of that, I was the expert for the South African Competition Commission in 2003 when they issued compulsory licenses on the HIV drugs that 98% of the patients in Africa were using. So I, I, I was really surprised to him describe that the HIV drug was really benefited primarily by voluntary licenses because that was a compulsory license case. And the outcome in that case was a license that covered all of Sub-Saharan Africa on patents held by Boehringer and by GSK, the TAC case, 2003. Now the medicines patent pool, which I'm sure Ashley knows we're very much involved in, has been uh, done a tremendous job of obtaining voluntary licenses on the newer drugs, which are gradually replacing the older drugs that were used. And it's quite an important thing, and it's a great thing. But the reason why the patent pool succeeded and AIDS drugs things was, was changed from everybody dying to people having access to medicine in those countries is because countries were willing to issue compulsory licenses. So the existence of the voluntary license is not completely independent in some sort of separate parallel universe from the existence of the compulsory license. The willingness to grant a compulsory license, as Columbia has shown in the case of the negotiations over the price of an HIV drug, or the patent pool has shown, is contributed to a more reasonable outcome, either on the price level or the license level for a drug. And it's an important public interest measure that if you give up at your own per peril, um, the the, the idea that no one cared about the reasonable pricing clause when it was gone is untrue. Senator, Senator Sanders, when he was in the House of Representatives, offered several amendments. Uh, the first one, I think, got just under 140,000, uh, under 140 votes in the House. The second time he offered it, he got almost 190 votes, and then he was over the top, and he was in a majority position. And he had co-sponsors who were very conservative right-wing Republicans at the time, because they didn't think the American public should get ripped off on a government-funded invention. 
And the only reason why it wouldn't work is they would bury it in conference where you couldn't have any real uh, uh, accountability to the voters and nobody could really tell what happened. So there was a lot of interest in that at the time. I just wanted to set the record straight on those issues. Now, if I can go to this, could you go to the next slide for me? Uh, oh, I've got the slide. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm not going to spend too much on time this because, <laughs> thankfully, uh, Aaron has basically covered exactly the same thing in my first couple slides. But I just wanted to point out here that, because uh, he had the same information, that in the policy objective of the Bayh-Dole Act, you're supposed to meet, as I bolded out here, uh, the needs of the government and protect the public against non-use, which a lot of people talk about things being on the shelf, but also um, it says, um, uh, uh, or unreasonable use. Now this word, unreasonable use, is different than this word over here, non-use. Now somehow, non-use in the vocabulary of Autumn and NIH, unreasonable use kind of like falls off the table. Now Marchand writes, the Marchand writes uh, 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 that, that Aaron has also covered this very well. These are the four different grounds that are, that are done. Practical application, which is not, not only part of the, um, it's not only part of the Marchand statute here, but it's also part of the federal licensing statutes. It's part of the, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's throughout the Bayh-Dole Act appears over and over again. And Aaron also had this up here. So Aaron has done everything I've done, except he did it before me, so. <laughs> Uh, the last part of this, available to the public on reasonable terms. Now, when the NIH gave the decision in the Extandi case rejecting our petition, they said they rejected the petition of the Extandi case, a drug that cost 100, over $130,000 a year in the United States, and, and like, you know, like not even half that, in, in a lot of cases, as much as 20 percent or 30 or 40 percent of that in any other high-income country. We're the only industrialized country that pays those kind of prices for that drug. Sold by a Japanese company for a cancer drug for prostate cancer, which is anything but a rare disease. It's a drug that every single man in this room will get, a, a disease that every man in this, every man here will get prostate cancer if you live long enough. Think about that. It's, it's a, I, I didn't want to think about it when I worked on the drug, but it's true. It's really... It's, it's, it's more common than breast cancer if you live long. It's just, it's just we all get it, okay? It's really, uh, it's unfortunate. So it wasn't a rare disease, and it was really expensive. It was really not, I mean, Japan, which is the company selling the drug, the price is like $36,000 in Japan, and it's like 130000 here. Now, on what, on what sort of mindset do you say to yourself, 130000 in America and 36000 in Japan for a Japanese company selling something invented on an army grant and an NIH grant? At what point do you really think that really makes any sense? And so when the NIH made the decision, they said, you provided data that people are getting it through Medicare and spending, you know, in the year we quoted, which was a couple years ago, $600 million in Medicare at the time. It's much bigger than that now. They said, people can buy it in America. You can find it. You can find it in the drugstore. So they said, it's available to the public. And they, and they quoted the statute to here. Like there was a period after public. So it was like available to the public. But in the final de decision rejecting it, this term, on unreasonable terms, like I say, that part kind of falls off the table. As if there's some term that you make something available to the public that somehow Price is some alien thing from a, a, what you consider a reasonable term for the public. I don't know what kind of terms do you get from a drug company that you think about where price isn't like the main thing that you're thinking about. So the NIH is just not interested in this. In terms of the research on Extandi, and I'll get to the case in a second, Joe Damasi in his research says that the out of pocket cost on the preclinical, on a risk adjusted basis, it doesn't make any sense to look at the one NIH grant that comes up with a product, any more than it makes a look to look at one experiment that Pfizer does to come up with a product. If Pfizer gets to risk adjust its investments to come up with some massively humongous number of a risk adjusted investment they do and add high capital cost and things like that, why is it the NIH grant is just like the, you know, like the receipt you turn in from the grant, like, oh, I got this grant. They gave out a lot of them, but this one paid off. So the public investment is what we spent on this one grant, let's forget about the, all the other NIH grants that we put out that didn't produce a drug. But when the industry does it, completely different set of rules. We'll call this 
the industry versus the public's uh, sort of discourse. When it's the public's investment, they're puny dollars because they're not risk adjusted. But they're like George Atlas, you know, dollars when the industry does it because you like you put you give them to Joe DeMasi and he puts them through all kinds of like risk adjustment things. If you put them on the same basis, Joe DeMasi would say that the public sector investment, if you include both capital costs, which just is about 40 percent of the cost of the product, not like not like this puny one percent or less pers perspiration thing that you're talking about. It's really quite important. In any event, in a lot of these cases that we've worked on, the government has not only provided financing for the preclinical, but they funded trials like they did in Extandi, like they did in tax law, like they did in lots of other drugs. Or there's a 50% tax credit that subsidizes by the public, by, actually by the U.S. and by no other country, the cost of doing the trials in the first place. So the public sector investment is often not small, but it, well, I will say this. And it's really a shame that a public institution like a university would minimize, would minimize the contribution that the people that pay your salaries put up through our tax money. So you have a job and so your researchers have jobs and your institutions have fancy buildings and things like that, that you would minimize the contribution of what we put up as if it was nothing. And as if the industry, which is basically exploiting what you've done and charging us a lot of money for is the only person that showed up that actually did anything important. Now, these are the marching cases that I've been involved in, uh, which are um, all of them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I was not that involved in the in the, in the Selpro case. Uh, it was brought by. By Dole, I was uh, Senator By. Senator By and Lloyd Keller brought the case, and um, uh, uh, the, the story was that there was a firm in Seattle that had developed this 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 technology, and it was approved by the FDA, and it was used to treat cancer patients. And then Johns Hopkins was trying to market to I think uh, I think Baxter or somebody. They're trying to develop like a, a competing technology. So Johns Hopkins was suing Cellpro to get an injunction to take it off the market. And Cellpro, there was, an, a, 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 there, was, there, was there was a patent case between the two because they both patent essentially the same technology. Both Cellpro and the Johns Hopkins case, both of those products were, in, were funded by the NIH. So the U.S. government had funded both of the inventions. It's just a little bit like what happened in the Farber Design case originally where they had two federally funded products going against each other. So you had two government-funded inventions funding each other. Cellpro loses the case, so they hired Mr. Bidole. They hire, they, they hire Birch Bai to represent them. So Birch Bai then submits a petition in 2007 when he's being paid by somebody that needs to use the march in rights. And among other things, in a letter he wrote in March 3, 1997 to Donna Shalala, he says, Cellpro submits that there may well be reasons, because one of the issues is what the royalty should be for the government to adopt regulations covering situations like the present where some product may be claimed to be covered by patents arising out of work done by more than one federal grantee. Moreover, investigation may be needed to determine whether royalty layering that plainly exists in the present case, a common problem leads to unreasonably high royalties and prices of medical care should be dealt with by regulation. So when Senator By was looking at this thing himself and he had a client in this thing, he took a different position. Then he left uh, uh, that situation, and he ended up with a law firm who had a client, which was Abbott Pharmaceuticals. So then we were involved in the Ritonavir. What's the Ritonavir case? It was invented, John, John uh, I think some of you people know John Erickson, who was the lead scientist on this project at the time. He got the NIH grant to a private company, uh, uh, Abbott Pharmaceuticals. And at the time, John said that Abbott didn't want to work any, do any work on HIV drugs. Uh, but he wanted to work on HIV drugs. And they said, there's no money in it. And so he said, well, what if I get the government to pay for it? And they said, okay, fine. So he got a grant. And then it turned out it, it worked, you know. And then they, were, they tried to give the money back. I mean, they tried everything they could. But there it was. It was really originally put in the market as a, as a protease inhibitor. It wasn't a very good drug. 
as a protease inhibitor, but turn out to have a secondary use later on to boost the activity of other people's protease inhibitors drugs. And it became actually a very, very important HIV drug. At that point, in 2003, at the end of the year, Abbott made the price, had like a five-fold increase. It was a 400% uh, five-fold increase in one day. The thing was, they didn't raise the price anywhere outside the United States. So it was invented on a government grant. The price was increased only in the United States of America, and they didn't increase the price if you used it with Kaletra, which was their drug, only if you used it with a Bristol-Myers drug or a different drug from Roche or some other company that would, co would do it. Bristol-Myers tried to get a license to co-formulate the drug, and Gilead tried to get a license to use Ritonavir to co-formulate some of its products, and other companies did too, and they couldn't do it. So this case said that this invention, funded by the federal government, should be available to any HIV company that wants to, to co-formulate with a different drug. You can pay royalties. You can argue about how robust the royalties are. But having it monopolized by uh, Abbott, which at that time was, had this dominant position that was considered against the law, and having Americans pay more than everyone else. Well, after the case was filed, after the case was filed, and certainly after Abbott knew we were going to file the case, because there was so many people involved in this, they rolled back the price for federal programs, which were 70% of the AIDS patients in the United States, by 80%. So this was an unsuccessful case, except that the price was rolled back by 80%. In the Sopro case, this was an unsuccessful case, but as some people have noted, Sopro got a stay of the injunction through the NIH to make sure that the product stayed in the market until the new product did. I got involved in Sopro because a, a doctor that treated cancer patients contacted me. He treated children that had cancer, and he said that he thought that the Sopro device was superior to what was being developed by Johns Hopkins, and he thought it should work. So I actually tracked down the, the inventor of this thing at Johns Hopkins, and I got him on the phone, and I said, look, I'm calling you. I'm not part of the lawsuit or anything, but I'd just like to know what your thinking is because I said, Certainly it's the case that some patients will benefit from one and some patients will benefit from the other. Aren't the, aren't the children that need this device better off if they have more, more choice, if they can you know, not, not just have to choose one? Because some people may respond better to the other one. And the guy started yelling at me about how Cellpro didn't want to pay and they lost the case and you know, on and on and on. And I, was, I felt like I was talking to like someone that was completely out of touch with the patient situation and totally still bitter about the patent litigation and just wanted revenge for people even questioning, you know, whether they were infringing on his patents and stuff like that. It was really a kind of a sobering experience for me. This was a case, Pfizer was charging three times more for a molecular de de degeneration drug um, in the United States than they're, they're charging anywhere else. This one got a hearing, the only one that got a hearing was the 2004 case. This was considered seriously because Bayh was involved. Bayh testified in this case and said, and by that time, he'd already started writing letters to the editor about Mickey Davis's article and picking apart some of his legislative history things and stuff like that. Uh, in some cases, I think, you know, he made some points about people not being clear about which parts of the legislative history were referring to which bill. Uh, although I think, I think there was a little gilly in the lily on, on, on Senator Bayh's thing in terms of arguing the irrelevance of some of these things, because there are certainly people were thinking about the same issues at the time. But he appeared and he said no one paid him to be, at, at, he appeared at the hearing that day. Well, okay, it was Wednesday. I guess he wasn't paid that day. But his, he was a partner in a firm that represented the company that we were litigating against. And he didn't mention that. And I think you should mention something like that, uh, particularly when you flip your position from where you were right here. I would put nothing, I would put nothing really uh, uh, in terms of credibility of anything that Bayh says on the Bayh Dole Act legislative history at this point, or Senator Dole, the Viagra, uh, Pfizer pitch man, I wouldn't really put too much faith in that. Those guys, they've got reasons to say what they do, but they can't define the legislative history and the plain language of the statute, I think is the controlling thing. On this case, we, we thought maybe Obama would be better than Bush, so we brought the same case, but we added a bunch of other drugs that had the same circumstance of Americans paying more than foreigners did. And that one was rejected, so that was our first disappointment. And on this drug, the Xtandi case, we thought this was a very strong case because of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the very big pricing differences 
the sort of very interesting facts in the case in terms of the, it has a disproportionate effect on African Americans. We had evidence from patients who were facing very high co-payments on the drug. It was, it was considered one of the things that was really problematic for Medicare in terms of paying for the drug. We had suppliers that were willing to make it. And there's a small molecule, there are low entry barriers. It was past that exclusivity. And I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna skip these because I don't really have time, so I'm gonna go to. So this was, this was basically on a, on, a, on a different story in the New York Times that Matt, re, re, can't, how do you say Matt's name? You know you're a journalist, right? Rickle. Mark Rickle, there you go. And uh, that's a typo, that should be Andrew Pollack. Uh, they wrote this story in the New York Times, uh, harnessing U.S. taxpayers fight to fight cancer and make profits. This was a story in partly about kite pharmaceuticals, but they had these quotes. Now Mark was the guy, he was involved in the, Ritonavir case and, the, and all these, uh, you know, he, 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 he's like Mr. Baidol at the NIH. I mean, if you really got to give this guy some credit, he, he's not, he's a very competent, knowledgeable guy that has been around and people seek a lot of counsel to. And he, he does, he did great job in helping the patent pool. And I mean, I, I don't want to seem too negative about Mark because he doesn't deserve it. I mean, he's a, he's, he's a very dedicated public service. He's very gracious. He's accessible, et cetera. But he did say this, and I, I, will, I will quote him, and I think that's fair. So he says, our mission is the treatment of people improving health care. Fine, that's, what's, that's what Francis Collins said when he was testifying on this issue. Uh, and, and then he says here, NIH made it clear our job is not to decide the prices of drugs, period. So if you bring a pricing case to the NIH, and this is who's deciding your case, it doesn't matter what the facts are. If it's about price, you have already lost the case, okay? Because he's just made it clear that he's not gonna go there. And it's not just him, it's him and Francis Collins. And Francis Collins also, great guy. But on this issue, uh, I disagree with him. So, um, this is a CRISPR, CRISPR case. This is a case that's coming down the road for people, not just us. There was like inventors, that, you, you probably read about the three very compelling figures that were sort of fighting each other over who, who, who the patents, uh, the, the, the lead inventors, and uh, the two at Berkeley and, uh, and, and the one at, uh, one, at, one at MIT. Well, together those three inventors have started five companies to license the CRISPR patents. And this is from an article that uh, Contreras and, and uh, Shukro that is about this issue. Well, the, the um, uh, the CRISPR technology is something you use, it's a tool you use, like you could use a hammer to build a house or something like that. Suppose that somebody had, Mano was talking about like a patent on the scissors or the hammer or something like that, and they just tried to control who could, who could sew dresses or who could build houses or something like that. It just wouldn't be a good, good situation. There's no investment issue here. This was something, these guys all, the Berkeley people got a $3 million breakthrough prize plus a bunch of other prizes that had a lot of money. They got millions out of this thing already. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to carve out certain areas of therapeutic applications and give monopolies to people that develop therapeutic applications in certain places. And what we're going to ask DHS to do and the Trump administration is to move toward a policy that would ensure that the CRISPR technology are licensed in such a way that meets the public interest. And if, it, if they're not, to use the tools, since Aaron talked about the royalty-free right or the margin, which is kind of problematic, to use those to, to loosen things up a bit. And some of the precedents to that, one of the precedents would be what happened in stem cells, where the NIH entered into an agreement with Wharf, which was controlling a large number of the patents on the use of stem cells, in order to force them to be more forthcoming in terms of the licensing policies. It's not exactly a parallel, but it, there's a lot in common with that. And that's an issue we'll be looking at in the future. And then, these are my suggested reforms. This is my last slide. Uh, the NIH is biased, in our opinion, and does not protect the public's rights. A lot of the people running the NIH are patent holders themselves. And when they leave the NIH, they, they, they go to work for companies, and their friends are companies, the people they go to conferences, and they're trying to, they're like, like some of the researchers, like the people in the CRISPR thing, a lot of them are not even doing research anymore. They're spending all their time, like, meeting with venture capitalists and, you know, accountants and things like that. They think like the industry does on these things. Why, and why not? Because 
unless they get pushback from you or people in Congress. Another issue is to amend this part of the law, which says that um, it's a procedural thing. If you do a marching case right now, they can just litigate like crazy, and, and, and you have to kind of, they, even if you get a marching light, you can't really use it for a long time. That's one of the main procedural parts. Now, the government can, can address this because even if the government faces this unfavorable procedural thing that was added later to the Bayh-Dole Act, it has a royalty-free right in its back pocket. So the government has actual leverage if they want to go down this road. Um, but I think that should, be, um, that should be fixed. And then develop standards for licensing and pricing of licensed products that reduce uncertainty over practices that trigger the march in. This is what Congressman Doggett and others uh, have proposed that they actually begin to sort of th throw down some markers, even if they're just best practices or like, like we think we are gonna, you know, you're gonna you're gonna run into trouble if you do the following. It's really what's been recommended by the people who looked at the CRISPR that they begin to kind of don't wait until everyone's locked in and signed a lot of contracts and investors have put a lot of money into things. Actually, a lot of that's already happened, but it doesn't get any better going forward. I mean, as business deals are made. Then, you know, people talked about what Gilead had to pay the $11 billion they had to buy Safoli. That's because of the expectations where you could charge whatever you want. They wouldn't have had to pay $11 billion for that company if the expectations were you could have charged half that. So I think that you have to kind of think about that. And then finally, uh, we, we suggest that people consider extending the march in because it's an existing mechanism to all medical products regulated by the FDA, regardless of the federal funding, and also to test data rights, which is another thing. And you could also throw in there orphan drug rights and other things that are kind of relate, you know, orphan drug exclusivities that, that, that are kind of non-patent exclusivities that are there. That's it. Thank you very much. So um, even though we have now technically hit the end of our 90 minutes, we're going to go for questions because there were a lot of issues raised. Um, I have a couple of my own, but who would like to start in the audience? We've got microphones for you. Hello. Hello. All right. It's like it's on. Um, so Peter from Public Citizen, thanks, everybody. Just. I'm struck by, I feel like sometimes we get stuck in this place where we talk about a world as though it has to be either exclusivity or no compensation at all. And I don't think many people who are looking at this issue with analytical seriousness look at it that way. It seems that there is an awful lot to talk about. Naomi tried to lay out the case this morning for, in some detail for, uh, how significant compensation can be without exclusivity and how that provides very significant incentives for R&D because we can be talking about many billions of dollars and many multiples of the original R&D, even risk-adjusted uh, investment uh, without necessarily be conceding the idea that it's going to be a monopoly uh, market. So, I mean, if there are, if there are reflections on that point or, or how Marchin can pay in and therefore uh, you know, is not a uh, is not just a taking everything away and destroying the market. I think that's useful, but I, I think we can take sort of other questions and people can incorporate that. Um, I just wanted to add to that. I mean, I'd be curious um, what you guys think about transparency requirements about levels of investment in relationship to Bidol. Um one of the things that's been interesting about some of these cases is if you wanted to know exactly how much money did go in from the private sector after the public money, and whether there was any, how much it was, um, that's not currently easy to find out and seems like would be very hard to get to an answer about what reasonable kind of compensation would be without a mechanism to, to really get into that. So it seems to me something that, again, you know, I think would be a reasonable uh, request if we care about this from an R&D perspective. I think if I could respond quickly to Amy's point, um, that's something we've been very concerned about. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's just uh, one of the major problems with drug raising is that the entire thing is, is very opaque. Um, and that really does 
go along with the, the funding in R&D. And um, we've had a lot of problems in trying to figure that out and working with congressional researchers and asking GAO and, and you know, trying a lot of different avenues for that. But it's something we're kind of committed to, to figuring out. And I think we're seeing more and more um, focus on that in some of the drug pricing you know, legislation and conversations we've been having on the Hill. Alan, Alan Black, I wanted to, if I can get it to kick on. Is it, it's on. I had a quick uh, follow-up. The interesting aspect about Bayh-Dole is it only kicks in when it's a federally funded invention, but there are a lot of different monopolies affecting life-saving drugs. One example is regulatory monopoly. monopoly. There may be only one FDA licensed producer and I've run into this of a case for vitamin A. So we, I think the same motive is we want the public to be treated for the disease. We don't want sick Americans. So uh, one market solution has been in critical technologies like, te like uh, computers and military uh, sourcing. You have to, when there's a patented product, uh, even if it's exclusive, you have to have a second source just in case that factory burns down, there's a contamination. Um, now, and this also may indiv independently act as a barrier to price because eventually whoever that second source is may be asked to step in and begin pr producing the drug. So you wouldn't have non-use as being one of the threats of exclusivity. I, I think everyone that gets a government grant and, and licenses a product that they, they should have to report uh, what they spent on research development so we're not just in an area of, of assertions not backed up by evidence about what, what's done here, there, or the other thing. The, the NIH does not set a good example. It will not provide uh, uh, almost any information about a license that doesn't require to. They won't give us a list of the creatives that they've granted, um, uh, even though they have them in a computer database because they say it's not a record. Like they, they claim they have no registry of all the creators they grant, even though they give the exact number out every year in their annual reports. Um, uh, they won't tell the royalties. Uh, they would not give us, in a lot of license we looked at the NIH, the, the addresses of the companies, or the phone numbers, uh, or the principles of the companies that we're giving license to when it was a company that didn't have a web page and no one had ever heard of before. I mean, they're incredibly secretive over at the NIH. They're very, a lot of contempt. They just tell us to file FOIAs. The Army does the same thing in the Zika case. If that's the example that the federally owned patents are taken, uh, you know, the university is under, in some cases, you can get more information on yours, yours the state university because they have the Freedom of Information Act of the state university. But it, it, the NIH has exempted itself from a lot of FOIA type obligations. I think the, tra the lack of transparency on public assets that were worth billions of dollars, they're negotiated not sold in arm's length transition. It's absolutely shocking. And I think that, uh, and, 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 and the poverty of the policy debate by not having good, good information about what's going on is, is, is unfortunate because then you're just vulnerable to whatever, 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 whatever somebody says might be true and you can't really uh, authoritatively uh, 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 correct it. I have a question for Jamie. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank you for putting this on. I think this has been very instructive and very helpful. And by the way, I, I have lived long enough, so I, 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 I get your point. Um, you've talked a lot about the public interest, and there is obviously public interest in basic research and its development. Um, there's political interest in the funding that comes from the Congress, it's $130 billion annually. And I agree completely, I agree completely with the facts that Ashley Stevens gave you and what they mean. I mean, they, this is a high risk investment and if you talk to a VC, they'll tell you that they are very selective now and very worried about VCRs and FDA approval I mean, it's very, very high risk. If you are able to add this form of price control, I believe Ashley is correct. It would be the straw that breaks the camel's back in whoever is going to invest in the development of life science. And, and I think that's hard to, it's voluntary. 
on their part. But here's the risk. If you do win and that happens, the risk is that the $130 billion annually will be grabbed by either the deficit hawks or the many interests that are now being uh, uh, canceled out by, and I have to write this down, uh, the deconstruction of the administrative state, whatever Mr. Bannon was talking about yesterday, is pretty scary to me, and it scares everyone else. What may happen if you bloody up by dole in this process is that may leave an opening for AmeriCorps, the arts and sciences, and all of these other worthy causes to lose their funding. And, and I know you would care about that, just, just as I do. But how do you respond to that? And this may be a softball, but I want you to answer it because you're the guy that has brought this all together. Um, uh, well, I, uh, um, my, my, my father died of cancer younger than he should have. Um, my wife's mother lived in her house and died of cancer younger than she should have while she lived with us. My wife's a terminal, a, a terminal cancer patient right now. I have relatives that have incurable diseases that are, that are rare diseases that are really terrible. I, I, it's, it's, I, I, I find it kind of insulting, not, not from you, but I mean, you know, people sort of assume we kind of like don't get the idea that innovation is important or that innovation costs money. It, it does. Um, I think people also have to understand that high prices have a negative impact on people. And to act like it doesn't is as stupid as me acting as if it doesn't cost anything to do research. You've got these two problems. Right now, we finance drug development through high drug prices. So that's the innovation side. And so on the patient side, what, you think there's no negative impact on patients? Talk to the, talk to the people in, 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 in the UK that can't get Kizilla, this breast cancer drug, is not reimbursed, even though it's the only drug that's going to keep them alive. So it's stupid, I think, to have these two things working against each other, to have this conflict between access and innovation. In December, we had a meeting that some of the people here, Hannah was at it, other people were here, on delinkage in the, in the Senate office where we said what we really have to do, if not immediately, we have to progressively delink the way we finance R&D from the price of drug. You can't do it immediately, but you have to start bringing prices down so patients are not hurt. So you're not killing the patient. You're not asking a sick person to finance the clinical trial and denying them access to medicine because that's what reimbursement people do when the prices are really ridiculous. And you have to build up the other ways that you finance. You, you can see some of it right now, it just has to be ramped up. So the prior review voucher was sort of an attempt to provide a non-price incentive for neglected drug development and it's, it's, it, it's, put, a, it's put a boost in the orphan drug tax. We, look, we looked at the orphan drug tax credit, what happened when it was repealed, investments went down because the risk, the, 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 the success rate changed. So the subsidy actually improve the situation for development that. So you can subsidize the trials on that end. You can provide, as Senator Sanders has proposed, and, and, and Joe Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize when it comes, and we propose, and others have proposed, and now a lot of groups have proposed, you can provide big cash rewards in the back end for people that succeed in, in developing drug. If your only game is high prices, and you're going to be sitting here with people complaining about high prices, and, 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 and it's, it's not like high prices are like $1,000. High prices for transfer drugs now are the median cost of a house. My wife's drug cost $9,000 yesterday. Three weeks from now, she needs another shot. It's going to be another $9,000. She could buy two Maseratis in one year. Because we have a brother-in-law that bought a Maserati, so we kind of know a little bit about the prices. <laughs> for what she gets to get this little drug, it costs probably five bucks to get an injection. That's your, that's your brilliant way to finance clinical trials? I think that's a crappy way. I think we can do better than that. So I don't want to be sort of hold out at efforts to curb prices or are trying to crater the innovation system. They're a way to protect patients. And if you really care about innovation, then put your shoulder to the wheel at something other than high prices because high prices are failing. It's a broken system. It's not a great winning system, a system that, that excluded 
30 million HIV patients from access to AIDS drugs until the compulsory license started to fly was not a system that worked. It was a system that was morally repugnant. And it's morally repugnant what's happening to cancer patients now. So I think that the, the answer is not to sort of hang on to the last, you know, the last gas, but like, it's working fine, don't break a system that works so well, but to build up something that doesn't have the conflict, it doesn't have the policy incoherence of high prices and access. That's my answer. Um, Professor Steve, sorry. <laughs> Professor Stevens, could you, could you t uh, respond to that a little bit, particularly the idea of delinkage? Have you, how does that, how does that work in your, uh, in your sphere? Well, Thank you. <clears throat> the $130 billion of a year that the government spends on research, that is not to develop technology. A very small subset of that, SBIR grants and things like that, are specifically intended to develop new products. The bulk of that expenditure is to increase the nation's scientific base, and to train the next generation of scientists, the graduate students who actually do the work. And <clears throat> it's really the, the activities of universities and federal laboratories making discretionary investments in patenting some of the research that comes out of those uh, grants, converting it into, in, into intellectual property that has property rights that can be transferred. I mean, we have this parallel track of what happens to sci scientific knowledge. One track is it gets freely published in the journals, and other scientists read it and duplicate it, hopefully, and build on it. And then we have the second track, which is the commercialization track, in which um, specific companies obtain the rights to develop those technologies into products. And I think it is the addition of that second track that has um, been one of the most successful consequences of Baidol. Um, who is it? Uh, I'm blanking on her name. Um, it'll come to me. She's a, a British lady at the uh, Sloan School. And she has talked about the patent paper pair, and she has looked at papers in um, nature biotechnology, and there's been other studies that have looked at uh, life sciences papers in, in nature and in science, and seen that for about half of those publications, there is a corresponding patent that has been filed. And so I think at the university level, you know, we see the, these systems um, operating comfortably in tandem. As I said at the beginning of my remarks, the issue of drug prices, that is not the expertise of academic licensing people. We may have personal opinions. We are not um, the people who have studied this. We don't have expertise. It's above our pay grade. Our job is to try and identify uh, the inventions that have value, protect them, license them, and get them into development. And you know, the issues of you know, should our licensees be forced to disclose uh, how, how much they spent to develop them, you know, that's above our pay grade. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi, uh, Steve from Public Citizen. So there was one thing that uh, you mentioned, Mr. Dr. Stevens, I don't want to sell you short. Um, as evidence for the efficacy of Biodol, that we see so many, so many medical products today have government, uh, government investment in their history. You said, what, eight or nine percent overall, and then close to double that for more medically important drugs. So I wanted to flip that on its head, though, and just this is more of a comment that I'm hoping you guys can respond to than a question. But, you know, are we to believe that, you know, if the government were to be more assertive in, in a you know, particularly egregious case like Extandi, where we're paying way more than other countries despite the public investment in the product, you know, are, are we to understand that if the government uh, you know, asserted that right, that suddenly 
universities and uh, and the companies that they license to would suddenly pull back and not touch any of the dirty government money anymore because they're afraid of rights being asserted under this limited situation. Because that seems to be the implication that you know the R and suddenly we're not going to have this innovation if that right is asserted. Um, does that, and it seems unreasonable to me, given like how many of these inventions, according to your own numbers, were reliant on that kind of research. So first of all, I'd say it happened once before. After the mid-1960s aggressive government assertion and seizure of patent rights, no drug that the government owned the patents to ever got developed and received FDA approval. So we have history. Secondly, my 2011 New England Journal article identified 153 drugs that were discovered in whole or in part in public sector research institutes. Since 1991, universities have received over 350,000 invention disclosures. So the success rate, finding those 153 out of that pool of 350,000 is like looking for a needle in a haystack. And as I said, Lisa Nelson, a hot academic technology is one that two companies are interested in. I once had a, a technology that three companies were interested in. I was in heaven. But it is academic licensing. It, you, know, you can look back. You can look at extending and the, and the monetization. You can look at um, Northwestern and Lyrica and the money they've made and say, wow, but that is such a minority of the cases. You know, it's lightning strikes. And I think we have to be very careful about aggressive 2020 hindsight. Thank you. Um, I think this wraps up this session, and we're taking a little bit of extra time. So thank you very much for coming, and on to the next round.
Could everyone come back in the room, please? We're going to get started again. I said please. You can bring your snack in the room. Come on. <laughs> How are you? You look so good. How is life? It's good. So it's good. People at town hall meetings. Should I get the people here? Oh, we have the speakers. Do we have Jamie? Should I yell at Jamie? <laughs> Should we stop? Get Jamie. I wanted to make fun of Jamie, but if he's not here, what's the point? <laughs> but then it's behind his back, I don't know. Oh, here he is. No, no snack for Jamie. <laughs> Good afternoon. I hope you all had a, a good, healthy snack. They were only that kind of snack. <laughs> I love meeting where people eat bananas. It's like very childish. <laughs> well, now you all know that I'm, uh, I'm on drugs. So <laughs> that secret is out, thanks to my husband. Um, I'm on the very expensive drugs, so these are okay, right? And I do not have a Maserati. I do not dream of that. Uh, I'm here because uh, I'm, uh, I'm representing the Union for Affordable Cancer Treatment, UACT, a new organization. And I'm also here because I'm a patient, and I, I love to, uh, to remind people here, all those eminent lawyers and professors, that uh, there are some disturbing realities linked to your, all, to your work. You all know that cancer has become, for some lucky few, a chronic disease. I am the daughter, daughter-in-law, sister, sister-in-law, and myself a patient of a chronic disease. But we all know it's still uh, the leading global cause, cause of mortality. There's about 40 million new cases every year, 8.2 million deaths in 2012, and this is growing. We also know that patients with cancer live long life, in some countries, very short life in others, and uh, that even in industrialized countries like ours, drugs are increasingly too expensive, $9,000 every three weeks for me, and I'm a bargain, I heard. Um, I get emails from uh, people who read the UACT uh, letters and, uh, and tweets from uh, people from all over the world asking me how to get access to drugs how uh, to get access to trials on drugs. That's, that's the disturbing realities that you all have to remember. So how can we do better? How can uh, compulsory license improve access to life-saving drugs for, and, and cancer treatment in general? First, of course, we have to review existing mechanisms available to improve access to cancer medication, such as the mechanisms we've been talking about all day. So I'm very happy and very uh, flattered to be invited to be the moderator for this uh, short panel, but uh, excellent panelist. Um, today, Professor Abbott will describe the international regulation, or rather, rather the framework for regulating compulsory license, and Andrew Goldman will examine the statutory grounds for granting 
uh, compulsory license in 13 industrial countries, but I, I hope you he, he won't talk about all of them in details. Do you have a handout? Uh, our first speaker, who hardly needs introduction, is Fred Abbott. He's the Edward Ball Eminent Scholar, well-known and highly regarded for his scholarship and professional activities in international intellectual property policies. Professor Abbott has served as an expert advisor to a number of governments on matters of IPR, trade and public health, among other related issues. I think I met Professor Abbott in Brazil 15 years ago, right? So we were very young then. Uh, Andrew Goldman is the Council for Policy and Legal Affairs at KI, and uh, he was already introduced, but for the, some of the people here, um, Andrew is working on domestic and international issues relating to IP, and especially compulsory license and requests of compulsory license on uh, uh, many different countries involving drugs for hepatitis and also cancer treatment. And it's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, Professor Abbott to the podium here. Uh, I think 10, 12 minutes. We can do it in 12 minutes. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here to speak with you today. And thank you, Jamie, for the invitation. I, I am tempted to think when Elon Musk gets to Mars, uh, and he asks, he will find that they all already know about Article 31 of the TRIPS Agreement. Um, but um, as Jamie mentioned at the very outset this morning, um, many of the people in this room uh, or here earlier uh, have worked on these issues for quite a few years with respect to developing countries, particular concerns about access to medicines. Um, but one of the things we heard uh, with the UN high-level panel uh, on access to medicines was submissions, I would say notably, for example, from the government of the Netherlands to the effect of, well, yes, this may have been a developing country problem at one point, but the Netherlands can't afford to pay its medicines bill anymore, uh, and we need to be looking at new mechanisms for dealing uh, with these issues. Um, and in terms of what I think is a fairly basic presentation I'm going to make in just a few minutes, um, when I have, over the past months, been contacted by members of Senate staff about various bills that are under consideration, uh, it appears that there are two standard pushbacks. Uh, one is it is inconsistent with the TRIPS agreement, and the other is that it is a taking. Um, well, I won't try to address the second one at the moment, but um, the, the first one, I think usually these TRIPS agreement arguments can be fairly easily disposed of, but of course it, it depends on someone having uh, at least a, a foundational knowledge of what's in the TRIPS agreement referring to these provisions. So uh, I'm going to try briefly to go through the international regime that applies to compulsory licensing uh, to demonstrate that this is a, a perfectly acceptable, legitimate mechanism under international law with a long pedigree uh, and, and treaty-based permission for use. Uh, the first discussions that led to the final conclusion of the Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property began at a conference organized in Vienna, Austria in 1873, uh, and already, and this is Edith Penrose's definitive history of the Paris Convention, noted that at that conference, the most notable decision, which was a resolution recommended compulsory licensing of patents in cases in which the public interest should require it. Just to note that this isn't something that we uh, thought of yesterday. Uh, I, the, the Paris Convention, when it was initially concluded uh, and came into force in 1883, did not contain uh, rules on uh, compulsory licensing of patents or non-voluntary licenses. The main rules, although for those of you who are familiar with it, the convention is amended through conferences from time to time, but the main additions were made in, in 1925 at the Hague Conference. Uh, and they added details regarding in uh, Article 5, 5A, uh, introduced broad authority to address uh, potential abuses from the use of patents, 
so that's expressly uh, in the Paris Convention and includes specific provisions with respect to cancellation of patents for non-working. Uh, and non-working uh, is unlike the general provision is qualified by certain time limitations, three years from the date of grant or four years from the date of filing, whichever is the shorter for the provision on uh, when you can grant the uh, compulsory licensing. Uh, now, uh, toward Lake Geneva, for those of you who are familiar, the WIPO building is about 10 minutes walk from the old GATT building, today the WTO building up Rue de la Paix. Um, and in 1986, of course, we started the GATT Uruguay round negotiations to add substantive patent rules, which largely moved the center of IP gravity from WIPO to the New World Trade Organization. And in that respect, we had adopted uh, the WTO ADRIPS Agreement, Article 31 on non-voluntary patent licensing actually called, there's no use of the term compulsory licensing in the TRIPS agreement. It's other use without authorization of the right holder. And this provision, Article 31, covers both government use and private third-party licensing, and it lays out both substantive and procedural rules. If you are not familiar, it's very easy to find the text of the TRIPS agreement. Go to WTO.org and look under uh, legal text and find the TRIPS agreement there very easily. I'm not going to go through in detail the specific provisions. I'll go through them generally in a minute. But in 2001, again, a number of us worked on this aspect of it. You had the Doha Declaration on the TRIPS agreement on public health, which is an agreed interpretation of the TRIPS agreement, and then that led to a the 2003, August, two, August 30, 2003 waiver, and finally the 2005 amendment of Article 31B, setting Article 31B, sets a long-winded statement. I could hardly get it out of my mouth. But in any case, the, the Doha Declaration followed the confrontation in South Africa initiated by the U.S. and the EU and the 39 pharmaceutical companies, a consequence of the result of which was finally to confirm the government's rights to use TRIPS flexibilities. And this is an important general point without going into details. It's a main tenant of interpretation of the TRIPS agreement that governments have flexibility in their methodologies of implementation. So the TRIPS agreement rules are generally at a fairly high level of abstraction and governments have a lot of leeway in how these are actually incorporated into national law. And the Doha Declaration provides that each member has the right to grant compulsory licenses and the freedom to determine the grounds upon which such licenses are granted. So quite literally, under the TRIPS agreement, a government can grant a compulsory license on the ground of its own choosing. The, the, there is no limitation on those grounds. And interestingly, one of the things that really brought everyone around to adopting this was the U.S. had for many years told other countries don't issue compulsory licenses because it interferes with the revenues to the patent owners. And then as soon as we had a, a problem really meriting serious immediate attention, Tommy Thompson brought the executives from Barron to his office and said we're going to grant a compulsory license on Cipro and manufacture it here in the United States. And that was other countries were somewhat surprised at this. Um, well, we've been dealing with AIDS here for a number of years. You've always said an issue of compulsory license. You've been dealing with this for about two weeks now, and suddenly granting compulsory licensing seems to be okay. Um, that then led, following that, uh, to uh, the negotiation to overcome an obstacle potentially proposed by Article 31F of the TRIPS Agreement regarding predominant licensing for export. If I went through the details of that, we'd be here all day. But uh, the one interesting point to make out of that is that the U.S. USDR opted out of the U.S. using this, um, this mechanism as an importer. I mean, we pretty much literally said if we have an emergency in the United States and a foreign country can provide us with the medicines under a compulsory license, we are not going to use it. 
I would like someone to explain that to me on a rational basis at some point, but we have agreed to that. So very briefly, running through the basic rules of, of Article 31, licenses are to be considered on their individual merits, but this doesn't mean you can't prescribe conditions under which the license would be granted, for example, based on the drug being an essential medicine or, or prescribed pursuant to a particular formulary, so you can have conditions. There should be prior negotiation uh, for a voluntary license on reasonable terms and conditions within a reasonable time, but again, the statute and the government can prescribe presumptive time limitations on this to accelerate the process. Prior negotiation can be waived for public non-commercial use, emergencies and extreme urgency. And uh, for those of you who think the U.S. government may not have been familiar with its own 28 U.S.C. 1498 authority. In fact, there's some very, if you didn't know what that statute was, you'd wonder what screwy drafter drafted Article 31 of the TRIPS Agreement. So you have to integrate 28 U.S.C. 1498 into Article 31B and Paragraph 44.2 to really understand how we deliberately integrated the U.S. government's right to automatically take a compulsory license without prior negotiation, without notifying the patent owner, and without the possibility of an injunction, all actually got built in right into the terms of the TRIPS agreement. So we aren't violating the rules that we negotiated. There has to be adequate remuneration in the circumstance of the case, but again, that's a pretty flexible standard. The right has to be non-exclusive. In other words, you're not taking the patent use right away from the original patentee. Termination of conditions when the conditions are no longer present. You have to have the review of the grant and remuneration by an independent authority available. So in other words, there has to be a route of appeal of the decisions, but it doesn't mean that the license can't function during the pendency of the appeal. Um, so when you have uh, either a compulsory license uh, granted with respect to antitrust uh, and in fact, with the new system, you have relaxation on the remuneration requirements. Um, and in the TRIPS agreement, there's a specific provision that allows you to overcome blocking patents. So one thing that was mentioned this morning was that, um, well, the United States is basically an outlier in the area of its Patent Act. Uh, we're one of the few countries that doesn't have a specific provision for the grant of a compulsory license at the request of a third party. Uh, although, as noted this morning, we have uh, 28 U.S.C. 1498. And so if you read the guidebooks and the model statutes of the World Intellectual Property Organization, the World Bank, the WTO, the WHO, UNCTAD, and so forth, all recommend the incorporation of a specific a set of rules within the National Patent Act to allow for compulsory licensing. At the very least, as Jamie alluded to before, they provide a background for other negotiations so that they uh, provide some amelioration of the monopoly condition of the patent. Um, sorry. Of course, in the United States, compulsory licensing is a, a judicial equitable remedy that's available. Uh, this isn't something that started with eBay. Um, and this goes back further than this, but if you want to look at a, a major case in which uh, compulsory license of patents was used, the, the General Electric antitrust cases uh, back in the 1940s, uh, in which a compulsory license of GE patents was a broad remedy. I think all of our, or mo certainly the more recent of our bilateral and regional trade agreements, all recognize the availability of compulsory licensing. They include them in various provisions, and they also recognize our acknowledgement of government's right to make use of uh, patents 
as per the Doha Declaration. Um, so this is just a very basic overview. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and oh, Jamie, I hope that that fulfills the charge that you gave me and we'll Okay, um, so I have very little time. Uh, this is a chart that was passed around. It's sort of a truncated version of a, a different chart that I'm, I'm looking at, but it basically um, has the grounds for compulsory licensing. Um, my version has uh, the decision makers for who, who gets to decide whether the compulsory license is granted and also issues of remuneration. And this is for 13 different industrialized countries. So I'm gonna try and get through this in about five minutes. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm getting, so uh, at the outset, I'll just say um, that, you know, there's, uh, as, as Fred was just saying, this, it's almost the limitless amount of possibilities for what a country can do with compulsory licensing. There's a lot here. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of it. You'll see it in, in a lot of these countries, there'll be compulsory licensing possibilities for you know non-working or insufficient working of the patent. Sometimes you'll see compulsory licensing provisions for dependent patents where you have one invention that um, has a patent and it also involves an earlier patent. So there's a problem there where you can get a compulsory license to go ahead and allow to do it, to, to, uh, to work that. Um, a lot of the countries in Europe have provisions about compulsory licensing for plant varieties, including a, a cross-licensing, a mandatory compulsory license for cross-licensing that came out of the EU directive um, having to do with biotech. Um, I'm gonna just quickly talk about some of the ones that are interesting as they might relate to health. Um, and I think this is dry, but it helps set up the conversation that's coming in the next panel about what what you know as we think about the US and what we might want to do to look at what some other countries have done so I'll just start with Australia um, general compulsory licensing provision um, you have to meet the three conditions uh, the, the first is a, a, a failure to obtain a, a license um, on reasonable terms within a reasonable period the second is reasonable requirements of the public with respect to that patent invention have not been satisfied the third, the patentee has given no satisfactory reason for failing to exploit the patent. B is anti, uh, is like an antitrust or competitive law issue. Um, the the no satisfactory, no, I'm sorry. The um, reasonable requirements with the public is actually defined below, um, and it can include that the demand for the product is not reasonably met, um, which is defined below to include that the manufacturer has not been done to an adequate extent or that there's been a failure to supply on reasonable terms. Again, this topic of reasonable terms keeps coming up. Um, or in subsection two, um, to supply the part on reasonable terms and, and, I, and four, to grant licenses on reasonable terms. Um, Australia has a crown use provision, which is basically government use, but for where there's a king or a queen. Um, so I'm just gonna go through this really fast. Just scroll down to Belgium. Um, if you go down to Article 31 Bis in Belgium, Belgium's interesting that they have a, a provision that is very specific to, why is my scrolling? 31 Bis. A little bit, little bit lower? Yeah, there we go. So Belgium has a, a provision that's very specific to medicine, which is, and there's not that many countries that actually have it, but this is really good. In the interest of public health, the king may by a decree deliberated by, in a council of ministers grant a license to exploit and apply an invention covered by a patent for, you see, medicinal product, medical devices, diagnostic products, and so forth. Um, so that's interesting. Um, Canada, you can scroll down. Um, Canada, the Attorney General of Canada, or any person interested, so again, this, you can think about the things that we've been talking about today, about who can actually try to get a compulsory license. Um, the Attorney General of Canada, or any person interested, can, can try to get a compulsory license where there's been an, an abuse of the exclusive rights, 
Well, what does that mean? It's defined um, it, to include that if the demand for the patented article in Canada is not being met to an adequate extent and on reasonable terms, again, reasonable terms, um, in subsection D, uh, if there's been a refusal of the patentee to grant a license or licenses on reasonable terms, um, and so forth. So we can scroll, keep scrolling. Um, Uh, in France, if you go down to Article L61316, has a similar provision to Belgium um, that's very specific to medicines and um, diagnostics and so forth. If, it, if the interests of public health so require, the minister can grant ex officio licenses. So it's, it's, it doesn't even have to be, um, it, it, it's just, they can just do it, um, specific to medicines products, diagnostics, and so forth. There's, there's sort of a, a um, specific limitation there having to do with the diagnostic products. Um, so we can keep going. Um, Germany, section 13, you can just look up here. There's a, a government use provision that they can, the government, the, the patent will have no effect if the, if the federal government just orders the invention to be used in the interest of public welfare. So that's, um, I get it's sort of similar to the 1498, but it's it's very different, differently worded. Um, section 24, this is um, compulsory licenses for refusal to license, and there's also for public interest. And this is this is the section that was used in the in the case last summer in Germany, where Merck received a compulsory license actually on patents having to do with an, an HIV medicine from a Japanese company. Um, is there, are you able to follow along either on here or in your papers? I know I know this is really fast. I'm just trying to get through as much as possible. Um, Italy, uh, if you go down to Italy, they have compulsory licenses for um, lack of working, for dependent patents. They have that cross license that I was talking about for uh, mandatory cross license for for um, plant varieties. Also, not included in Italy. I should note it's kind of interesting because you see that some of the other countries will specifically mention competition law, so like as a remedy for, um, you know, violation of their competition law. Italy doesn't have that in here, but it, we know definitively that Italy's actually granted compulsory licenses. The, the anti-competitive, uh, the competition authority in Italy has granted compulsory licenses on medicines, medical technologies. Um, Japan, keep going. Um, you can go get down to Article 93, where the working of a patent intervention is particularly necessary for the public interest. Um, the Netherlands, again, public interest, Article 57, if our minister considers it in the public interest, you can get a compulsory license. Um, Poland, Poland is interesting. Um, Article 68, so... Um, so actually, I'll, I'll, I'll work backwards. Article 82 has the general provisions for compulsory licensing. And in subsection 2, it includes uh, where there's been an abuse uh, within the meaning of Article 68, so an abuse of the rights. So Article 68 explains that. The patent holder or the licensee may not abuse his rights, in particular by preventing the invention from being exploited by a third party if such exploitation is necessary for the purpose of meeting home market demands and is particularly dictated by public interest considerations and consumers are supplied with the product in insufficient quantity or of inadequate quality or at excessively high prices. I, think, I thought that was interesting just because you don't often see the explicit reference to the high prices, but that's, that is very clear. Um, Romania, um, Romania doesn't have a ton. <laughs> when we worked on a, a compulsory licensing project in Romania, I believe we were working under Article 43, 4C. They have the, so the sort of traditional factors here are, are ways to get it, but we, we, I think, operated under the cases of public use for non-commercial purposes. Um, Spain, you can go down to Spain. Um, again, you see the non-working, insufficient working, um, dependent patents, um, competition law, and then existence of public interest. Um, 
In Article, in article 95 for Spain, it explains the, the public interest. Um, for reasons of public interest, the government may at any time uh, grant that compulsory license. Um, in, in paragraph two, article, yeah, there we go. Um, the grounds of public interest are where the initiation increase or generalization of the working of the invention or improvement of the conditions under which it is being worked are of paramount importance to public health or national defense. Public health, good. Um, Sweden, um, Article 47 has a public interest. Um, you can get a, a compulsory license if the public interest, if it's an issue of public interest of exceptional importance. Um, and then the UK, which is the last one, has a, a kind of fascinating breakdown of the way that it addresses this stuff. It actually breaks breaks the compulsory licensing. Well, first of all, there's there's compulsory licensing provisions, and then there's crown use provisions. The compulsory licensing provisions are broken down to whether the patent uh, is, is, comes from a WTO proprietor, whether the owner of the patent is, a, is basically a WTO, uh, within a WTO member, or other cases. Um, and you can see the, the words, uh, you know, reasonable terms, something is, um, if the demand is not being met on reasonable terms, that's under the non, on 48B, um, in 48A, again, the demand not being met on reasonable terms um, and so forth. And then there's uh, explicit reference to the UK competition law. If you keep going down, thank you, Zach, for helping me. <laughs> competition law, 50A, and then the crown use provisions are under 55. So that was almost five minutes. I <laughs> so the, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so you know, I know I know that's that's a lot to absorb, and it's really fast. But the idea, I think, you can just to piggyback on what Professor Abbott was saying. There's a ton of different ways that. Sure. Do I have? Okay, I can I can try. Um, Zach, can you go back up to the top? This is this is actually interesting to think about in the context of the discussion about Baidol and what Jamie was saying about the problems that we perceive, you know, with Baidol, it's the agency that you have to work with, right? And so that's been historically a problem. Um, for Australia, it's the, you apply to the federal court for, under the general compulsory licensing provision. Um, the crown use provision, it's the commonwealth or a state or a person authorized in writing. In Belgium, uh, the general article 31, good, mm, can you go back, <laughs> sorry, okay. Um, okay, yes, okay. <laughs> All right, anyway, the, the, the general compulsory licensing provisions in Yeah, um, a lot of the times. So, it, just as one example in Belgium, and Belgium, Belgium's is fascinating because they they have certain provisions where the it's the minister that's in charge of uh, IP, I believe, that makes a decision. And then, like I was saying about the public health um, provision, that's the king makes that decision based on a deliberation of the council of ministers. But the general provisions in Belgium um, are first the minister and. And it's on application to the minister, um, and then if if the if the terms of the license are, have not really been worked out, then it gets kicked up to a court. Um, and so you know, so, and di different different um, countries will do it will do it differently. I mean, some some countries, um, it's with the issues of remuneration. It's sort of the same. It's up to the parties to determine the remuneration, and then if they can't decide, you go to the, you go to the court. Um, in Canada, the compulsory licensing provisions are determined by the Commissioner of Patents. So it's you know it it, it really it varies. Um, I'm, we're I think after after this meeting, we'll try and you know circulate this this chart online so you can see it in more detail because I know the handout only has the the grounds. I think. Um, 
the let's let's see here. Yeah, in France, um, the application for the compulsory license goes to the uh, Tribunal des Grandes Instances. I should let the the French. Was, how was that? Tribunal des Grandes Instances. The Supreme Court. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so th these they're all they're all different. Um, and um, but it's interesting to think about the, the role of the court. I mean, it, it, just sort of imagining it in the Baidol context, like what would happen if you know you could apply to something that wasn't so invested in and close to the industry. Um, the remuneration issues, which are, uh, I'll just sort of hit on one thing really, really fast. Um, if you go up to Australia, I found this one the most interesting out of all of them. In the crown use, so you often, often in the countries will have, like I just said, they'll, they'll leave it to the parties to work out the remuneration. And if you can't, if that doesn't work, then the court, they'll take it to the court and it'll be decided in the court. Australia's crown use provision actually allows for um, when there when the court is let me make sure I get this right yeah when fixing the terms the court may take into account any compensation that a person interested in the invention or the patent has received directly or indirectly for the invention from the relevant authority I, I, that was sort, sort of an unusual provision out of these countries but I think I'm going to stop there, and if anybody has questions, which I hope you don't, I'm trying to keep you awake before the last panel. Um, anyway, thank you. So anybody has a question for Professor Abbott or Andy Goldman? No problem. <laughs> What's the best compensation statute from a public health affordability perspective, that is? Professor? <laughs> Well, it, it, it's probably one that establishes some kind of re remuneration guidelines in advance, uh, but that will depend on the country and the circumstance, uh, at least an outline of the factors that would be taken into consideration. Um, for example, when you're dealing with low-income and low-middle-income countries, for example, Jamie did what's really, I think, been the definitive work on um, royalty guidelines for uh, uh, compulsory licensing in low-income countries uh, uh, for UNDP, I think, at the time. Uh, and uh, Canada, for example, in its CAMR system has a set of royalty guidelines. If you were in a developed country, I think you'd be needing to look at something more, I would think, circumstantially based. I mean, uh, taking into account the costs and the reasonable rate of return and so forth. So I, I think, you know, you could have different situations with specific guidelines and factors that would go into the computation. Yeah, I don't I, I don't know that there's really a best one um, of the countries that I've looked at. I mean, um, I would agree with everything Professor Abbott said. I mean, so, some you see a lot of the the same language in in the statutes about um, you know courts taking into account the economic value of a license, um, language about things being just and reasonable. Um, but I don't I don't know that there's really a, a best one. Um, Has there, uh, has there been evidence of uh, there being more liberal use of compulsory licensing depending on who the player is that makes that's the decision maker? For instance, if, it, if the authority resides in the Ministry of Health versus the Intellectual Property Office or, or what have you? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer. Um, 
I mean, like for, for example, the, the Germany case, that was the first time that Germany had ever used its provision in, under Section 24. So I don't know that there's really, uh, there's no study that I'm aware of that I've seen that where the, that's, they've done an analysis like that, but it's a good question. Just a, a, a short clarification. I, I will ask uh, Andrew first. Um, um, in France, they, they changed uh, the rule. <laughs> Sorry, I have to bring it back to France, of course. Uh, do you know if they uh, added the language on the uh, public health perspective after the BRAC test, which was a big deal in France? The BRAC test is a test to see if the genetic component of breast cancer. And I don't know if anybody here would know the answer to that, but I was wondering if there was a connection between the amendment or the, the, of the law that you quoted mm -hmm. and the actual creation of this diagnostic tool in the U.S., which was also a big uh, case at, at the Supreme Court, right? So do you know the dates, for example, that would be helpful? <laughs> I don't remember the dates, but I, I think that's right. I think Belgium and France both, I think it was, they both came in at about the same time, and I think it did come after the BRAC issue. Is that right? <laughs> I don't know this. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So, and if there's no other question from the audience, I have a more general question, but it's a. Uh, thank you, Google. <laughs> uh, I'll go back to that. It's a more general question. I, I come from the copyright world much more than the patent world, and one of the big fight we always have with the European is that when it comes to exception to copyright, they have an exhaustive list. And they hate our system, which is a fair use system with a lot of limitation and exception to copyright. And I always try to convince my, uh, my colleagues there that sometimes less precision is better. <laughs> but they don't believe that because there's uh, definitely a kind of a lack of confidence in the courts in Europe. To go back to your idea of maybe moving things from an age to the court, the European would be scared by that. But, so I was wondering if, when it comes to this provision, Professor Abbott or you uh, would think that more detailed reason, more grounds, more uh, deep down to what would cause a, a, a good uh, reason to have a compulsory license is better than a very general um, provision, would say, like you, you presented, which is what the trip said, countries should do whatever they have to do, period. Or is, it, is this actually better in terms of the lawyer kind of a mind here? Well, to be clear, the TRIPS agreement wasn't telling you what you should have in a statute. It was saying you can put in your statute what you would like to put into your statute. Uh, my tendency, and you know, this depends on the legal system and it's highly contextual, but I think that as a practical matter, a country is probably better off enumerating a variety of grounds uh, because that gives the court a clear hook for what the legislature thinks would certainly be acceptable. But then one can always have a catch-all provision that says, and in the public interest. So when you say in the public interest, that makes things very open-ended, but that could be one of seven uh, grounds on which to grant. And, and, and I think it's probably better in most systems to have an, some enumerated list of grounds because it, it, it gives the court more security or confidence or the administrator that the, that the legislative body told us we could do X. If we go to the general public interest, we can extend that, but we're more comfortable knowing that we've already been told we can do X. So that, that would be my general response to that. Yeah, I would completely agree. I mean, I think oftentimes we say that, you know, simple, simple is better, but, um, you know, for example, the, the France and Belgium, you can see very clearly, like there's, there's something there about public health and medicine, right? So like, you don't, you don't even have to argue about that or quibble. I mean, you can, you could, and if you're a lawyer or if you're, you know, an NGO that's working on something, that's the one, you know, you, maybe you go to first. Like it's, it's, I think for all the reasons Professor Abbott said, yeah. 
And, and I would like to briefly go back to the question that was raised by the gentleman from Public Citizen a minute ago. I think that as a general rule, uh, there's been, of course, statutes often prescribe at least among the parties that can authorize the grant of the compulsory license, the commissioner of patents. Uh, but that that's a, a too restrictive formulation because uh, as in the United States, as in many countries, I mean, the patent office tends to be, on the whole, a more pro-patent body than other governmental bodies. So um, typically the preference would be, if, if I'm advising a government, is to extend the authority to the various ministries that might be responsible for the interest so that the Minister of Health has the power to issue a license in the interest of public health or more broadly. And um, I mean, many governments, and I would say even under our 28 U.S. You know, Section 48, uh, 1498, really get, make it a, a broad, it's an all-encompassing authority in the United States. It's not limited to a particular minister or ministry. So um, I think that's something you need to be cautious about in how you allocate that responsibility. And it would be something to even think of if one were looking at the U.S. Patent Act, right, where would that authority vest in the first instance? Would it be with the, you know, uh, Secretary of Hum you know, Health and Human Services, or would it reside in the, you know, the, the Commissioner of the Patent Office? And I think one would have to think about very clear, carefully where you were residing that authority. Well, thank you. Is there any question for? So I would paraphrase or plagiarize or uh, imitate uh, Rob Weissman this morning when he said, uh, it seems all solvable. It's just a question of political will. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs>
problem here is that I always leave with more questions than answers. <laughs> Uh, in some ways, which is which is good, and and it means that we always have more work to do. But it means that uh, there is certainly a lot that can still be done. And so uh, I thought I would maybe just just leave you guys with some questions about things that I'll be thinking about and working on um, as we leave here, and then hopefully, hopefully that's most useful. Um, so one question that I really took away from this is what are the ways in which um, different actors within the system can work together um, to encourage some of these goals? So uh, you know, we've heard a little bit today about the different actors, whether it's courts, whether it's administrative agencies, whether it's civil society, um, different groups that can start the process but also move it forward. Uh, and so I'm going to ask the question I always ask, which is, oh, what is CMS doing? I genuinely do not understand how they are sort of okay with some of the practices we see engaged in by NIH or by other groups because they have to pay for these products, right? They're buying uh, drugs and healthcare technologies for over 100 million Americans who are insured by Medicare and Medicaid. And Hopefully that number continues to be high. I would like that, <laughs> especially we don't know what's going to happen now. But um, you know, there are ways in which some of these questions pit agencies and actors within the system against each other. And I think there are opportunities for those of us in this room to think about maybe not the NIH and the FDA, which we've long thought about, but about CMS or about other groups um, and ways we might encourage them. Uh, you know, relatedly, I think Public Citizen and other groups are doing some really interesting work on these questions of uh, compulsory licenses and particularly injunctions and these patent cases. Um, and something I want to be thinking more about is what is the role of sort of public interest patent litigation and public interest groups in the um, in the process of providing information to courts as they're trying to figure out these questions um, and challenging these patents in the first instance before the PTO or before the courts and how can we surmount some of the problems we see there. Uh, and then a third question on this, uh, the March and Rights panel, which is so fascinating. Uh, I think it's, it's still hard for me to figure out if there's any case in which the NIH would honestly consider exercising margin rights because we've had just the classic and paradigm cases that the law was created for. Um, we've seen them occur and we've seen the NIH uh, do nothing. We've seen excuses made and um, to me it's, it's difficult to figure out uh, uh, what that means um, we should be doing in response and what the NIH should be doing in response. So, um, uh, you know, I've always been concerned about the scope of March and Rights in terms of, you know, if you've got a company with several patents on a drug, maybe only one or two of which is related to federal funding, uh, and we can't get at the rest of them, maybe the scope of March and Rights is really too narrow, and maybe we should be thinking more critically about things like uh, breaking exclusivity periods, and how might we do that? Are there ways in the statutes that we haven't yet thought about to accomplish that goal, which would still stand even if we got past some of these patents? So, so those are three questions I'll take away from today. Hopefully, uh, some of you have have solutions to them, but if not, you know, we'll be here for a while. Those are excellent questions, um, and I'll hope to give some, some thoughts on them throughout my presentation and brief remarks. Uh, just so folks know, my name's Shanna. I'm with Public Citizen, and I'm within our Access to Medicines program. We focus on addressing, primarily addressing, uh, high drug prices. And um, I just want to thank KEI for hosting this event and for having me on this, uh, a panel of this caliber. Um, and I'm going to examine, uh, relate three areas as they relate to legislative action around compulsory licensing, um, including one, the current political dynamic, as well as the potential for taxpayer savings, um, and lastly, legislative opportunities as Congress. And I should say that in my role at Public Citizen, I work as a lobbyist, and I'll be sharing these remarks through that lens um, and really what my colleagues and I have been hearing on the Hill to date. 
Um, so just starting with the political climate, say from the public at large to fiscally conservative lawmakers, um, to small business owners, and even President Trump, who recently exclaimed that the pharmaceutical industry is getting away with murder, um, there is a growing demand to address high drug prices. And this really shouldn't come as a surprise, um, given that medication within the U.S. is much more expensive than in other wealthy countries. In fact, it, it was a study of the transatlantic price to buy that showed Americans paid on average three times as much as Britons for the same 20 medicines. Um, and this cost weighs on taxpayers and seniors alike. Uh, just last fall, the Senate Select Committee on Aging released an investigative report into prescription drug prices, and it was uh, Senator Collins who sits on the committee, um, and is a Republican from Maine, who concluded that price hikes are the result of pharmaceutical companies that act more like hedge funds, and added, we must work to stop the bad actors who are driving up the price of drugs that they did nothing to develop at the expense of patients just because, as one executive essentially said, because I can. And that's her quote of them. Um, just moving forward, we also have polling on our side. Uh, it continually demonstrates that addressing drug prices is one of the top priorities for Americans. According to a 2017 poll by the Kaiser Family Foundation, it showed that the majority of Americans, Republicans and Democrats alike, uh, think that lowering the cost of prescription drugs should be a top health care priority for the administration, um, as well as Congress. And that's compared to only 37% that were in favor of repealing the ACA, uh, which is where the attention is currently focused on the Hill. And then a 2016 Kaiser poll found that 82% of Americans favor Medicare negotiations, another hot topic at this time. Um, and three quarters of Americans favor shortening the length of prescription drug mo monopoly so that cheaper generic drugs are made available sooner. And 83% agree that our government should ensure prescription drugs are affordable to every American. Um, and that was according to a 2016 poll by the, the Lake Research Partners. Um, and then, you know, lastly, scientific polling in 2016 found that nine out of 10 small business owners think that prescription drug prices in America are too high, and they'd support policies that would make uh, the drug costs developed with taxpayer dollars affordable to every American. Um, these are very significant findings, and as we advocate within the public interest community for action in this area, it's important that we remind our lawmakers this is what the public wants. Um, and as we're approaching the midterm elections, politicians really can't afford to ignore these findings. Just moving on quickly to taxpayer savings. This is another very attractive political angle. Um, uh, and there is immense potential for savings through the use of compulsory licensing. And something that Rachel hit on when we look at CMS and you know, the government paying for these drugs at the end of the day when we actually have the authority to help bring down the price. Um, why aren't we exercising that authority? And that's really the million dollar question. Um, it, it was just last year that uh, well, excuse me, actually, I'll mention what Hannah referred to earlier, which is that her, her boss, Representative Doggett, who's the co-chair of the Drug Pricing Task Force, has appropriately coined Marchin as a taxpayer protection measure, and that's exactly what it is and how we should be framing it um, uh, within the advocacy community. And we really can't overstate the importance of savings given the current discussions around health care reform. It was just last year that HHS reported growth in prescription drug spending has been rising more quickly than the overall health care spending within the U.S. Uh, and last month, the HHS Office of Inspector General reported that the high cost of drugs were largely responsible for a huge jump Tr excuse me, jump in Medicare Part D catastrophic spending over the past five years. Again, a very significant finding. Um, these devastating trends demonstrate that the patent system itself will not work unless we make use of regular use of tools such as compulsory licensing. Now, in the instances where the U.S. government has explored its use of, of the compulsory licensing authority, it's had significant um, impacts, and that's already been demonstrated by a number of examples that Jamie shared and others throughout the day. Um, notably, in the case of the 2001 anthrax scare, it was a Republican-appointed HHS secretary, Tommy Thompson, who suggested the use of compulsory licensing. Um, lastly, just to touch on a few legislative vehicles that we can consider in the 115th Congress, and whether it's in the form of a more robust compulsory licensing statute or reforms to the government's existing authority as we looked at the scope being expanded, 
Um, there are a few opportunities for action this Congress. At the risk of sounding like an optimist, um, I do truly believe that if channeled effectively, the existing public will that we see through polling and other factors, if we're able to channel that into um, effective public advocacy to our congressional lawmakers, we can see political will and action in this space, um, certainly within drug pricing, potentially when it comes to compulsory licensing. So just briefly, health care reform is certainly the number one priority on the Hill right now. And, um, and offices are, are stating that drug pricing is likely to be one of the buckets when it comes to health care reform. So that's an area that we should be um, certainly exploring when it comes to the use of compulsory licensing reforms as well. My colleague Paul Davis and I um, have been working pretty actively on that front, and um, we've, we've had some initial feedback from uh, more fiscally conservative Republican lawmakers, and we hope to be exploring that um, in the coming weeks and months. Um, uh, another area related to health care reform is the budget reconciliation process. Um, we saw uh, with the, the recent um, budget reforms, there were several amendments put forward around drug pricing. One notably was by Senator Sanders on the drug importation, and there were about a dozen Republicans who ended up voting in favor of that action. So again, we're seeing a steady um, kind of direction toward more bipartisan action in this space. Um, uh, another opportunity has to do with the user fee authorization bills that are coming up. Now, a lot of um, um, members in Congress, as well as the committees that have jurisdiction over the user fee process, are stating they want it to be a very skinny bill. Um, and uh, certainly, we'd like to see that if it means there won't be measures to um, to essentially deregulate the FDA or to threaten the safety and efficacy of drugs and medical devices. Historically, that hasn't been the case, however. And insofar as there are going to be counterweights to those efforts by industry, which we expect to see, drug pricing is a key area for reform, um, as well as specifically compulsory licensing reform. So that's something to keep in mind moving forward. And that could take the place of you know, initial negotiations or as Senate amendments um, uh, once the UFA comes up on the floor. So we should really be doing what we can as a community to energize and enfranchise our political champions to be introducing amendments as we, we have opportunities. And then lastly, um, just looking at Medicare negotiations, this is you know, a no-brainer when it comes to looking at where we could try to insert a compulsory licensing um, a additional kind of leverage in that space. And I'll leave it to Alex and others to discuss that more in depth. But that's another area for reform that we're seeing move this Congress. Um, and lastly, I'd just be remiss not to acknowledge the role of congressional oversight of the administration to use ex existing authority under Margin and tw uh, 28 U.S.C. Um, uh, 1498. Um, and Hannah already discussed this earlier, but in 2016, there already was a fair amount of bicameral and bipartisan action in this area. Um, however, unless and until the executive branch acts on its existing authority on a more regular basis, or at all, <laughs> um, le legislative action probably is necessary. And with that, I'll hand it over to Alex. I was only laughing at the UFA fight because I I am far less optimistic on that one. I think that we will get slaughtered on the UFA fight. I think that we should, we have to fight. We have to give a lot of ammunition to our champions. But, um, I mean, can I be somewhat controversial in the room? We gave away an enormous amount of our, any arrows that we had in the quiver, we lost in the Cures Bill. Um, and now we're left with nothing. Uh, and they are left with an entire K Street army of lawyers who have crafted uh, everything. And UFA is going to be our low lights, is my prediction. But yes, we have to arm our champions with all the drug price stuff. I mean, is, um, sorry. Hi, my name's Alex Lawson. I'm the executive director of Social Security Works. Obviously, I spend a lot of times talking about the, or thinking about the UFA fight, because I couldn't resist jumping right into it. Social Security Works, we're uh, a organization dedicated to protect and expand Social Security, uh, Medicare, and to lower drug prices. Uh, primarily, we have uh, 1.3 million people on our email list uh, who care passionately about these issues. And I get to go out and talk to people all over the country. I just got back from Arizona. I talked to a room full of retirees. I asked them if they thought that their drug prices were too high too low, just right. What do you think the answer was? Uh, 
it's not, it's not a little bit of heat out there on drug prices. It is a lot. The people are pissed. Um, 10% on average year over year over year, uh, unless you're one of the unlucky ones who gets a private equity firm that grabs one of the old drugs and decides to jack it up 6,000%. Um, I think the muscular ch childhood muscular dystrophy drug is the latest one. Um, you know, Coumadin, these are, it, I, this is the room full of people who I actually take my data from. Uh, so I don't need to tell you much about the issues. Um, I am more of a where the grassroots, the net roots are, and then what is happening on the hill. And I am an optimist. It's hard to exist in this world if you're not. Um, but we should be honest about kind of where we are. Where we are is that uh, President Trump just called a press conference, but it was a secret press conference, and he has excluded the New York Times and CNN and Washington Post, BBC, BuzzFeed, uh, and a host of others. Uh, AP and Reuters did boycott that press conference. Uh, but, I mean, this is just the political climate we're in is actually uh, it's unique and exciting. Um, so there is this thing, though, that drug prices are, are unifying. Uh, they are nonpartisan, right? I mean, I'll talk to a room full of Tea Party members, and they're as pissed about their drug prices uh, as a room full of union members. I was speaking to union members uh, in Arizona. And they're, they're pissed for a reason. And again, I, I don't need to tell this room uh, the reason but I'll go a little bit into it. Uh, the key is that there are solutions, and it's not just like one solution. There's a million solutions. Uh, we know exactly what we need to do. Uh, there's multiple paths there, but the, what we need to do is take the pharmaceutical industry and be like, you can only make profits at the level of Wall Street. I'm serious. Just that alone would probably allow us to reduce... The, the drug prices of millions of Americans. Since Pfizer in 2015, 27.6% profit margin. Merck, 25.2%. The average on Wall Street is 16 to 17%, right? So, I mean, there's this word that lawyers use a lot, uh, and it's important. It's a, it's a term of art, I believe, uh, which is reasonable. Uh, and it is not reasonable that... Uh, Eli Lilly spends $272 million on Cialis advertising, uh, uh, $4.3 billion in ads last year, just industry-wide. Um, Pfizer, I just want to do this just to get the money. I know everyone knows this stuff, but the S&P average, the median uh, shareholder yield is 2%. Uh, Pfizer repurchased stock buyback. They used $6 billion of their prop their profits to buy their own shares. And that has no value to R&D. That has nothing except putting money in the pocket of Wall Street and investors. $7.2 billion in dividends. So $13.2 billion just went right into the pockets of Wall Street. That's a 6.2% yield. Where you get those numbers are in, in uh, articles that talk about how the pharmaceutical industry is the greatest investment that you'll ever have because they have a government-granted monopoly to rip off the people and just give their money to you. We literally tax six sick people. Enormous. We say, oh, you need this to survive? Well, then we're going to make it $89,000 a year. That was the muscular dystrophy one. It was $1,200 a year. They used the government patent. They used their lawyers to get the loophole. They jacked it up to $89,000 per year. Everyone knows the issue. That's why the grassroots, the polling is clear. It's nonpartisan. The people are pissed. Is something going to happen from that outrage? And I'm very pessimistic on the UFA fight because that's the one that pharma is just like they have a laser focus on. But there is a lot of reason to be optimistic that something's going to happen and that, you know, in the tumult, maybe we could get something through with drug prices. There's a lot of fat to cut in this sector. Um, one of the things is you brought up the uh, importation bill, and uh, it, was a, it was just a vote on the importation bill, and it was 12 Democrats who voted against it. 
and 13 Republicans who voted for it, or maybe I have it reversed, but it's something right there. Uh, and we actually know that some of those Democrats who voted against it are going to come cross over, support it, and it's going to be introduced again. So drug prices are this one where it's not really partisan. There are some champions who are Republicans. I mean, Susan Collins is special um, in all issues with her ideological. But there are just like Republican Republicans who are looking at this and saying, this is outrageous, um, especially if they represent older states, um, if they have a conscience at all. Um, they see this as an area that they can get something done and where they will be rewarded politically hugely. Um, when I go around and talk, I, I bring this up. And I know that a lot of people rely on pharmaceutical drugs, uh, but seniors do take more pharmaceutical drugs on average than uh, younger folks. Seniors also don't have an agreed upon term that you can use to call them. They don't have a label that they like. If I call them seniors, half of them get mad. If I call them elderly, half, three quarters of them get mad. Uh, if I call them old, all of them get mad. So I made up my own term, which is always voters because it's super descriptive, because they always vote. Every single time, in every single election, seniors vote. Older Americans are a, a con political constituency that has a tremendous amount of power. Uh, and with that power, drug prices is a very, uh, I was gonna say powerful, sorry, couldn't come up with another word, uh, issue here. And when I go out and talk to people, this is the issue where there is a lot of emotion, and that means that we can actually harness that uh, and turn it into a political outcome. It is difficult to, for me to see which one is going to get across the, the finish line, but Medicare uh, prescription drug negotiation is one that continually gets talked about, and it's being talked about on both sides uh, right now. You hear it from Republicans. You hear it from Democrats. Um, and based on actually listserv conversations of literally the people in this room of Jamie and Peter and others, um, the Medicare prescription drug negotiation with compulsory licensing as the teeth in Medicare negotiation, um, I am shopping that around the hill and there's a ton of interest in it. Um, that it creates political space for the ones that are more you know, mainstream at this point. Uh, but, you know, we have people who understand that compulsory license, as Jamie says, you know, putting the patent at risk instead of the patient uh, is definitely the way forward and that this would be a great way to bring uh, the pharmaceutical companies to the table uh, in terms of lowering, you know, making their, their drug prices reasonable. So I think Medicare prescription drug negotiation is probably the most real um, vehicle that I could see happening on drug prices and at the very least bringing compulsory licensing into a mainstream conversation. Um, and you know that's what Social Security Works and I am working on trying to do. Um, I think all the, in every single one that you brought up, all of those political, there's an opportunity to bring up drug prices, but sometimes it's from a negative side, right? Like we've, we got the leaked Obamacare repeal bill from the House, decimates Medicaid, uh, which you know puts a lot of cost to the states, which again is an opportunity to raise the question uh, around drug prices. Um, the opioid epidemic is another issue that you can use to raise the, uh, especially when naloxone, you know, they overprescribe opioids, get America addicted, and then jack the price of the uh, of the rescue drug by 600 percent. Um, that is not a partisan issue either. You see a lot of Republican state governments who want to do something about that, including what I would call very radical solutions like suing the hell out of the drug companies uh, for damages based on uh, over-marketing of opioids uh, for back pain. I mean, you all know the story there. So there are opportunities, uh, but some of the oppor We're going to lose a lot, and I do think that we will move in the wrong direction on drug prices for a bit. I mean, pharmaceutical stock prices have gone up. Um, the meeting that Donald Trump, who has made noises in the right direction, he had with uh, pharma, and then he came out of it, and he's like, oh, man, we're definitely going to 
rein in drug prices by giving enormous tax breaks uh, for the corporations to repatriate their money, and then they're going to invest it in R&D. They're not going to. They're not going to. They didn't last time. They're not going to this time. Uh, but that's a kind of, you know, we're going, I, I'm trying to have a realistic view of the political reality, which is that we should be prepared for to go the wrong direction, but always bring up, in each case, uh, the, the alternative. Thank you. <laughs> well, that was great, and I'll just uh, spend a minute or two, because I, I don't have a, a, a great and novel idea to add to this. When I'm asked from time to time, you know, why is it so difficult to make progress in reforming the pharmaceutical sector and, and public health? I point out, as has been alluded to, well, there, you know, there's $1.3 trillion annual revenues going into this industry. And whenever you have that much revenue being collected by a particular industry, it's very difficult to push against that industry. There's a lot of financial capacity to push back. And so whatever direction you're moving in, it, it's always going to be difficult. And it's a, an area in which there are just so many moving parts that it's very li unlikely there's going to be one single solution to controlling drug prices while allowing adequate room for innovation. You know, some of the things we've discussed today, I think, really are key ideas. We just heard, um, you know, an enormous amount of federal money goes into the development of new drugs, and certainly an enormous amount of federal money goes into the purchasing of new drugs. It doesn't make any sense for the federal government not to be negotiating the price for the purchase of new drugs. And so uh, we need to find a path where the federal government may be more directly responsible for the procurement in the sense of then being able to not only bargain for prices, but also um, as we talked about with 28 U.S.C. Section 1498, we already really have the backbone of the compulsory licensing system and the mechanism in which guidance could be fleshed out for determining what reasonable royalties are and how costs would be computed and what the factors would be going in for determining the ultimately the prices. So. Maybe there's an incremental ways, or there's incremental ways to approach this. Again, we had the discussion of parallel imports and parallel trade. Um, I don't. I, it's going to have a modest, if it comes comes about, modest price ameliorating effect. But it's not a reason to avoid doing it. As I think many of you are familiar with, the Supreme Court's going to is currently hearing the case on international exhaustion of patent rights. A uh, public citizen filed a brief in that case. I filed a brief in that case urging the Supreme Court to allow parallel importation of patented medical products. Um, and so Congress, Congress may need to step into this area again. And again, even HHS is going to have to play a role if parallel imports are authorized. HHS is still going to have to have some additional new rules that will uh, control the process of parallel importation, but again, a po that will be a positive development. Um, it's difficult to address, uh, you know, a knowledgeable audience in this area and uh, discuss mechanisms for reducing prices because it's, it's easy enough for the pushback to come, you know, but don't you encourage innovation? Don't you realize that the reason we make progress is we have money going into uh, discovery of new drugs? And it's, it's, I think, a key argument that has to be focused on, on the, you know, price amelioration side of the table is that the intention is not to deprive pharmaceutical researchers of the money they need to research but to explain in a very cogent way where the money for R&D is going to come from under some kind of revised system, you know, how much waste in terms of things that were discussed before are currently built into the system, 
You know, Jerry Reichman, our colleague years ago, proposed and recommended moving from an, a property injunctive-based system to a royalty-based system. There's really no reason our pharmaceutical compensation structure couldn't be revised to be based on a, on a royalty award payment as opposed to a property injunctive Based system with the you know rent extraction through monopoly prices. So none of those are new ideas. I mean, they've been around for a long time. We've got them in present form, and as Manon said, really largely this is a question of political will. Uh, it's getting uh, people ready and willing to to take this on. To paraphrase our Chinese friends, we are living in interesting times. And to paraphrase Stanley Fisher at the Federal Reserve, we have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, but, you know, we, we can do our best in this highly volatile environment to try to make some progress and to um, make positive developments happen. So, thank you. Can I add one note that I forgot to say? The million dollar question, I know everyone knows this, it's a $244 million dollar question, which is the amount of money the pharma spends lobbying on the Hill. Uh, so we know the, the totality of the answer of why we haven't, don't have a system that makes sense, that is rational uh, in any way, shape, or form is because of the ludicrous amount of money that the pharmaceutical industry pours uh, into the coffers of members of Congress. Uh, and so that is that's really what we are up against, and that calculus should always be taken into account. But remember, always voters, they always vote, uh, and money, although it can be used to influence voters, money does not actually vote. So at some point, the calculus changes. I, I just saw something that the, one of the Republican leak plans for uh, reforming uh, Medicare and Medicaid is to uh, is to start removing the tax deductibility in health care insurance plans that are, are that give good benefits. So that means people are going to be pushed into plans that have less coverage than they do right now, uh, including for really, really expensive drugs. Um, I think uh, if you look at the vote on the Sanders amendment on the parallel trade thing, um, and where that's kind of headed. You can see that, that uh, some members that voted one way are going to come back. Um, I think that what I've always noticed about that issue is that because it's easy to understand, I'm not talking about the enablement doctrine and patent law or something like that or some crazy thing on test out exclusivity. It's kind of like people can kind of get their heads around it. The congressmen are afraid to vote the wrong way because they the constituents can pick them up. And go. One of the problems with marginal reforms like you're gonna you're gonna cut back in the pediatric exclusive and rationalize that or do this or that the other thing all of which we favor all these marginal reforms we work we work on them all is the voters don't really understand what's going on with them and so you've got the gazillion dollars of lobbying on the one hand and you got like nobody none of the voters really understand what the hell's going on and you you, you don't do too well in those environments so I think my experience is making the issues more political and putting more on the table. It's almost like you don't have any more opposition from the drug companies you do in a small issue. They seem to fight everything kind of full bore. So you might as well ask for something that really gives the voters something they care about and delivers the goods because then maybe they'll pick up the phone and talk to a member of Congress. So I say just just don't be afraid to double down and, and really go for what's really going to make a difference and in, 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 in get you something that really that, that the voters will benefit from. What, what I'm afraid of sometimes is people want to just be on the winning side of something. And that's, that's more, you know, more important being at the signing ceremony, I don't know, whatever it is, or like being able to claim you influence something or whatever, but they kind of make so many compromises at a certain point. It's, 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 it's kind of, you're not, really, you're not really delivering the goods for the people we claim to represent. I think we really have to like, we have to be ambitious and, and, and raise the stakes. Now in terms of legislation, um, I'm gonna zip through a, a couple of bullet points. Uh, one is on the Bayh-Dole Act. <laughs> I'm going to go back into my marginal reforms right now, so just just bear with me. I'll work it up in the end. Uh, I think the idea of extending the the marching rights right now to all medical technologies. Rachel talked about expanding the scope because sometimes there's not that many patents that really qualify under the Act. It makes a lot of sense. 
and uh, it would make it much more effective. And it, it also, you can do it with a single sentence in the Bayh-Dole Act, so you don't have to reinvent any of the other language. So if you want a, a congressman to be able to do a bill that has a single sentence, there's a certain advantage than one that has uh, like, you know, a, a 1,200 words or something like that that covers every contingency. So there is an advantage of thinking about that patch because it's really simple to do. And the procedures, except for the fact that you stay, stay the compulsory license until they exhaust all the litigation, which is, I think you should also try and fix, are not too bad. I mean, the grounds are not too bad on the Bayh-Dole Act. Um, I think you do have to tweak it. You have to also think about, like, I'll get to it in a second, who, who the decision maker is. Because if it's, if it's ahead of the NIH making the decisions, it doesn't have to be. Even right now, that's designated by the secretary. But it's still not gonna, not, you're not gonna, it's not going to work very well. I mean, if you had the head of Medicare doing it, it might have a better outcome. And if it was Andy Slavic, would have been better than Francis Collin on these cases, I, I tend to think. Um, uh, uh, on 1498, you need better standards on compensation if you were to do legislation. I mean, you can try it do now. You, you can have uh, Amy's Law Clinton up at Yale help you out. We can all file briefs in the case and stuff like that. But like, it is a bit scary in 1498 on the current government use, because it wasn't really designed for drug pricing in mind. I mean, uh, I mean, and, and when it was designed was really over 100 years ago. So, you know, you really, I think, not a bad idea to kind of, what Sanders proposed in the Veterans Administration is one example of how you could tweak it for, for drugs. That would be effective, but there may be better ways too. Um, uh, then you then you say, okay, suppose I don't amend the existing ones, march in or or fourteen ninety eight. What if we do a standalone compulsory license authority and just do what you want? As Andy and Fred talked about in the last panel, uh, you have a lot of freedom, right, Fred? You can just kind of do whatever you want, and so that's a, a positive and negative. The negative is. When you say to people, you can do whatever you want, what they want you to do is tell them what you want them to do. They don't want to tell you, you don't want you telling you, just you can just make it up, right? They, they, they would prefer you to say that there's this thing that you got to do because it's just, it's too, it's too scary to just kind of make it up because there's, you just, you don't know enough of maybe about the topic to figure out all the shit you got to worry about. But, but it is true that you could pick whoever you want to be the actor. You can pick whatever grounds and things like that. So someone, I've done a lot of, there's on grounds, for, for the excessive pricing type issue or the affordability issues, it turns out that the, the grounds issue is very closely mapped into the price control conversations. It's at what point is an orphan drug like uh, Fibrozyn uh, too expensive? At what point is, uh, is it a heart disease drug, that you, you know, the small probability thing, or an HIV drug or a hep C drug? And it, it, because drugs, the context is so different for the drugs, we found that a series of tests are better than a single test. Because we find that like there's not a single formula that works. It's going to work perfect in the drug you're thinking about. And then you're going to wake up in the morning and someone's going to throw a different drug at you. And you're going to try that same formula and it's not going to work very well. So I like the idea of sort of multiple things. Like when I was growing up, there was a lot of things I could get in trouble for with my parents. It wasn't just one thing. All right, so I could like, my parents, I could discipline me for that one thing and I could be good in that one thing, but I'd find that there was other things I did bad that would also get me in trouble. Well, I think that's a, a good analogy for, for the drug companies. I mean, like there's lots of ways they can be bad. So don't limit yourself to the magic bullet, right? So one thing you can do to be bad as a drug company is, char is charge higher prices in America than you do in other countries that you'd use as your reference. And, and for my reference, <laughs> would be countries with a large GDP, the largest GDP that have at least 50% of USG, uh, uh, per capita income. You can pick seven, you can pick nine, you can pick 10, you can pick 13, you can pick whatever you never want. Don't go too big, but I mean like somewhere between, probably between 13 and, and seven in that range. The, the largest GDP gets you away from Monaco and Luxembourg. And then the, at least 50% of GDP gets you away from Poland, and Chile and countries like that, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, countries that you shouldn't be comparing yourself to. So that's one thing in the reference pricing. Another thing is, and there's a reason for that too, because if we compete against them in the world market, our employers have to compete against those companies. I mean, like basically our companies have to go out and compete with their companies and it creates a problem for us. Next one would be co-payment. This is an important one for me. If you observe in the market that the drugs are requiring higher co-payments because people won't insure them, you can have accessibility problems or if there's other barriers to access. Now, the IRS says that 
of an older person's expenditures on health care are extraordinary, and you can have special tax exemptions. So that's a standard you could use. So you could say if a drug results in a copayment, which is more than 7.5% of an income, that that would be a danger sign. And in that area, I would say you could use a multiple of the poverty level or the minimum wage or something like that. So if you did it like twice the minimum wage, not, not I mean twice the poverty level, and if, and if your co-payments for more than 7.5% of your income, I would say that would be a naughty, a naughty boy so for that one. And then another threshold that gives after – Initial period revenues ex 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 exceed a certain amount. Perceptin generated sixty billion dollars, almost fifty billion for this rare disease, <laughs> Gleevec, You know, drug this leukemia drug. It's crazy. You don't need to give somebody fifty billion dollars to do a, to put a thousand patients in clinical trials. The the Hep C drug they're generating two and a half billion dollars a month for a while, right? I mean, that's really it's a good drug. It's a great drug, but. Do you really have to give somebody two and a half? If you give somebody two and a half billion dollars a month, it's fine if you're um, if you got it. But if it means that you you have to make you have to start cutting back our tax deductibility of our insurance plans, put us in crappier insurance programs, and and you know you have to shut down community clinics and stuff like that, then you shouldn't do it. So I would say after your after your revenue hits a certain amount of money, it should call into question whether you need a monopoly anymore. It's like the monopoly's there so you can get some money. We notice that you've had seconds, thirds, fourths. I think you're done, right? Okay, so then in that case, uh, but you could you got an exception, say, if it's not justified by risk of uh, adjusted investments. But I wouldn't use the company's own investments because in public utility regulation, when they try this, the companies would gold plate their investments to get return. And if it's risk adjusted, it's an even bigger problem because you get to multiply it by 10 or 20 or something like that for, for phase one trials. So what I'd say is you'd use injury, uh, you'd use reference cost based on a group of companies so you couldn't gain the system by running your own cost up. So everyone would have an individual incentive to be cost cost effective, but they'd run up against a thing where they felt you could kind of go in too much. But you'd have to have a lot more transparency in the system you have right now. Grounds related to failure to license. You have a, another set of things not really to excess the pricing like Combination products are really important in a lot of areas, and patents often get in the way of combining products in ways that are useful to them. Um, uh, when you have multiple inventions that should, should work together, like co-formulating products with uh, ritonavir or something like that. Then you have, then you have um, upstream uses and, and tools, things like the CRISPR patents. They have to have a different set of standards. One thing is you could maybe have the government declare patents related to a, to a specific public interest. The example in France that Andy talked about before, uh, is an example of that the Atomic uh, Energy Commission that Zach talked about early. That's an example where government would sort of say, okay, these patents are kind of special because of their particular characteristics. And so, you know, you sort of come up with rules and that. You have to worry about automatic versus discretionary, who the players are. Do you have the court act, the government act, an independent group like the FTC? Um, uh, uh, is, is there private rights of action and stuff like that? I think that the construction and the debate on this is not there yet in terms of what you want to do if you do a standalone bill. So the short thing is you can do something real simple by adding a line to the Bayh-Dole Act, and that gets you really in the, in the conversation. If you really want to do a real bill and you had political will, you can do much better than that. But the, the bad news is you have a lot of choices to make. Thank you. We have to, we have to make it short because we have like three minutes left. Two minutes. No, no, we can't extend. Yes, it is. You disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Let's continue in a bar. Oh, what am I saying? <laughs> Let's get more, more, more. Anyway, no, I think it was a great panel. Thank you for your ideas. It makes me feel like maybe I should have a bill. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the plan next? <laughs> No, I think we have to continue somewhere else. Somewhere else. <laughs>